Amber and Shadow The Duskwall Academy Book One Written by Marie McKay Narrated by B.J. Harrison The Dusk Sun A black void in the center of Vostra From which demons spawn Its border, the Dusk Wall Is an untraversable, reflective wall that cuts across the land. The Breach A weakness in the Dusk Wall, from which rogue demons cross in deadly numbers. An army is always stationed in order to manage the outpouring of demons. The Dusk Wall Academy One of the academies designed to forge biomages to fight at the Breach. School is three terms, followed by one year at the breach wall. Chapter 1 The Duskwall Academy was a place only for the most desperate in Vostra. Three terms, the students would serve in these towers as they were forged into monsters deadly enough to fight a year at the breach, a weakness in the Duskwall from which rogue demons spilled onto their lands. The problem for Briar Bishop, if binding her very soul to a demon so she might serve on a failing battlefront wasn't enough of a problem, was that she was a fraud, in strength and magic undoubtedly. But more than that, she'd had no business surviving initiation in the first place. She'd arrived a week ago for the start of term, Twenty years old and nothing left to lose. She'd been willing to do anything for a chance at becoming a mage. If only she'd known what a gamble like that could truly mean. The first week had been quiet and lonely, and the other bed in her dorm remained empty. Students avoided her in the halls and in class, their anxious glances drawn to her eyes, the feature that gave her away. Briar had lost something the day she'd arrived. He'd taken something. The forest green irises of her father, gone, replaced by rich amber. It marked her. She lay on her stomach on the spare bed, reading a line over and over, the words blurring in her vision as she thought of her father. As she did so often these days, she heard his voice as if he were at her side. I'm with you always, Blossom. She tried to focus on the book, blinking furiously. Being alone in the evenings had benefits. She needed the time to practice, for as it turned out, physical training wasn't the only thing Briar was awful at. In one week, it had become clear that Briar's affinities were, well, they left something to be desired. That fact was like an anchor in her chest constantly weighing her to the truth. Strong or not, she'd be fighting demons at the end of term like everyone else. This academy was designed for one purpose, create monsters to fight monsters. She had to kill one to become one. Of the five types of instinct magic, she was competent in stealth and healing. While her classmates were learning to augment their strength and glint their skin, she was stuck firmly behind on anything actually useful. Sheer determination, it turned out, meant fuck all at the Duskwall Academy, and she'd be lying to herself if she said that wasn't a disappointment. You can't overcome bad blood. The whisper of her past spoke in her ear. It'll be fine she said, imagining a conversation she'd never have the guts for, with someone who'd probably never listen. I'm made for this. I didn't need you anyway. She shrugged, then felt silly. No need to overreact. She shrugged again, trying to get the motion to feel natural, throwing in a smirk. Was that really how she wanted to say it? It didn't matter. Say there was someone in this place she wanted to speak to. Well, she'd never do it. She might have had the determination to come to the academy, but socially, she was a coward. Despite herself, 
She glanced to the walls covered in diagrams she'd drawn from books. It's nothing, she tried again with another shrug, still not getting it quite casual. Was reading up on healing and found it interesting. She sat up and indicated the diagrams. Wait, you're into healing too? She laughed, then bit her lip. Too desperate. There was a knock on the door, and Briar almost jumped out of her skin. She stood and straightened her dressing gown, her cheeks burning with embarrassment. She hurried over and opened it a crack, peering out, her heart fluttering. But it sunk like a stone as she met a set of burnt amber irises. She tried to slam it shut, but Silas grabbed the door in time. Briar quickly jammed her foot behind it. What do you want? Her voice was cold. A moment of your time. He sounded impatient. Flutters of black hair framed the slice of his face still visible. No thanks, she snapped. Busy. Not a request. She chewed on her lip, glaring at him. Was it worth fighting him on this? Spit it out. He sighed. Open the door. No. But as she spoke, he shoved on it, sending her staggering apace. He stepped in, slamming it behind himself as he peered around. She opened her mouth to snap at him, but the words got stuck on her tongue. His imposing figure was sharp. He wore a black button-up and rings glinted on his fingers. It all seemed out of place in her messy dorm. Arrogant fashion choices weren't what made fear and hatred collide into a bundle of anxiety that locked her throat, though. His silken dark hair was tied loosely, drawing attention to strong cheekbones and an angled jaw that gave his features a strikingly carved look. His nose was strong and straight, and in profile it had that gentler slope to it that often accompanied hooded eyes like his. In short, he appeared every bit the noble he was. Briar had overheard students talk about him in classes and in the halls, the noble who'd joined the Duskwall Academy, the man who'd already bonded a demon, a mysterious and beautiful vampire. Fuck all of that. She'd seen it before. The allure and arrogance. Beautiful fucking angels of death, that's what they all were. Silas was glancing at the piles of dirty dishes on her tray, the sprawled books on the empty spare bed, and then at her knitted stuffed fox toy beside her pillow. Stop it, she snapped. What? He turned back to her. Looking? Yeah. She edged toward her bed and hid the fox beneath blankets, but caught him smirking. This is my dorm. Get out. He shrugged, the movement enviably casual. I assure you I'd rather not be here. He glanced around again with disdain, then straddled the wooden desk chair, shuffling it away from a stack of dishes with a grimace. He looked so arrogant, shirt half-tucked and arms crossed, leaning over the back of the chair. She said nothing. Her heart raced as she fingered the dagger in the belt she never took off. Were you just talking to yourself? He asked. No. Her cheeks blazed. How long had he been there? Had he been listening? Gonna ask someone on a date? Damn. No. Good. He snorted. That would be embarrassing to watch. She folded her arms as if all she felt was impatience. Is that why you came? No, but it made the trip worth it. One week they'd been at this academy, and it was more than enough time for the two of them to establish they loathed one another. Tell me what you want and get out, she said. All right, he sighed, rolling his shoulders. Stop using so much magic. He peered down at his nails as he picked at them. What? Her eyebrows shot up. You're joking! That magic you're using? He didn't bother looking at her. It's mine. You're burning through it all day and all evening. His eyes flickered to the diagrams on her walls. If I need to come and collect, you can't be running on empty. 
There was a long pause as she stared at him in disbelief. A pit of lava rose in her throat. He still didn't look at her. And there it was. Briar would have hated Silas Liren anyway, even if not for what happened during initiation last week. A thousand times over, though, she'd take passing thoughts about the noble prick in her class over... over whatever it was they'd become. Magic bound, whatever that even meant. The thought made her stomach turn. And how had his mate put it? The noble and the low-born thief. As if she'd tricked him. As if she'd done it on purpose. Yet the whole bond was shared. At the heart of it, he did have a lot more magic than her. A lot more. When she spoke, her voice was tight. I won't. He paused. Not a request. And if I don't listen? She asked. So very slowly his eyes lifted, raking up her body as if she were prey, and she hated how she felt like prey. His eyes darkened, and his broad shoulders were suddenly tense, as if he would pounce. She was acutely aware she was in her sleepwear, her legs uncovered. She tugged her patchwork cloak around herself. Do you really want to find out? He asked. His voice was quiet, and the room dimmed, the light of her candles shrinking under tension. Her chest tightened. She was a whole term away from claiming her form, but he was already a shifter, the strongest vampire in Academy history, if rumors knew anything at all. She straightened. I won't stop. It was the only damn reason she was here, to practice magic, to serve her time and return to Karenfurt with the power to kill people just like him. Silas stood from the chair slowly, and for a second he didn't look threatening as he moved it aside, peering down at his thumb, which still picked absently at a nail. Something about the casualness of it was worse. You are playing with fire, little vixen. As he took a step toward her, his eyes lifted, pinning her. They were feral, a glint dancing in their shadows. It was difficult to stand her ground as he approached. She tried to clear her throat to demand he stop, but it was bone dry. Each floorboard that creaked underfoot was a threat. She could see the demon he'd bonded, the venomous creature that lurked behind his eyes, warring to get out. Shadows clung to him, and light warped around his figure, skittering about as if afraid. He stopped before her, much too close, towering over her in form and magic. He was so close she could see a shadow of dark stubble lining his clenched jaw. She stared straight into the depths of his amber eyes, the ones she now shared, and her heart pounded in her ears. You can't kill me. Her words were a breath. Neither of them were exactly sure what their bonded magic pool meant, but they'd established she might well take half of it to the grave. He smiled, and she stumbled away as she saw the sharp points of his canines. The second she moved, he pounced. His grip curled around her throat as he slammed her into the balcony door. She clutched at him to no avail but he didn't tighten his grip yet, holding it there in threat. There are so many things between here and death, little vixen. She closed her eyes. I won't stop. Her voice shook. She would weather this the way she'd weathered everything else. He looked animalistic as he bared fangs. You're an ungrateful, pathetic lowborn and I shouldn't have to dirty my hands touching you. His voice was full of venom, but she'd heard words like that before. Her past threatened, wearing away her sanity as rage lit her veins like lightning. Before she realized, she'd spat right in his face and regretted it instantly. The grip on her throat tightened, and she clung to him desperately. 
Her other hand fumbled at her dressing gown, pushing it away so she could reach for her dagger. Silas wiped the spit away with a snarl. This world didn't want you, he spat. Her breaths were coming ragged with the pressure on her neck. You think I don't notice how weak you are? Trying to keep up with everyone else? Why is that? he asked. You're not supposed to be here. You should be a corpse, rotting beneath our feet, fodder for the pretty roses that... But Briar's mind cracked. Something feral of her own reared its head as he said that word. Everything was drowned by howls of her past. Roses. Their petals falling, falling gently onto pale, lifeless skin. That this foul, noble, dare speak anything of... Silas's eyes widened, and his mouth parted in shock. Briar realized that the dagger was in her fist, and she'd driven it into his chest. He staggered away. The sounds of the world rushed in. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Her first thought was that he had to die, or he really would kill her after this. But what would happen then? Would she lose her magic? Her thoughts were like drunken ants, scuttling in different directions. He wasn't the noble she wanted dead. Though watching him crash to his knees on the floor beside her bed, she knew that wasn't strictly true. But she'd be expelled. You crazy bitch, he gasped. His fangs hadn't receded, and blood was glistening through his shirt. He leaned on her bed much paler than before. She stared at him with a mix of panic and fascination. His voice was weak. Heal it. Her eyebrows shot up. He was still ordering her about? Heal it yourself, she spat. I'm the lowborn who shouldn't be here, remember? There truly was murder in his eyes at her words. A part of her panicked, though, because she didn't know if she could heal a wound like that. Either he couldn't heal himself, or he couldn't get his power because his face was draining of color. She stumbled forward, placing her hand on his shirt, but it wouldn't do. Without thinking, she tugged the knife from his chest, planning to use it to cut through his shirt. He hissed in agony, and the stain of blood blossomed rapidly through the fabric. Great, she thought. Slice him up like a novice in a butcher's shop. She ripped his shirt open and shoved her hand on the wound, closing her eyes. Her magic bound to it instantly and she knew the truth. A few more seconds and she'd have been too late. She poured her magic into it, no idea what she was doing, just knowing what she wanted. The wound sealed up slowly, layer by layer, and his blood finally stopped leaking out. He'd lost a lot, though, and was in danger of... His hand closed on her arm, and she jumped, she barely had a moment to process his pointed fangs before pain shot through her neck. She fought him, trying to push him off as panic mingled with the shock of it. Every second that passed, though, his strength returned as he gripped her chin and thigh, pinning her against the bed. He... he needed the blood, she tried to rationalize the situation as terror tightened her chest again. But Briar could feel him stealing away life and energy and... Something else. Tears burned in her eyes. I don't want him to take it. The thought was as nauseating as it was absurd, as if she'd wanted to be bound to him, or wanted him to shove in here and try to strangle her. Yet it mattered more as he ripped the blood from her veins, took something that she felt to her core she should have a say in. Silas didn't stop as he regained strength. His fingers dug into her thigh and he moved, his body bearing down, and she was crushed against him. She could feel the hot, wet blood from his shirt against her chest, seeping through her shift. It changed everything. This was no longer an act of desperation, it was something much more predatory, and she was powerless to stop him. A frightened noise slipped from her throat. He froze for a heartbeat, before letting her go. She scrambled away, fighting the tears and trying to calm her breathing. Fuck! His voice was a low hiss of rage, but she couldn't look at him. 
For a long time, they sat on the floor, leaning against the bed, both taking ragged breaths. When she had her tears under control, she found her voice. I really should have let you die. Now get out! He looked at her with a dark expression. You'll need to help me to my dorm, I think. She narrowed her eyes as he tried to pull himself upright. Unfortunately, he was right. He might have taken her blood, but it wasn't nearly enough to set him right. She grabbed his arm and hauled him to his feet, kneading him out. He slumped over her shoulder, and she almost toppled with the weight of him. She tugged open the door with difficulty, but before they were through, she pushed him against the frame. He gripped her shoulders. He looked exhausted, and his skin was ashen. Come back, and I will kill you. Then she shoved him into the hallway, slamming the door shut behind him. She turned instantly, sinking to the floor, trembling. Her chest was soaked with his blood. She peered down, tugging off her patchwork cloak and examining it with shaking fingers. Most of the blood was on her nightdress, and some was sticky in the blonde curls that had come loose from her bun. Her cloak, though, she choked on a sob and made for the bathroom. A stain of red saturated the patch of white embroidered eagles. As she scrubbed it with cold water, watching crimson swirl down the sink, the image of Silas's feral eyes bored into her. She could feel the moment his teeth sunk into her neck, or the way his hand had crushed her throat. She warred again with her tears. It's going to be okay. I can do this. The mantra echoed in her head, but it wouldn't last. She'd not had anyone to talk to for months, and now his words would join the list of torments that sung when she tried to sleep. The world didn't want you. You think I didn't notice how weak you are, trying to keep up with everyone else? Why is that? He was right. Even if she practiced every day, she'd never catch up. How could she? when she'd cheated her way in. Of everything tonight that made Silas's blood boil, there was one thing he couldn't let go of, a gaping hole in his chest, and that she'd healed it without blinking. The one type of magic he couldn't use, the one type of magic that mattered more than anything else, and she could do it without a thought. He hated her for it and for stabbing him, because genuinely, what the fuck? The journey to his room was humiliating. He had to rest against the smooth, cool stone walls, each breath sending pain across his chest. Luckily, it was late enough that the corridors were silent, but for the echoes of his uneven steps and the low crackle of flickering torches along the walls. The other students thought he was the most powerful vamp who'd ever crossed the academy's doorstep. And to be honest, they were probably right. Best not to smear his reputation in the first month. When he finally reached his door, he knocked rather than fumbling for his key, and Axel opened it, his grin vanishing. Axel moved to him instantly, hauling Silas to his bed without a word, a much easier task for Axel than it had been for Briar. The bitch stabbed me. No point sugarcoating it. Where was your glint? Didn't have it up, did I? Silas growled. Not really the point right now, was it? Why? But Axel cut off at Silas's expression. You need healing? He asked, his voice the slightest bit weary as he brought up the touchy subject. Silas shook his head, and the tension broke. Axel let out a small breath. They sat for a long moment and Silas bristled again at the thought of what had just happened. Exactly what were you doing when she stabbed you? Axel moved to sit on his bed across from Silas. Now the immediate urgency of the situation had settled. An irritating smile played on his lips. Silas sighed, peeling his shirt off and using the dry parts to wipe away the blood. I lost my temper, he admitted. 
She spat in my eye. He ground the words out, the memory enough to elevate his heart rate. A slight choking sound came from Axel, who covered it up with a cough. Silas gave him a look that said, not the time. But then when had Axel ever given a shit? Reckless, leaving your armor down. Silas knew where he was going with this. I don't want to hear it. He balled up the bloody rag and tossed it into the laundry basket. You thought she was a kitten? Axel yawned as he added, Didn't think she'd fight back? She's just some peasant, Silas muttered, but Axel straightened. No one who comes here is just some anything. Don't go underestimating the other students. I get it. Where did she stab you? Bloody heart feels like. There was a long pause. How are you still alive? Silas lay down, staring up at the stone above. Rather not talk about it. She healed you? Axel's voice cracked with a laugh. She stabbed you and healed you? She's insane. Silas sighed. I'm stuck with her. She's draining my magic dry, and I don't have enough to... He cut off, not yet willing to admit that last part out loud. But he didn't have to. Axel knew why he needed his magic. Silas rubbed the bridge of his nose. It came out tonight. His voice was quiet. When I was trying to get her to agree. Barely noticed till I had her by the neck. The weight of that implication hung between them. It's my fault we're here, and the first thing I do is screw everything up. He ran his fingers through his hair. He'd had to get involved, hadn't he? She's less than grateful, though, Axel said. I didn't do it for her sake. They both knew that. The first time Silas had seen her, he'd wanted to interfere so that he could feel powerful. The greatest power the world had to offer, not that of taking life, as his mother would have him believe. No, he'd been tempted by a power he'd never had. Only now, Briar didn't worship him, she hated him. Well, lesson learned. Axel broke the silence with a light-hearted tone. Next time you're choking someone, don't forget your glint. That finally got a snort out of Silas. If it's consensual. He grabbed at any opportunity to change the mood. Axel's grin broadened, and he pulled his blanket around himself. Always wear protection, mate, he said as he tucked himself in for bed. Tell you what, tomorrow I'll deal with her. Silas hesitated. The casual offer was not adequately reflective of what he was about to agree to. Axel was both ruthless and lazy, a combination which gave him quite a knack for going for the jugular. But then, Silas needed his magic and didn't want to go near her any time soon. And she had literally stabbed him. Yeah, all right. Silas pulled his blankets over himself. He was exhausted. He'd drank her blood tonight, and it made his stomach twist in humiliation. It felt like a violation that she'd forced him to, because it was never as simple as the act itself. He hated every instance in his life when he'd done it, and remembered each one. Now she was on that list, too. As her blood coursed through his veins, he felt it tug at him as fresh blood always did. Images flashed in his mind her collarbone against his jaw as her warm skin gave way beneath his fangs. Chaotic blonde curls that had smelled of mint. The warm flesh of her thigh as he pinned her down. When she'd been standing across the room from him, he'd seen the curve of her thighs between her nightdress and stockings. Now he was thinking of it, they'd been kind of perfect. Ugh! He sat up in bed, the world spinning from the movement. He dragged fingers down his face like he could scratch the thoughts from his mind. What was going on? Drinking human blood was always followed by images, but until now, he'd only ever dreamed of going further, cleaving, shredding, mutilating. Not of, well, not of that. 
for the first time he wished for those violent dreams. Might make him feel better after she'd stabbed him. But this? He'd carve his eyes out first. You all right, mate? Axel asked from under his duvet. He sounded half asleep. Yeah, fucking brilliant. Chapter 2 Healing One of the Five Instinct Magics Physical Reparation of Human or Animal Bodies Healing Does Not Affect Corporeal Demon Forms This class will be examining the nature of biomages. Professor Osark swept into the room, his presence enough to silence the chatting students. Afternoon classes were held in a high-ceilinged lecture hall. To get here, Briar had taken spiral stairs beneath ground and followed an eerie hallway. On this level, the floors were made of the same stone as the walls, instead of cozy wooden panels, like in her dormitory. The grand room was windowless, lit with torches which dimmed around them, leaving the professor in the brightest space below her. Rows of semicircular oak benches climbed up the room like large steps, and Briar was tucked into a back corner. It was cool down here, and Briar tugged her academy cloak around herself. Morning classes consisted of intense physical training, so she'd changed out of the training leathers for the afternoon. Now she wore the academy-provided uniform, a black pleated skirt with high stockings, a button-up white shirt, and the thick black cloak. Professor Ozark was a tall, thin man in middling years who wore sharp black robes and had a neat strap of a beard. Let us discuss the magic you can do, he was saying. All the rules you break by existing, and exactly why the government will hang you without trial any chance it gets. Uh, pay attention. The last student who slept through this lesson accidentally bound himself to a fosling before the term was up. Whoa. Briar straightened in her seat at that, hoping he was joking. This was their first class with him. Last week had been a blur of examining all the basics with Professor Naveen. There were some uncomfortable laughs around the room, but Ozark ignored them. You are all now biomages. Last week you drank the inducement potion and survived, but you have yet to bond a demon to take its form. That is what we will be preparing you for in Term 1. Briar closed her eyes for a second settling her heart at the memory of that potion. An underground chamber, bodies slumped in their chairs, some on the floor, unmoving as she'd staggered by them. Ozark was barreling on. There are five types of magic that all biomages have, even before bonding their demon. He began a list on long, thin fingers. Healing, amplification, stealth, glint, and atmospheric magic. Someone tell me the parent magic of these abilities and why you all now have them. Even Briar was sure of the answer to that. He had just listed the five types of instinct magic. Only a few students had the courage to raise their hand, however. Most people had a basic knowledge of magic, but it was one thing to have good sense and another to try to explain it under the appraising gaze their professor was leveling around the class. Yes, Ozark pointed to Venus Donovan, who was sitting in the row in front of Briar. Instinct magic, Venus sounded sure. Golden magic, the inherent magic of humans. The potion we drank opened our access to it. Ozark nodded, his eyes roaming the students. For most mages, each of the types of magic is distinct. Their access, clear cut. He tugged on the collar of his shirt beneath which Briar could see the faint amber glow of crystal between his collarbones. She shivered and noticed the tense expressions on the faces of other students. It was rare for a bone mage to reveal their jewels. As a bone mage, this instinct stone allows me access to instinct magic, and instinct magic alone. Each of my four stones gives me a different magic, but as biomages, you won't get jewels. You won't get tattoos or gem braces or blood magic. What you will get is much, much more dangerous. Bone and blood mages, hex witches, the painted veils. 
What do all these mages have in common that you will not? This time Briar was much less sure. Ozark waited as the silence swallowed the room whole. Finally his gaze fell somewhere to Briar's left. Care to take a stab, Master Liren, since you already have some expertise on the subject? Ozark asked. Briar glanced over to spot Silas not far off. He was slouched with crossed legs, and his chin rested on his fist as if he were entirely bored. Beside him, his red-haired friend, Axel, sat with his head resting against the wall, eyes closed, as if equally unengaged. Briar noticed the students had left a wide space around them. The two of them had gained a reputation quickly, separate even from the widespread knowledge of Silas's form. They were both top in combat training, and Professor Naveen hadn't been able to catch either of them out with questions last week, even when she'd caught Axel reading during one of her lessons. Silas sighed, his eyes darting around before he answered. Biomage's access to magic is volatile because we open our souls to bond with demons, and they don't follow the same rules as humans. Precisely. Now, the academies are one of the only places on Vostra that have a protection spell powerful enough to keep out all demons. Why is it so important to keep demons out before the trial? So, we don't accidentally bond to something like a fossling while we train? A lad sitting at the front of the class said with a snort. Briar thought Ozark might have spared the smallest quirk of his lips. Correct. As Liren kindly told us, demons don't follow the same magical rules as humans. Their power is variable, a part of nature, unpredictable. That is why biomages are outlawed. The only amnesty you will be offered for what you have become is upon one year service at the Breach War. Osark had returned to his desk, a chill settled in the room. Their year at the Dusk Breach was something none of them wanted to think about too hard. They had three terms left of school before they'd be there, and right now that seemed comfortably far away. Should you leave before your service, you will be hunted and executed without trial. Ozark folded his arms. In order to keep our doors open, we must follow extremely strict rules. You're not permitted out of the protection spell until you've killed a demon. In the trial, there are only six types of demons approved for bonding. Once you bond, you will keep the magic you have now, your instinct magic, but the beast you slay, and all of its volatility, may grant you access to other types of magic. Drake shifters, for example, wield fire, an elemental magic. Vampire forms have coercion, a universe magic. And this unpredictability is the reason biomages are so strictly monitored. Are there questions? What are the six demons? Someone asked. A lesson for another week, Ozark replied. What qualifies a demon to be approved for bonding? Venus asked. Like, what would happen if you bonded a non-approved demon? Lewis Earl, sitting ahead of Briar to the left of Venus, made a choked sound. Venus shot a weary glance his way before turning back to Ozark, who had begun his explanation. There are several qualifying factors, and even now we have limited research. So far, only a few demons have been approved. Briar noticed Lewis leaning back, turning to Hazel, the student nearest Briar. How can she have got all the way here and not know why we wouldn't want to bond something like a bloody bow lamb? He whispered. Briar was trying to focus on the answer Ozark was giving. Frankly horrifying forms, if unlucky, and unpredictable powers, while some demons are very consistent. At Briar's side, Hazel snickered. I said it, she whispered. She's never been within five feet of an actual demon in her life. Daddy probably paid mages to follow her around every time she left the mansion. Venus Donovan was, aside from Silas, the only other student who had come from significant money. Her embroidered cloaks and expensive training garb in last week's classes had given that away. Briar felt a pang of worry as she tried to keep her eyes on the front of the class. If she was honest, 
She hadn't had too many run-ins with demons herself at home, unless she counted harmless rogues like Nivims, appearing in the kitchen sometimes when Jara burned dinner. Briar always enjoyed watching them dance about the ceiling and eating up all the smoke. Once Linny, the matron, had caught Derek cheating on her in their quarters. Briar had seen him sprinting down the halls, kicking the trousers from around his ankles as he raced for the guards, a screet charging down the hallways after him. The screet, an infidelity human, had pounced right on Briar, a human-sized blur of talons and ocean blue feathers. From its huge beak, it had screeched, in considerable and embarrassing detail, the acts Derek had been involved in when he'd been caught. Truthfully, though, Linny and her frying pan, who'd followed up the chase, had been much more terrifying. Ahead of Briar, Venus seemed to be having trouble focusing on Ozark's answer, too. Her shoulders were hunched. She's going to get ripped to shreds in the trial, Lewis was saying. Briar's eyes snagged on him before she could catch herself. You don't think so? Lewis asked, appraising Briar. What does some rich slag like her think she knows about a place like this? Briar could feel Venus's gaze on them, as if she was listening to every word they said. Briar shrugged. Does it matter where she came from, if she can outdo us on all the courses? And it was true. Despite her slight frame and obviously wealthy background, Venus had performed handily so far, enough to make Briar jealous, and she'd not deny seeing someone with money and skill grated a little, or a lot. But Venus didn't seem the type to rub it in like Silas. Next to them, Venus relaxed. You're asking the wrong bitch, Lewis, Hazel sneered. This one's in the pocket of the rich kids. Lewis turned to focus on the rest of the class. Venus shot Briar a look, and Briar couldn't tell if it was grateful or guilty. What she did know, though, was that nothing would come of it. Venus had been the one who'd walked into Briar's dorm after initiation last week, taken one look at her amber eyes and backed right out in a panic, mumbling something like, Must have been the wrong room. Briar didn't blame her. Coming from wealth was different to being a noble. And even Venus Donovan, like everyone else, didn't want to get caught up with Silas Liren. Briar heard the faint tap of Ozark's foot as he checked the class for more questions. When none came, he went and sat on the desk at the edge of the central platform. Well, if that is all, I wonder if I might petition a demonstration. Ozark turned his gaze to Silas. Master Liren? There was a long pause and Briar angled to catch Silas's expression. You want me to shift in front of the class? Silas's voice was icy. Like a party trick? Quite. Ozark's eyes narrowed slightly. A marvelous opportunity for first-termers. Another long silence followed, as if by refusing, Silas could prompt Ozark to move on. Ozark arched his fingers at his desk, waiting patiently. Silas's chair scraped as he stood with a scowl. Come on, to the front, Ozark beckoned him. Briar had to bite back a smile at the distaste in Silas's expression. If the room had been tense before, it was nothing compared to when Silas walked forward. Every eye was on him, and Briar heard a few scattered whispers. No one knows what demon he bonded. I heard he's a vamp but not one the Academy offers. He must have come from the amnesty. No other reason for someone like him to be here. Briar wondered about that last one. Even being a noble, perhaps, wasn't enough to protect him from Ladrina's laws against biomages. She couldn't help but remember the shadows behind his eyes last night. She had the distinct impression she'd only witnessed a fraction of his form. There are four form variations in biomages, Ozark went on. Delta, the weakest form, then the gamma form, beta form, and finally the alpha form, a form where the biomage is least human and most demon. Silas reached the front platform, and Briar could see the tick in his jaw from here. Most never reach their alpha form. 
Ozark peered up at Silas. Now what about you, lad? Ozark asked. Lad? A smile crept onto Briar's lips. Silas looked as if he wanted to rip Ozark's throat out, and his thumb ran along his nail beds furiously. Which form can I reach? Or which form do you want me to parade around? Silas's voice was tight. He just sounded so irritated, and it was music to Briar's ears. Which can you reach? Ozark was curious all of a sudden. Silas's eyes narrowed, and Briar thought he was going to argue. But Ozark lifted a finger toward Silas. The truth, lad. The words sounded strange to Briar's ear, and in the air between them Briar saw a flicker of light. A purple glyph burned in the air, and then it was gone. Had he? No way. But she hadn't imagined it. When they signed their contract to enter the school, they'd also signed themselves into a charge spell. It wasn't a strong one, and only lasted for the duration of the schooling, but it gave the members of the faculty the power to coerce or discipline them if it was necessary. Another stipulation of government oversight, she'd heard. If these academies were birthing infinitely powerful and volatile mages, they needed ways to control them in case something went wrong. But she'd not yet seen a teacher actually use it. If Silas had been angry before, it was nothing to the threat burning in his eyes as he stared down at Professor Ozark. To his credit, Ozark was completely calm, which was more than Briar could have said for herself last night under that same gaze. All of them. When Silas finally spoke, his voice was soft. Ozark lifted an eyebrow. You could demonstrate your alpha form right now? He sounded incredulous. Yes, but... Silas gave the man a tight-lipped smile. That would be inadvisable. I see. For a moment, Briar wondered if Ozark would ask it of Silas anyway. Your delta form will suffice for a demonstration. Silas didn't look away from Ozark as he drew on his form. Even if Briar had already seen it, it was enough to make goosebumps prick along her skin. The classroom dimmed, the flickering torches shrinking slightly. Silas's fingers turned to sharp black claws, the darkness creeping up his arms like ink, fading before the rolled-up sleeves of his black button-up. His eyes blazed amber, and his ears turned to points, their tips also black. They weren't visible through his pursed lips, but she knew if he bared his teeth, there'd be fangs. Fangs that had bitten her not long ago. Her heart raced at that thought, and something swooped in her stomach. When he shifted, there were a couple of shocked gasps from the students, a buzz of whispering, and Briar noted the unnerved expressions around her. She understood. It wasn't only his appearance, though the way the shadows clung to his skin was unnatural enough. Looking at him made something within her tremble. It was anxiety, like mice skittering over her soul. His presence was like a looming shadow, ever reminding her of how unknown and dangerous the future was, how small she was before it. What demon gave someone a presence like that? It was something she'd wondered all night, plagued by the nightmares of what he'd done. When Silas let go of the form, the room brightened and Briar's mind calmed. Silas's eyes remained on Ozark. I have never seen a form quite like that, Ozark murmured. Does it give you coercion? No. Once more his fingers ran along the beds of his nails. He seemed to be making quite an effort not to glance around the room. Unusual for a vampiric form, Ozark mused. What types of magic does it have, then? Finally, Silas's gaze broke from the professor. Briar noticed his eyes slide to the back of the room, and she followed it to his friend. Axel was watching carefully, his eyes fully attentive to the professor's platform. When his gaze returned to the professor, Silas had changed. He'd relaxed his tense shoulders, and there was a slight sneer on his face. A bit personal, 
he said. Shouldn't you have bought me a drink by now or something? Briar heard a few chuckles. Ozark smiled coldly. Well, thank you for the demonstration, that's all. Though I've never met a biomage who thinks that's personal. Ozark cut off. Dismissed, Silas hadn't waited, striding to his feet before the professor had finished speaking. Briar was still nervous as she returned to her room after dinner, both from experiencing Silas's form during class and from the constant nagging that what had happened last night was far from the last time she'd hear from him. She glanced around at the two beds. There was still a reddish-brown stain on the floorboards of her room. Huh. Noble blood dried the same as all blood. Her heart warmed at the thought, but then she checked she'd locked her door before settling in for the evening. She rooted through her library books, scouring them for information on the magic they were learning. She'd still not been able to produce any amplification magic, and she was desperate for a reason. No one else seemed to have issues like her. Finally, she gave up and headed to the shower. Beneath the hot running water, she felt her nerves cool. She tried to make a plan. She knew this thing between her and Silas wasn't over. He was dead set on blocking her using magic. Fucking prick. She ran her fingers through her hair, tilting her head up, letting the hot water run across her face. But then suddenly, it was smothering her. Teeth sunk into her skin. Murderous eyes full of hatred watched her as she fought him. Hands crushed her neck too strong. Briar ground fingers into her scalp. Get it together, she whispered into the steam, refusing to move. Her past whispered in her ear. He'll claw his way into every corner of your life, just like me. No. No more losing it. No more flashes of red, like the one that had seen her spitting in his face or stabbing him. Just leave me alone. Her nails bit at her scalp. Water ran down her cheeks, over her nose, splattering onto the wooden panels below. She turned off the shower and tugged her tangle of wet blonde curls forward, squeezing the water from them, each twist calming her. She slid the thin wooden screen open before pausing. Something was wrong. Steam hung in the air from her shower, yet there was something out of place. A musty smell of charred wood filled the room. Briar looked up, and her heart bottomed out of her chest. A man sat lazily on her desk chair in the center of her bathroom, his elbow resting on her vanity. He held a lit cinder coil to his lips, taking a drag. His green eyes watched her with interest from beneath a sweep of flame-red hair. Axel. He looked as if he'd come straight from evening field training, in black trousers, knuckle-cut gloves, and a towel around his neck. No shirt covered the tanned skin of his torso, and it was a powerful torso too, muscles rippling along his abdomen. Briar spun back behind the thin wooden sliding door, pressing herself against it, a hand clamped over her mouth. Her chest was tight. I'm here for a chat, kitten. You come out, or I'll come in. Your choice. How did you get in? Her voice shook. She was completely naked. Completely fucking naked. She felt sick at the way he'd eyed her up and down. And her dagger was on the vanity he was leaning on. Balcony. His voice was offhand. You got five seconds. Briar clamped both her hands over her mouth, muffling a panicked wail that tried to escape. Five. Shit. She tried to calm her ragged breathing. Four. What was he going to do? Tears almost sprung to her eyes at the question, but she blinked them away. Three. Briar tugged her hair from its twist, splitting it and tugging it forward to cover her breasts. Two. It's just a body. It doesn't matter if he sees it even if no one else has. She ground her palm into her forehead. It 
doesn't matter. One. Briar had to steady herself on the wall as she stepped around the door. She didn't want to look at him, but fought her gaze as it tugged toward the floor. She'd meet his eyes, or he'd won already. Axel took the cinder coil from his mouth as he dragged his eyes slowly up her body, flashing a sickening grin. It doesn't matter. Those words were solidly losing to reality. She leaned against the wooden panels of the shower wall, folding her arms over her breasts and forcing her shoulders to relax. She had a few grains of pride to uphold. What do you want? It was an effort to keep her voice steady. Well, first I was curious about this. Axel returned the cinder coil between his teeth and lifted the long piece of white fabric she used as a chest wrap. I'll talk to you about my wardrobe choices when I'm actually wearing them. As if he would just hand it over. As if the fact she was completely naked and vulnerable wasn't the entire point. It's a nice rack. His eyes lingered on her chest, where her dripping hair fell. Not up for sharing with the world? he asked. When it's full of people like you? Briar asked. Couldn't think of why. Keep their attention from you, Blossom. If they see something they like, they'll take it. She'd taken her father's advice as literally as she could. She wrapped her chest and kept her hair tied in a tight bun when out. If there was anything to make her less appealing, she'd do it. And now this, this pig was eyeing it all like she was a piece of meat. Her cheeks were heating. How long was he going to make her stand like this? You're not an idiot, a huh, kitten? He cocked his head as if the thought surprised him. My name isn't Kitten, idiot. Then she took a step forward, making a grab for her towel on the vanity, the closest piece of fabric. He was quicker, pulling it out of reach. She returned to where she'd stood, keeping as much distance between them as possible. I think, he said, given your predicament, you're anything I want you to be. The way he looked at her made her cheeks flare hotter. She didn't answer not wanting to push that line of thought any further. Tell me what you want. Her eyes darted from the towel to the dagger on the table. He followed her gaze and picked the dagger up, twirling it between his fingers. I can't. He rolled the cinder coil between his teeth. I'm still deciding. Those words sent a chill down her spine. This about Silas? She asked, desperate to discuss that rather than whatever else might be racing through his mind. His gaze snapped to her eyes at Silas's name, and she knew it had worked. Hmm. Axel seemed deep in thought for a moment. What happened yesterday was a problem. We agree on something. I doubt that, he said. My problem isn't just that you almost killed him and Briar couldn't miss his simmering rage as he said that. But you also haven't agreed to what he needs, and I won't agree. Axel took the cinder coil in the same hand he held the dagger, gazing between them. He stood and took a few steps, closing the distance between them. Briar fought not to step away as he towered over her. She'd felt small next to Silas, but Axel had the kind of height that had let you spot him in most crowds. He was, plain and simple, a beast of a man, and by the way he held himself, he knew it. As he looked down at her, all of her instincts screamed at her to move. Duck into the shower and slam the door closed. Completely useless advice. Here's the thing you need to know about me and Silas. Axel's voice was frighteningly quiet, as he fixed the coil between his teeth, her dagger tauntingly loose in his grip. He's the nice one. Briar might have laughed at that notion, if she wasn't scared so shitless, and if the implications of it weren't staring her in the face. Her eyes were trained on the blade he held, though, her heart pounding in her ears. But then he flipped it and held it out to her. 
Her throat was bone dry all of a sudden. She stared between the knife and his daring expression, as if it were a trap. But a trap required deception. If she took that dagger and tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, they both know who'd come out on top. She'd taken Silas by surprise, but nothing about Axel was inattentive. She remained frozen, and after a long moment, he tossed it. She watched it skid across the floorboards along with any of her remaining hope. I can't stop using my magic. Her nerves shook her voice, and it sounded more like a plea. Gross. Axel moved in a flash, reaching out and grabbing her chin so hard she thought it might bruise. The touch sent adrenaline and terror through her veins, and she clutched at him, wet fingers fighting to peel his grip away. We'll see. Then he stepped beside her. With one powerful motion, he shoved her into the shower wall. Pain exploded at the back of her skull, the world spinning as she gasped in shock. But in the next moment, the ache receded rapidly, and the world steadied. She blinked fresh tears away, staring up at him, terrified. Had he just... Healing, he mused. It's going to be great for these sorts of things. I could do that over and over again. Briar swallowed, fear drowning her previous convictions. He kept his vice-like grip on her, and she still clutched it. Is that what Silas keeps you around for? Briar's voice cracked. Beating people up he can't face himself? Keep him talking. Alex cocked his head slightly. Well, I'd be lying if I said this wasn't a much more enjoyable job than most I end up on, he said. My hands usually end up a lot filthier. But you're some poor little girl who got in our way, so you aren't going to be that much trouble, right? She opened her mouth, then shut it again. His fingers dug painfully into her cheeks and jaw. She wanted to argue with him, to tell him she absolutely would be a problem. But she didn't want him to have to get his hands filthy, whatever that meant. I'm not a little girl, was what she settled on. Alex paused as if surprised. Then he took the coil from between his teeth, leaned away slightly and barked a laugh, sounding startlingly genuine. You know, humor danced in his gaze as he searched her eyes. If I were in your position... I'd be working hard not to draw attention to that. She bit her lip, refusing to respond, partly because he was completely right. You get to decide how this is going to go, he continued. He let go of her chin, his fingers running through her hair before bawling his fist in her scalp so tightly she gasped. I doubt anyone's going to come for you, so we have all night. Panic swelled within her as she stared into his green eyes. He took a drag of the coil between his teeth and blew the smoke into her face, making her flinch. Admit you can't handle me, kitten. He took the towel from his neck and proffered it to her. She grabbed at it, and he drew it away sharply. Just let him break you, those voices begged. Whatever it took, for she had nothing left. You deserve it. But she was cold, bare, and trembling, and she'd never felt so vulnerable. Axel inhaled, his attention shifting as he took the coil from his mouth. With the last puff it burned to a stub. He regarded it, then released a deep sigh as he flicked it to the shower floor before returning his attention to her. There was a spark of irritation in his eyes, and she shrunk beneath that gaze. And at the realization that he'd turned her dignity inside out in the time it took him to finish one cinder coil. Maybe I can go to the warden and say what? She wondered. That these two were after her because she had half of Silas's magic? And then she'd have to admit that she had cheated her way into the academy. Axel's grip tightened as he waited. She gritted her teeth. Don't you dare give up this easily. But the pleading voice wasn't enough. I'll stop, she choked, 
cringing as her resolve crumbled shamefully. Just let go of me. Two weeks she'd been here, and she'd already lost to a noble and his rabid dog. Axel grinned. Well, that was disappointing. His hand didn't relinquish the grip on her hair, though. He wrenched her forward and kicked her legs from under her. Her knees crashed to the shower floor and she whimpered. Her grip clutched his to try and dampen the pain on her scalp. Swear it to me, he murmured, forcing her to face him. Her cheeks burned with the humiliation of it. I swear I won't use any magic after class. Anything so that this would be over. I don't think so. Swear you won't use any of Silas's magic ever unless you get his permission first. She froze, staring at him with wide eyes. Impossible. Say it, kitten. His eyes watched her with bottomless depravity. And he could ask her for anything right now. She'd have to agree. I s swear. Her voice was choked. I won't ever use any magic. Any of whose magic? His grip tightened and her eyes watered. He was fucking enjoying this. One day, she thought, I'm going to kill him. Yeah, you sure are, another voice replied. You, Briar, are pathetic. Go on then, say it. I w won't ever use any of Silas's magic unless he gives me permission. The hateful, trembling words that came through gritted teeth were lead weights, chaining her to her fate. Good girl. Axel patted her cheek and pressed his towel into her shaking grip. She clutched the fabric against her skin as he finally let go of her hair. And in case you have any second thoughts, he pulled something out of his pocket. Her heart tripped as she saw the lock from her door. It had been ripped right off. I might let myself in any time. And then he was gone. Chapter 3 Reprieve from constant threats and loneliness came for Briar on the weekend, and with it, a chance of claiming back control. However, before it did, the last three school days of her second week proved as miserable as the rest. No amplification magic during spas, Professor Naveen announced to the class. They gathered on the field so early mist hung in the air, and Briar hugged herself in the cold even if it was early summer. It was Nial morning, three days until the weekend. Today, she had a problem. Combat basics class had until now featured solo training. Behind a large field was a series of sunken spots in the ground full of obstacle courses they called the pits. Climbing walls, rope nets, and other god-awful structures had left her with grazes, scratches, and rope burns. It provided perfect opportunities to practice healing magic. Though, upon warning of Professor Naveen, Briar never healed all the way, lest she deny her body the ability to get stronger. But this was week two, which meant that they spent half of combat class with a partner. No one in their right minds these days wanted to come near her. She was the freak with amber eyes to match the Lyran noble. Naturally, when Professor Naveen asked them to partner up, students created space around her as if she might infect them. Professor Naveen eyed Briar. She was a tall woman and lean, but built like a warrior. Her skin was rich and dark. Her black hair was short, and her lips were always drawn with impatience. Bishop, train with the Voira! Oh, shit. Could things get any worse? Briar glanced over at the group. Surly faces and hostile eyes looked her way. Voira Islanders who applied here were the only ones mad enough to plan to come to the academy. Their culture trained them from a young age in combat and took pride in the warriors that managed to survive the breach. 
Other students gave the Voira a wider berth than they did Briar. Professor! Ace Luke, one in the group, sounded affronted. We have a routine. You can share it. Or aren't you good enough to teach? They looked sour, but none of them argued. Briar tried to hold her head high as she walked over. It could be worse, she tried to remind herself. Naveen could have found an excuse to pair her with Axel and Silas. Briar bit back the churning sickness that clutched her stomach at the thought of Axel. She'd not slept a wink last night, shooting so many glances at the door that she'd finally given up and settled down in the library. There she'd tried to research magic bonds without success and jumped with terror at every scuffle of a mouse or varying flicker of her own shadow in dancing flames of torchlight. Willow can be her partner, she could hear Ace Luke as she got near. Willow, a girl with dark eyes and chestnut curls pulled into a loose bun, scowled. Like the fuck I am, she groaned. Medora's newest here, give it to her. Briar stopped a distance away, her jaw clenching. She tried to keep her gaze on Ace, tried not to show how off-balance she felt, at Medora's my partner. That was Locke. Ace, you do it. It didn't take a genius to know who gave the orders in the group. Locke was tall and strong, with pale skin, short dark hair, and a fang earring. During last week's training, he came only behind Axel and Silas on the obstacle courses, though he hadn't been too pleased by that at all. No way am I... But Ace cut off as Locke leaned in, whispering something. Ace clenched his jaw before his eyes lit up. When Locke leaned away, Briar noticed Ace's glance across the field. Briar followed his gaze, her pulse quickening as she realized he'd looked straight over to Axel and Silas, who were in the middle of an aggressive spar. Well, this was a nightmare. Willow let out a giggle, having clearly heard what Locke had said as she split off with her partner, Azrael. All right. Ace was swaggering over to Briar, much too enthusiastic now. He had scruffy light brown hair, a notable crook to his nose, and a wide smile. He might be charming if it wasn't for the chill in his eyes. Briar ducked away as he tried to throw an arm around her shoulders. I'm just being friendly, he laughed. Who would have thought the noble whore was such a frigid bitch, eh? She heard another Voira chuckle behind them. Briar stared at him, trying to get a read, bile rising in her throat at his words. She glanced over to Axel and Silas. I have nothing to do with them. Is that right? He asked, folding his arms. Can we just do the training? She could already tell that this was going to be unpleasant. She couldn't ask for another partner, but the drills were simple enough. Sure. Briar took the stance they'd practiced and brought out the wooden dagger they used for class. The first one was a simple disarming drill. Ace slipped the wooden weapon from her grip with ease, and then, without warning, his elbow caught her cheek, sending her sprawling onto the grass. Briar swore, blinking back shock and tears as she wiped her mouth to find blood. Too slow. Ace crouched behind her and held out a hand. It's not part of the drill. She tried to sound nothing more than irritated. Demons won't care. Why should I? If he was trying to intimidate her, it was working. She stood without his help and held the dagger out to him. Your turn. It was hard to keep her expression level. Around them, the other Voira were leaping into spars much more advanced and violent than most of the students. Briar tried to disarm Ace three times, failing each one until his foot caught her ankle and she was on the grass again. It went on like that, and Briar noticed he'd wait until Professor Naveen was in a particularly in-depth demonstration to other students before he'd catch her with his elbow or fist. Go ask for a different partner if I'm too much for you, he taunted from behind her the fifth time he'd slipped in some violence. Briar gritted her teeth, pushing her chest off the ground, the taste of iron strong in her mouth again. Then she felt the pressure of a knee on her back, pushing her down into the grass. She heard Locke's voice above her. Funny way to claim a lass, Locke murmured, 
and something tugged at her hair, forcing her neck into an arch so she could see the field. Get off me! Naveen was consumed with another group of students, and Silas, shit. Briar thought for a second that Silas was heading toward them, his expression dark. Mark her, Locke continued, as Axel stepped in Silas's way. Axel leaned in and said something, and then Silas turned away, taking a stance to begin another spar. Briar hoped Locke hadn't been looking at Silas in that second. Locke went on in her ear and let her wander into the jaws of other predators. Briar shut her eyes, trying to take a deep breath with the pressure on her spine. Her fingers clutched the grass uselessly. I haven't been claimed by anyone. This was a test. Locke wanted to know if Silas would intervene. If he did, though, she'd truly be stuck with him. No. She needed to pretend there was nothing between the two of them and everyone would move on. Don't know if anyone told you, she spoke through gritted teeth, but that's not how we do it here. Your eyes say otherwise, noble whore. Oh, and how those words twisted her up. She had to remind herself that Voira thought differently than the rest of them. Lord Oran, her house lord, had once sent a visiting envoy of Voira packing in the middle of dinner for the way they'd harassed the maids. He was so outraged that he'd not even blinked at the violation of etiquette. He's not coming for me. Her breathing was becoming difficult. Mainlanders, Locke murmured, pathetic. And then the pressure was gone and Briar sat up, taking deep breaths. The other voyeur were watching her with sneers. I'll accept Medora, who'd started a spar with Asriel, as if Locke's distraction was a waste of time. Briar knew the second half of class was the pits, and she'd not stand around and have her face pounded in by thugs trying to provoke goddamned nobles she already hated. She made for the pits without another word to the Voira. If Naveen hadn't noticed her getting smacked around by Ace, she wouldn't notice her leaving early either. As she passed Willow Finch, the woman spat at her feet with a sneer. Briar kept walking. It's like fucking nothing! Briar hated the plea in her voice. Silas leaned on the doorframe of his dorm, arms crossed, glaring at her with narrowed eyes. Just a bit of healing in the evenings. It had been a day since she'd been first paired with the Voira, and they weren't giving up. They'd practiced amplification magic this afternoon which Briar still couldn't do, and Ace had been leering at her the whole time as he'd drawn strength magic into his fists. Between that and Axel's present ownership of the lock to her door, she wanted to busy herself in the evenings until every last predator in this place was asleep. Right at the far end of the pits, Briar had found a course with particularly jagged, broken frames and fraying rope that no one else liked to use. And, well, she needed the practice, but she couldn't practice all morning with Naveen and all evening in the pits without healing magic. There was no way. Every evening, though? Silas asked. Prick. It's not like the healing I had to do to you when... She cut off, realizing too late that she shouldn't be bringing up the time she'd stabbed him if she wanted his agreement. His eyes darkened, catching on. Shit. It's nothing, she hurried on. I'm good at it, all right? It'll barely take any from the pool at all. Not if you impale yourself on one of the stakes. That was Axel's voice from inside the room, which really is quite likely. Briar scowled at the intrusion, her heart taking flight. Silas looked skeptical. Okay. But how do I know you're not trying to sneak a bit of magic every evening? I'm not going to know how you use it. Her jaw actually dropped at that. Yeah, Axel's voice floated out again. But if you're secretly using it for... For what? Briar's voice was shrill. This was completely ridiculous, and she couldn't think straight, knowing that Axel was listening in. She reached around Silas and tugged the door behind him 
letting it nudge him out into the corridor as she slammed it shut. Silas snorted, but Briar turned on him. Why do I have to tell you what I'm doing with the goddamned magic anyway? She demanded. I'm telling you I won't use much, and I won't. Why do you think you deserve... She cut off. Her temper was getting the better of her, which wasn't good. Those voices in her mind were stirring. She clasped her hands together as Silas watched her with a raised eyebrow. Locke was on me yesterday because of you, she said, asking if you'd show up because of my eyes. Silas, infuriatingly, began picking his nails. Right, so what? You want me to bail you out again? What? Briar clutched fingers to her temples. No, you great fucking idiot! Ah, oh, damn. Well, that got his attention. He froze, his amber eyes sliding to her. Her temper was almost enough to ignore the rustling fear in her core as he fixed her with predatory eyes. She swallowed, trying to ground herself. I want you to leave me alone so goddamn snakes like Locke aren't hounding me. They'd give up. It might take a few days, but they'd realize Silas wasn't coming, and she'd fade in their minds. I really don't like how you're talking to me, little vixen. Briar almost snapped completely. He hadn't spent the day sneaking through the academy in fear one of the Voira would see her. She closed her eyes. I hate you. No, saying that would be more than unhelpful. You're an arrogant prick, and I wish the Voira would grow the guts to give you a pounding. Neither would that. Can I use the magic? She asked through gritted teeth. It was all she needed, and she could get out of here. Please. He was watching her with narrowed eyes. I think you've forgotten what you should be more afraid of. Briar blinked, and before she knew it, she shoved a finger right into his chest, her temper finally getting the better of her. Every shadow in this place has it out for me, she snarled. You want the truth? There's enough fear to go around. You can share it with Locke and Axel. I'm sorry I hurt your dumb vamp ego. His hand closed around her finger, and she was suddenly aware of the shadows that were coiling around him, the amber of his eyes glowing slightly. She tried to tug her finger free, her heart thundering in her ears as his magic met her skin. It was ice and heat at the same time. Terror and... and something else that set her on edge. He rounded on her, and she took a quick step away, hitting the door. He loomed above her. You walk around this place with my magic, he spat. Talk about it like it's yours, like you deserve it, and treat me like an inconvenience. His eyes burned with anger. I'm just... She tried to gather her thoughts around his blood-curdling rage. Just trying to survive. Your reputation makes it difficult. I have to convince them I have nothing to do with you, but then I have to ask you for magic in every class? Silas paused, some of the rage fading. Fine. Use the magic you need during classes, he said. But you know the Voira aren't going to kill you. What was that dramatic thing you told me? She asked. There are a lot of things between here and death. None of those things are my problem. If you can't handle the school, why did you come? She took a deep breath, trying to get her temper under control. Handling it is exactly what I'm trying to do. Silas took a moment to reply, still suspicious. One week, he said. You go to the pits in the evenings without my magic. If it works out, you can use it a bit only. If it works out? He was a real piece of work. And, of course, the next day it rained for the first time since they'd arrived. Well, no way she's going out in that. That's what Axel had said as he peered at the thundering rain out on their balcony. But Silas had a hunch. Now, he leaned on the wooden railings on the furthest, most broken-down, dejected training pit in the academy. 
It was cold, and the rain stuck flyaway pieces of his hair to his cheeks. The night was dark enough that he'd tugged on his own transformation as he'd crossed the field to see clearly. And there she was, below him in the training pit, elbows over the top of one of the rain-slicked walls. Her legs kicked desperately, sliding against the wood as she tried to boost herself over it. She slid down, and he saw her snarl, but it was too late. She crashed ungracefully on the pooling mud below. Briar hauled herself onto the nearest platform, holding her right leg as if checking it. Then she stood and went for the wall again. It wouldn't be easy to get a grip in this cold. Well, he had to admit he was surprised. He'd believed Axel's assessment. But something had tugged on him to find out anyway. Silas had assumed her outbursts, her insanity, was a disjointed, erratic thing. He knew now as he watched her here, he'd been wrong. This was the kind of direction that gripped someone right to their very core. He drummed his fingers against the railing as she fell once more. The Voira were, as far as Silas was concerned, a problem. Both Axel and apparently Briar thought the issue would go away if he stayed out of it. They're trying to bait you. Axel had laid a hand on his shoulder in training when he'd seen Locke pinning Briar to the grass. Well, it's working, Silas snarled. They're going for my... Though it was probably best not to say his magic here where people could overhear. React, and you put a target on her back for anyone who wants to challenge you. Axel was right. Given how much of a weakness Briar was for him, it was best no one suspected she meant anything. Let her deal with it. And she was dealing with it. In her own clumsy, weak way, he supposed. But he'd have to trust her to do it. And he really wasn't very good at things like trust. He also really wanted to kill Locke Fang. The possessive creature within him stirred, and a low growl rose in his chest as shadows licked his soaked arms like dark flames. He shut his eyes, reeling it in. Her vulnerability had haunted him, though. Any of those Voira and their lethal training could find her out here and slit her throat, or perhaps make something look like an accident. That would be all it took for Silas to lose everything. Never had that veil been so frighteningly thin before. Of course, this happened right when he'd risked it all, coming to this academy for a chance to be free. The universe wasn't ready to stop punishing him for what he was for what he'd done. He'd almost stepped away, just as Briar reached the top of the same wall. Silas watched her struggle before she fell. Once more she leaped at it, and he lingered. Three more times she tried. On the third, she almost got over the top. When she fell this time, she didn't get up straight away. Oh, come on, he thought impatiently. You almost had it. He realized she'd tugged her knees into her chest in the mud and rain. He stepped away. She'd not want him watching her crying. Right as he turned, his eyes caught movement again. She'd stood and was hauling herself onto a nearby platform. She retreated, pausing for a long second, and then ran, leaping at the wall like an angry cat. She reached the top of it quickly. There was more determination in her movements this time. Silas held his breath, and then she had it. Her momentum was enough to pull herself over the ridge at the top and onto the thin platform. She was so surprised that she almost lost her balance. Not bad, really. He stepped away at last, realizing there was a smile on his face as he walked into the night. With one day until the weekend, Briar was so sore and tired from the pits that it went by in a blur. The group of Voya had decided to stick her with Willow Finch this morning, and she was worse than Ace. Willow didn't pull her punches and slipped in nasty comments every time she'd sent Briar to the ground. How did the potion not kill you? She'd asked at one point, her boot pressing into Briar's chest. I have a grand stronger. It was a relief not to edge up to Silas in class that afternoon, 
she was sick of his smirk when she asked him permission for magic and was constantly worried one of the Voira might spot her talking to him. They sat at the front, luckily, and kept each other occupied with stupid comments all class. Today, Briar worked on glint, something she was weaker at, but she could at least do it. You don't have a spare quill nib, do you? A voice asked at her side. She glanced up quickly, expecting a Voira. Instead, a student she'd never spoken to was peering at her from down the row. Since Hazel had decided to join Lewis and his friend, this was her newest neighbor. He was slender and had messy, sandy blonde hair. His tanned skin was scattered with freckles. What was most notable, though, was that he didn't eye her with wariness like the other students did. What? Briar asked, having barely processed the question. My last nib split. He lifted his black quill to show her. I'm heavy-handed, apparently. Oh, no, sorry, Briar said. Don't have a spare. Damn, he said, as Professor Ozark rattled the box at the front of the class. Get one on your way out. Each quartz gem in these bracelets is carved with a symbol for each of the five magics. Channel into it, and you'll be able to check your proficiency in each. Well, good timing, the guy at her side said as he tugged the broken nib from the quill. If you need more spares in the future, you know you can get more from the supply closet in the library? Uh, yeah. But Briar was only half paying attention to him. Thanks. With one of those bracelets, she'd be able to get a read on her trouble with amplification magic. There was a sudden bustle as students all tried to grab a bracelet at once. She packed up her things and noticed that the sandy-haired man was hovering as if he wanted to say something else to her. Nothing any student had wanted so far had ended well, so Briar made for the front to pick a bracelet before he could say anything. She examined it around her wrist as she sat down in the dining hall, taking her usual seat in the far corner. The bracelet was made of rich brown leather, and along one side were five pearly jewels, thick enough that they pressed against her skin. She turned it in the light, to find delicate symbols etched into the gems. Healing, glint, amplification, atmospheric, and stealth. She took a bite out of a bread roll absently, focusing on channeling into it. It felt a bit odd at first, channeling magic without a direction. The jewels lit up with a warm orange glow, each of a variable strength. The healing jewel was the brightest, its whole surface shining and her stealth not much less. The atmospheric gem was fainter. Glint was almost nothing. But the center jewel for amplification remained completely dull and white. She felt a faint scratching of panic. Briar set down her fork, adjusted the bracelet, and pressed the middle stone into her wrist in case it wasn't touching her skin. And nothing changed. Oh, girly. A familiar snide voice sounded behind her. A tray scraped on the table at her side. You're so fucked. Briar released her magic instantly, spinning in her seat. Willow grinned as she slid onto the bench, peering down at Briar's bracelet. Ace and Medora Rose were behind her, holding trays, their eyes intent on her wrist. We didn't see, Ace complained. I didn't know it was possible not to have a type of magic. Willow tucked a chestnut curl behind her ear, delighted. What? Medora's voice was low. Briar tried to stuff her fist in her cloak pocket, but Willow grabbed her arm. Show us again, won't you? Briar refused to get up. She'd already caught Ace's nasty gaze and the shock in Medora's violet eyes. Let go of me! Briar tried to rip her wrist away, but Willow's grip became vice-like too strong as she slammed Briar's wrist onto the table. Or what? she asked. Will you heal me to death? Ace laughed. Go on. Medora's sultry voice was on her other side as she set her tray down and leaned over curiously. Show us. Briar glanced up, holding Medora's flat gaze for too long. That panic was like vicious claws now, 
trying to rip all her despair and insecurities to the surface. Her chest felt tight. Show us and I'll let you go, Willow taunted, her fingers digging into Briar's wrist painfully. You might need our help to figure out how to put your pathetic skills to use at the breach. Willow was goddamned right, though. Briar was screwed without amplification. Her free hand was on her dagger, knowing it would be a mistake to draw it. She was off kilter. Go fuck yourself, she spat. Voira whore. Willow's eyes lit with rage, but before either of them could do anything, Medora took the mug from Ace's tray and dumped the contents over Briar's head. Sticky, hot liquid dripped through Briar's hair and down her cheek as she froze, mouth open in shock. Willow's face split with a maniacal grin, and Briar took the opportunity with a slackened grip to rip her wrist free. She shoved past Ace before any of them could stop her, fleeing from the hall. When she returned from the pits that night, she pulled out an empty journal from the stack in her bottom drawer. She opened the first page and scribbled a note. I used to miss you, more than anything in the world sometimes, sometimes more than even father. But now I get how much you hated me in the end. I have that hate too now. Briar paused, tears forming in her eyes as she thought of the words she wanted to write. You said I needed you, but I'm going to be fine. Briar closed the book, trembling as she placed it in the bottom drawer of her bedside table. When she stood in the hot shower that evening, she watched the dark water disappear into the drain between her toes. The mud from yesterday's rain had dampened the course, making the entire experience gross and wet. She felt much better as she dressed in a clean nightgown and because the lock was missing from her room, her large patchwork cloak. Briar curled up on her pillow, trying to focus on the good. For example, it was the weekend tomorrow, which meant no training with the Voira. Something stopped those thoughts in their tracks as she caught a sharp smell in the air. It was not a bad smell, but it was familiar. She inhaled, trying to place it. The combination of sweet and bitter reminded her of... Briar sat up, standing and tapping the torch on her wall with a trickle of magic so that it burst to life. She squirmed in the dancing light, seeing the crumpled heap of her black school cloak, the one she'd tossed in a pile on her bed after she'd come from the dining hall, after they had dumped the drink on her. Briar grabbed it, holding it close and sniffing it again. Ash root. No way to miss that. It was something scentless when wet, but it rose like a bitter smell after it had dried. Once, an age ago, she'd made a potion with ash root for a prank. It was a bolstering potion, and definitely banned by the school. She lowered the fabric, her mind racing. The drink that had been spilled on her had been Ace's. She tossed the cloak onto her messy pile of dirty clothing and tapped the torch again. As she laid down in bed this time, Briar had many more good things to think of to send her to sleep. If Ace was using potions to enhance his performance in class, there was no way he'd want anyone finding out about it. Chapter 4 Finally, the weekend arrived. The gold coin was an unfamiliar weight in Briar's pocket as she made her way down the wagon-tracked road to the village. It was noon, and most of the students had left for town earlier. While she was happy to be out of classes, the extra time left Briar with too much time to think, and she wanted to hit the pits before the day was over. As she stepped along the dirt road, footsteps sounded behind her and the sandy-haired man appeared at her side, the same one who'd spoken to her in class the day before. Hey, hey, he said. So you're that noble-claimed girl, right? Great. That's me, Briar grimaced as she peered up at him. Grayson. He held out his hand, but she didn't take it. He stepped ahead of her, 
turning and walking backward so she couldn't avoid him. He had his hands tucked in his pockets, and there was a slouch in the way he held himself. Leave me alone. Hear me out. The smile that lit up his face was suspiciously charming. I'm not interested. Let me make you a bet, he said. If I win, I get to be your partner in the next combat training. Briar paused, eyeing Grayson as if trying to find the joke. She slowed, glancing up and down at him. He was taller than her, sure, but less brutish than most of the assholes she'd been dealing with. There was only lean muscle under that coat, if anything at all. I'm an absolute hazard in combat training, if that's what you're checking me out for. I wasn't checking you out, she muttered. You'd have me on my ass most of the time, I'd bet. And why would you do that? He'd be launching himself right into the middle of this stupid Voira versus Vamp politics she'd somehow found herself in. I'm not being altruistic, Grayson countered. I have selfish reasons. Briar narrowed her eyes. What's the bet? Voira have been hounding you all week, right? Grayson asked. Not a peep from your noble and his mutt. I am really sick of explaining this to people, Briar sighed. I'm not associated with them. Yeah, so say I believe you, he sounded dubious. Does it bother you he's not stepped in? Briar raised her eyebrows at him. Why would he? Here's the thing. I peg it as strange that he's done nothing. Even if your eyes happen to be a coincidence, Locke's going for you, thinking you're his, so it is an attack on him. Whore, Briar snorted. He's a noble who thinks the rest of us are all beneath him and doesn't give a shit. Now, nah, he's a vamp before he's a noble. What does that mean? Means they're territorial. Didn't you read the textbooks? He's got to want to come for Locke, even for the illusion of stepping on his territory. You've given this way too much thought. I'll still prove you wrong before the day's out. And how are you going to do that? Neither the vamp nor Axel has offered you any protection from the Voira? Grayson asked. Briar shook her head. By the end of the day, I'll bet you one of them will have. Briar laughed. He was a fool. Even if she wanted that kind of offer from Silas and Axel, which she didn't, it was never coming. You know what? Fine. What do I get if you're wrong? Grayson grinned turning and walking at her side as the few scattered houses around them got closer and closer together. What do you want? To be honest, I'd still take you as a partner in combat training. Grayson folded his arms. Not much of a bet then, is it? Briar shrugged. Okay, but if you're wrong and I don't get an offer, you tell me your selfish reasons. She couldn't think of why someone would willingly get involved with her. Grayson grinned as the aroma of fresh-baked bread rose in the air from the crowded cottages that made up the main street. Something about him put Briar at ease. She couldn't put her finger on what, though. What are you here for, then? he asked as they passed a few stalls with scarves, hats, and cloaks on display. Another had an array of jewelry. Lacking in some basics, to be honest. The one chest wrap she'd brought was almost in tatters, and while the school had provided her with some attire, it didn't fit very well. That being said, she'd not had money like this to spend, well, ever, and she didn't know when she'd get something like it again, so she was going to be picky. Best to keep some reserves, though, in case other needs arose later down the line. What about you? She glanced around at the stalls trying to figure out which to start with. Poor as sin me. He produced three copper coins from his pockets, enough to cover perhaps a few notebooks if he was lucky. You just came to bug me then? Briar asked. Pretty much, he said. But it'll work, you'll see. Briar meandered over to a perfume stall, where a small gray-haired man perched upon a stool, clicking away with knitting needles, as he worked on what seemed to be a baby's jumper. 
Do you have any mint oil? Briar asked. It was the only non-necessity she would buy. The tiny bottle she'd brought with her had almost run dry. Her father had told her once that her mother had sworn by using it in her hair to keep the tangles manageable. It reminded her of him, even if it didn't do a thing for her wild curls. The old man held out a brown glass vial to her. I hope, is this okay? Briar brought out the gold coin, worried that the man wouldn't be able to produce change for such a small item. Not to worry, he said, as he fished in a box for some change. Always one or two of your kind from the academy. Your kind? Briar wondered. She was aware of how Grayson would hear this conversation. She didn't know why, but it bothered her if he thought she was rich. The man took the coin. She hadn't realized what a weight it had been until it was gone. Sometimes at night... She had opened the drawer of her bedside table and stared at it. Only four more the same, she'd thought. As if somehow, if she'd had that kind of money to her name, she could buy her father back from the dead. It was nothing more than a delusion that this nightmare could somehow be undone. That she could return to waking in her cramped bedroom with a sloped roof, with the smell of her father's cooking wafting through the floorboards. Briar tucked the vial into her patchwork cloak pocket as they walked away. I'm not, she swallowed, glancing sideways at Grayson. Got the coin on a bad trade, since there was no other way to characterize a deal with Axel. Don't have anything else. No offense, Grayson said. But you don't look like the rich type. I would know. Briar bit back a smile. Sounded like the opposite of offense to her ears. Right from the slums of Carrenfort, me, he went on. Thought I'd found a way out, but still ended up here somehow. There were all kinds at the academy. This week had proven that. But most were poor, jaded kids with nowhere else to go. Briar had spent the week carefully planning what was most important. She'd decided on a better pair of boots, a bag, since she didn't have enough pockets for all her school stuff, and a good hat for the cold mornings. She found all the items before they'd even reached the main square, with more than half her coins left over. She stuffed the money into her pockets as Grayson vanished from her side, hurrying toward a bookstand. A few other students were meandering around it. Shit, he murmured, tracing a few spines as she joined him. They really know what will sucker us in here, don't they? And he was right. There were books on biomages, books on combat stances, a few on obscure demons and instinct magic. Briar stared at them, something uncomfortable twisting within her stomach. Guess even here money matters. Briar could hear the bitterness in her voice. Give up everything, drink a potion likely to kill you, become a mutant, sell your soul to two and a half years in hell, and still... Status and wealth are the keys to survival. Those with money would have a step up, and lowborns would fall like used-up toys. You okay? Grayson's voice floated into her consciousness. He sounded concerned, as if he'd asked her once already. Briar blinked, realizing she'd been staring at the bookstand for a while. What do you think? She glanced toward the books. What would we get the most use out of? Guess it depends. The demon books are probably redundant. The Academy Library has loads of books on those. Everything they're willing to teach us, anyway. Same with the instinct magic. But the combat stances? Nothing like that in there. Briar settled on two books, one on combat training and the other on potion making. You said we, Grayson said, as they made their way across the square and took a seat on the benches. What? Briar asked. You said what we could get the most use out of, Grayson repeated. Briar huffed a laugh. Well, if you're going to be my combat partner, best if we are on the same page, right? Course. So what else do you have to buy? Briar glanced around at the stalls. 
She'd already eyed the last place she needed to go, but didn't relish the idea of dragging Grayson along. Can you wait here for a second? Then I'll be done. She hopped up, passing the crowded tables out in front of the tavern, and approached one of the clothing stands. She'd picked this one because it had training garb. Discreetly, she chose a few undershirts to replace her chest wrap and sets of other undergarments. She was sick of washing one of her two sets of underwear every night. Then she grabbed a silken nightdress, since the academy provided nightwear was itchy. She turned to the owner and jumped as she found Grayson at her side, peering at the lacy pairs of underwear. What are you doing? she demanded. Curious. Get out of here! She pulled some coins from her pocket and handed them over to the young woman on the other side of the stall. Whoa, look at these! Grayson lifted a bundle of orange-red lace that was trying very hard to be a real piece of clothing. Put them down! Briar's cheeks went red. But they match your eyes perfectly, Grayson snickered. Then he craned his neck as if searching for someone. Oi, vamp! he shouted. Briar followed his gaze. Her blood chilled as she saw Silas at the bookstore they'd just visited, his eyes flickering toward Grayson. Grayson was waving the pieces of lace in the air. Would you deal with those Voira fuckers for her if she asked you in this? Theos! Briar leaped at Grayson, one of her hands clamping over his mouth, the other tugging the lacy thing away. Silas, along with half the square, stared in their direction. Briar, horrified, grabbed Grayson and her satchel, dragging him away from the stall between the tavern and the bakery. What the fuck are you doing? She gave him a shove as her heart thundered in her chest. Grayson couldn't contain his laughter as his back hit the rough stone behind. This was your plan? she asked. Make an idiot out of me? Theos. She thought she'd spotted Willow and Ace in the crowd. Grayson was painting a target on his own back. But did you see his expression? Grayson was asking, neck craned toward the square. Briar stared at him before realizing the black clothing she'd bought was still clutched in one fist. You're mad, she snapped as she stuffed them into her satchel. There was something about his impish expression that was gutting her anger and fright. Sure, but it's worth it. Looked like I'd bloody slapped him. For a second, Briar felt the slightest twitch on her own mouth. Grayson was right. Silas's eyes had practically bulged out of his head when he realized what Grayson was saying. Come on, how about some drinks? You mean at the tavern, in the square? She asked. Well, I've been dogging you all day. Would be a bit rude not to buy the lovely lass a drink after all of it. This lovely lass will break your fingers if you say another thing to him. Cross my heart. So they found themselves crammed around a small, sticky table in the busy tavern, as a jolly, middle-aged man with a round face and receding hairline asked them what they wanted. Two ales, Grayson told him. Briar was glancing around, nervous that the other students might see them. You are so paranoid. Well, excuse me, she grumbled as the man bustled off. You're the one who shouted about Voira fuckers across the square. But none of the stairs had quite the power they'd had before, not with someone sitting across from her. Two mugs of ale were set down in front of them. So how did you end up here? he asked. You seem well-educated, well-rounded, clear-headed. Grayson cut off as Briar snorted into the drink she'd just lifted to her lips. You taking the piss? Was I supposed to have been? Can't say I feel very clear-headed. Got myself stuck in a right mess here. It felt strangely nice to say it out loud. The silence had begun to feel like a collar around her neck, getting tighter and tighter every day. Grayson flashed her that impish smile. See? does make it sound like you had something to do with that. He waved a finger at her before lifting his own drink to his lips. Don't know you well enough. Grayson's eyes twinkled. Yet. Cocky. He looked like he was about to open his mouth for another quip, 
when his eyes found something behind her. His expression stiffened, and the glimmer vanished from his eyes. Then she felt a warm weight of an arm around her shoulder, and heard a voice that set her thoughts scattering. What have we here, kitten? Axel's nickname for her was like a shot of adrenaline in her veins. The world stuttered to a halt, and suddenly she couldn't meet Grayson's eyes. Where did you find this weasel? I don't think she wants you touching her. Grayson's voice was low. Briar wanted to look back up at him, but she couldn't. Why don't we let her tell us, then? Axel asked, and in the next second his breath was close to her ear. Say, you can't handle me, kitten. She was back in her shower, threats that stretched into oblivion, the thousand possibilities that had haunted her dreams. No? he asked, and she felt his weight shifting slightly. Scram, weasel. I need to talk to her. I don't think I'll be going anywhere. You tell him, kitten. Axel's grip tightened on her arm. There was something cool and hard in it. Briar glanced down to see what was pressed against her skin. Her heart bottomed out. It was the lock to the door of her dorm. She closed her eyes. Leave, she whispered. She didn't want Grayson to go. In fact, she wanted to reach across the table and grab his hand, to make a scene. A part of her thought he might be the sort of person who would go along with it. But she kept her eyes shut, fright a light in her blood. Briar? Grayson asked. Axel pressed the piece of metal harder into her skin. She shook her head, swallowing. Please... Leave. She couldn't help her wince, the words going against every instinct she had. Right. She heard the chair scrape. She dared open her eyes to find Grayson standing. He dug into his pocket and dropped two of his three copper coins onto the table. I'll bet, his voice lingered on that last word, I'll catch you later. Dream on. Axel said. Grayson wasn't even out of the tavern before Axel slid into the same seat Grayson had occupied. Briar was just glad that he was no longer touching her. What do you want? she asked. Axel picked up the mug of ale that Grayson had left, appraising it before taking a sip. Thought we should discuss your predicament. What does that mean? Briar was acutely aware of the two copper coins on the table next to them both. Means the Voira are getting on my nerves. One third of what Grayson had to his name, and Axel, who dropped her a gold coin for an inconsequential favor before she'd known who he was, took a drink of that ale like it meant nothing. Hatred burned in her chest. So what? she spat. Axel raised his eyebrows at her. Touchy, he snorted. Thought it would bother you too. I don't need your help. It's not looking that way from where I'm standing. Briar met his eyes, her fear petering out for the briefest second as she realized Axel was doing exactly what Grayson had predicted. Why now? she asked. What was it Grayson had said when he'd left? I'll bet... For a nervous moment, she almost laughed. The bastard had been right. She seized onto that, because even if she didn't know how he'd done it, Grayson had predicted this. That meant both Silas and Axel were human too, with weaknesses. Weaknesses Grayson knew. They won't bother me again, and I'm really hoping you won't either. She stood, not willing to risk being seen around him, any longer than was necessary. Axel watched her as she leaned down to grab her satchel. You aren't going anywhere until I say so, he murmured. Briar turned, wanting to snap at him, to say she wasn't nearly as afraid now that she'd witnessed Grayson play him like this. But he was turning the broken metal lock in his fingers, not looking at her. 
What do you want from me? She asked. I don't need your help with the Voira, but the longer I'm seen with you, the more of a problem they'll be. Sit down, he said, so quietly that she almost missed it. She gritted her teeth, not missing his smoldering hatred, his angled jaw set as he watched her. Did she dare run? If she made a dash for it, he'd have to make a real scene to catch her. But he didn't have to. That was the whole point, wasn't it? She returned to her seat, fingers digging into her bag until they were white. They aren't fucking around, Axel said quietly. You say they won't be a problem, but your answer needs to be better than scrawny prats bodyguarding you into town. The way Axel spoke about Grayson piqued her interest. It was becoming increasingly clear that the two of them knew each other. What could she get away with, pushing that particular pressure point? He might be a pretty addition, she said, a thrill lighting in her chest as she saw his eyes darken. But he's not my answer. And what is? Axel asked. Briar studied him trying to get a read. She had been lucky enough to get this leverage on the Voira. What? she asked. Tell you and risk you blowing it if you're having a bad day? Axel pushed his tongue into his cheek, not returning his gaze to her. I'm already having a bad day, so please. There was something nasty on his face as he met her eyes. Make me make you. Briar knew her expression was bitter. I know one of the Voira take bolster potions. How? he asked. And for a moment, the threat in his eyes vanished, replaced with genuine consideration. They were kind enough to dump some on my head. I know the smell of ash root a mile off. You told them, you know? I'm not an idiot. Thought I'd keep it until I needed it figured training with Grayson in class and not being spotted with you assholes would be enough for now. There was a long pause, and Briar swore he soured for a second. You're training with him now? What is this? she asked. You banning me from having friends? By the look on Axel's face, he wanted to, but he seemed to think better of it. Seems simple to me, she said. You leave me alone, and I'll take care of myself. What just happened? Silas asked. He felt off balance as Axel joined him on the outdoor tavern table, carrying two half-finished mugs of ale. Grayson had slipped out of the tavern doors first. His curious gaze had met Silas's with an irritating lack of fear. In fact, Silas could have sworn he was smirking. Eventually, Briar followed. Her scattered blonde curls were in a messy bun, and she was wearing her odd patchwork cloak. She'd not met his eyes as she'd passed, but the tenseness in her body language made it clear she'd spotted him. She'd been close enough he'd caught the briefest smell of mint from her hair. He was warring with the images it had elicited, the tang of iron on his tongue as he thought of her blood. Axel wasn't replying. All week, Silas leaned in, his voice a low hiss. You've been on my ass. Leave her be, he mimicked. Don't let the Voira see you near her, or we're fucked. Axel shot him a dirty look, his thick, dark eyebrows knotted in a scowl, but he said nothing. Five seconds she's with that prat, and you're on her like a damn bloodhound. Axel clenched his jaw downing the remains of one mug and then the second. He wiped his mouth with his sleeve and slammed both into the table. Why? Silas asked, better to voice what was playing on his nerves. Does it feel like we've just been played by Grayson fucking steel? Chapter 5 You all right? Grayson asked when she'd opened her dorm to him later. Briar folded her arms, leaning against the doorframe. She was reassessing Grayson. 
He had, after all, been right about Axel. Look, he said, I'm sorry about earlier. I didn't know it'd be like that for you. It took a second for her to realize what he was talking about. But then, it may have appeared quite disturbing to watch her reaction to Axel, and Grayson seemed to take her silence as irritation. I agreed to the bet, she said with a shrug. Grayson relaxed at her tone. And you were right. He offered then? Grayson grinned. Briar couldn't help her own smile. Yeah, he did. Knew it. He doesn't like you very much, I gather, Briar asked. Something about Grayson, all impish smiles, reckless curiosity, and bottled up brazen energy, got under Axel's skin. And she was kind of into it, as dangerous as that might be. No. Grayson's ice blue eyes hardened at that admission. And I'm not particularly fond of him. Likewise. What does he have on you then? Grayson asked. What does he have on me? Briar snorted. You mean aside muscles and magic? The lock he ripped off my dorm door. Grayson raised his eyebrows at that. Oh yeah, and don't forget, that void that sucks up all moral integrity that floats about around his head. Briar cut off as Grayson barked a laugh. One second. She backed into her room and grabbed her new bag. She dug in the pockets and drew out two copper coins. Here. She returned and held them out. No. He drew away. Come on, it would make me feel better. Besides, these coins were courtesy of Axel anyway, so it seemed appropriate as he'd been the one to take the drinks. Grayson retreated. Oh, take them, she said. If you wanted to spend them taking me out for drinks again, I wouldn't argue. He eyed her, unsure before he took them. Maybe I'll do that. There was a slight smile tugging on his lips. Training partner? Isle morning then? She asked. Yeah. Maybe we could spend some of this weekend studying that book you picked up to prepare. Count me in. The first two days of the third week of term went significantly better than the previous. She partnered with Grayson both mornings in combat training, and the Voira didn't seem bothered by it. Silas hadn't made a move to defend her, so Briar couldn't imagine it was worth it any more to them. She was nervously optimistic about the whole situation and felt lighter, which might purely have been on account that Grayson could make her laugh and she hadn't been able to laugh about anything since her father had died four months before. By viol evening, Briar was out in the pits again. The mud had dried up, which she appreciated, but made the ground harder to crash into, something she did a lot. She was focused on her progress, making the jump from one of the rope-hanging platforms to the next, when she spotted movement in the dim light of the moon. She grabbed a rope to steady herself, squinting at the black, hooded figure leaning against the wooden barrier at the top of the pit. For a moment, she was afraid it was Ace, Locke, or one of the Voira, but there was something familiar about the slouch. She was unsurprised when he tugged off his hood, and she saw the dark wisps of hair fluttering around pale skin. Silas peered down at her. What do you want? she asked. From the platform, she wasn't too far from his vantage point, and her voice carried in the quiet night. Silas's expression was stiff. I need to collect on my magic. Ah, that had been the warning, hadn't it? The reason he'd given her not to use magic without his permission. What does that involve? she asked. Collecting on her magic? You know, Silas said. I was starting to think you did have two brain cells to rub together after you got dirt on the Voira, but perhaps they're as stupid as they look. Briar folded her arms as she sat down on the platform, dangling her feet over the edge. It creaked back and forth with the movement. When she said nothing, he raised an eyebrow. I'm a vampire. He said the words slowly, as if talking to a child. 
Briar swallowed, grip tightening around the rope at the implication of that. It's not like any of us know what fucked up creature you're bonded with, she said. Anyway, what was a shadow vampire? Briar thought he'd just got that title because no one knew what else to call him. So, you want me to come over there? He asked. Right. I'll come down. She glanced around, trying to decide on the least humiliating way to do it. She was capable, but not with so much elegance. Briar settled on dangling herself from the platform and dropping straight to the ground. She was picking herself up from the cracked mud and dusting herself off when he stepped up beside her. Oh, down here? she asked. Classy. You'd rather make it more public? Her mind flashed to the Voira, and now this damp, dark pit didn't seem quite private enough. Came to your room yesterday, but you seemed to be on a date. She caught the slight sneer in his tone. She had been in her room all yesterday evening, taking notes on the new books with Grayson. We're pretty up front, she said with a shrug. He knows I've got a parasite. The way Silas's eyes glinted was dangerous, and she knew she may regret provoking him. Grayson's attitude was rubbing off on her, though, and it was hard to shake. It wasn't until he stepped right up to her that the situation really hit her. She wanted to back up, hating how close he was. He tilted his head as if waiting for something. So, her voice was hoarse, how, how does this work? He shrugged. Haven't really done it like this before, he admitted. I think I'd prefer it if you turned around, though. Charming. But then she wasn't in disagreement. It felt wrong turning her back to him, but she did it. She was very aware of how sweaty she was. Well, he'd come to find her in the middle of training. She jumped as he brushed her neck, his other hand closing around her shoulder. She gritted her teeth and closed her eyes, knowing what was coming next. But his touch was distracting. Heat bloomed where they made contact, and a strange feeling rose in her chest. Something within him was broken, and she could fix it. She could feel it. Her fingers gripped his where they curled around her arm, though she hadn't even realized she'd lifted her hand. He'd stepped closer to her, his body pressed against her. His touch brushed her neck and along her jaw as she turned to him, that caress tugging on her magic again. She pressed her palm into his chest, and his gaze met hers, shadows and amber, calling her closer. Her eyes traced down to his lips. The Oz. She wanted to... Briar jerked away from Silas in shock, and at the sudden movement, he released her instantly. What kind of vamp bullshit did you just do? She took another step away for good measure. He hadn't even bitten her. He was staring at her in horror. I didn't do anything. This didn't happen last time, she spat. Her blood still felt hot, a part of her wanting to reach out for him, to feel his touch again. Theos above. I don't know if last time was a good data point given the whole knife-in-my-chest thing. Well, it is, if there was none of... of whatever just happened. Right, yeah. I'll let you stab me every week. Every week? Briar was ripped from her days, her voice high. Wait, you want to do this every week? I don't have a choice, Silas snarled. There is no way you're going to touch me with your fucking lust magic every goddamned week. My... my what? Silas looked completely stunned. It was from your end, as far as I'm concerned. In your dreams? Silas's expression darkened, and Briar saw that coiling hatred burning in his eyes again. Maybe we try again, but I'll shift properly. I don't think so. Shadows flickered around him, hands turning fully to claws, ears pointing, the same form he'd taken in class. Only the blackness seeped further up his arms and clawed its way onto his cheeks. I need the magic, 
It's not a joke. She scowled, quelling the fluttering of her heart as she felt his magic again. Well, I'm not turning around this time. Fine. There was something guttural in his voice. Her fists clenched as he touched her neck with one of those pointed black claws, tilting her chin to the side. He paused for a second, burning amber eyes watching her wearily. But there was no pull this time, no desire for his caress or for his lips. She jumped when he dug his teeth in and felt her magic drain away as he drank. With what had passed between them just now, as reluctant as it was, this time the bite didn't feel like such a violation. Finally, he let her go. She turned back to him as he wiped his sleeve along his mouth. Fucking disgusting. He had a bitter expression. Great. The world was spinning. Yeah, thanks. For all of this. Briar sat down, leaning against the wooden pole. He left a little in her pool, enough to heal herself tonight. Silas leaned on the balcony beside Axel, listening to the occasional shout and laughter of students out on the grounds beneath them. Candlelight spilled out of windows and colonnade arches onto pristine gardens, benches and stone pathways among flower beds. The chilly night was welcome, the familiar scent of Axel's cinder coil smoke hanging in the air. It work? Axel asked. Silas closed his eyes. Yep. Even with what she'd been using in class and the pits, there had been enough magic for the signy on his chest, which was good, because as much as denying her magic might be vindicatively satisfying, she actually needed to learn if they didn't want a demon to claw her to pieces in the trial. She was struggling enough as it was. Sent off for a few more books. Axel's frame was rigid as smoke plumed around him. Not much reading here on fucked-up magic bonds. Axel had major hang-ups with not being ahead of things, more than Silas did. But then Silas was almost never ahead of anything in life. Great, Silas replied absently, noting the three fresh coil stubs on the railing. A silence stretched, broken by a faint shriek of drunk students in the firelight of the gazebo below them. What about the weasel? Axel asked. Could tell her she can't use magic if she's seeing him. Silas let out a humorous huff. Won't work. Why not? He paused, coil almost to his lips as he eyed Silas. Because if I recall, we have exactly such a threat to blame for our own friendship. Okay. Axel laughed, turning to him. But she's not quite as stubborn as... He cut off, fingers running through his hair. Ah, fuck. He rubbed his forehead with his palm. Point taken. Silas wasn't used to being the voice of reason between him and Axel, but Grayson had proven an adequate weak point. We have to let it play out. Silence fell between them again, and Silas was left to brood in his own thoughts. His skin felt as if it were burned where her hand had pressed against his chest. It had been so fleeting, so meaningless, twisted up with whatever magic bond was forming between them. Yet, against a life he'd left, so long spent in isolated silence, that place where she'd touched him burned like a brand. Silas drew on his transformation, and the corrupted darkness consumed his skin with a prickle. As his form seeped across his body like an ink spill, it drowned out the ache of her hand on his chest. Chapter 6 Glint, one of the five instinct magics. Also known as second skin, glint acts as a barrier to physical attacks. It is characterized by a golden shimmer across the user's skin. Briar made her way down the balustrade toward classes one afternoon. It was the fifth week in school, and summer had arrived in full force, which meant even in the mountainous climate of eastern Ladrina,
cloaks weren't necessary most of the time. She was running late and in a hurry when she spotted something that stopped her in her tracks. Axel was leaning against one of the stone pillars, arms folded, talking to Grayson. Pryor noticed how tense Grayson was. He took a step as if to leave, but Axel grinned and said something. Grayson froze. Briar felt rage rise in her throat, and for a second, all rational fear she had of Axel evaporated. She strode over to the two of them. Axel straightened as he saw her, and Grayson was turning as she slipped her fingers through his, glancing between the two of them defiantly. Grayson was startled for a moment, but she felt his hand squeeze hers briefly. What are you doing? she demanded. She absolutely wouldn't have Grayson become Axel's next target because of her. Axel's eyes traced their locked hands before meeting her gaze, amused. Doesn't concern you, kitten. The hell it doesn't, she hissed. Axel stepped right up to her, peering down at her curiously. The scent of wood fires tangled in the surrounding air, and with that, all her terror crashed in. She held her ground as Axel glanced to Grayson. Grayson, he mused, and his knack for making idiots out of women. Watch your mouth. Grayson's voice was cold. It goes both ways, does it? Axel laughed. Acting all tough? But you forget, kitten. I know what you're like when you're alone. Better than he does, I'll bet. You might bully your way into my life, but you don't know me. It was an effort to keep her voice steady. Axel leaned in close, his voice low. I do know you've got this cluster of freckles on your left hip that looks like a Gavina signy. Briar froze. It felt like a stone had been dropped into her chest. Her thoughts were going haywire. Back off. Grayson's fingers tightened around hers. He'll stab you in the back, that one, Axel continued, as if Grayson didn't exist. Don't say I never warned you. He straightened then flicked the stub of his cinder coil right into Grayson's face before striding off. Pratt, Grayson was muttering. Briar could feel the warmth of his hand in hers, and she realized she was crushing his fingers. You all right? Briar nodded, not trusting her voice. Hey, hey. Grayson's touch was on her shoulder, tugging her toward him. Next thing she knew, he was pulling her into a hug, and she grabbed hold of him. You came over for me? He sounded surprised. Don't think I deserve that. It's only because of me he's on your back. Ha. Huh. Grayson gave her that impish grin. Axel hates me just fine without you. Come on, we're late already. He didn't let go of Briar as he led her to class, and she didn't give a fuck what people would think. She was just grateful to feel him next to her. It wasn't like her to feel so comfortable with someone so quickly, but she blamed it on her shaky few weeks. Maybe she'd underestimated her loneliness. That evening she skipped the pits, and Grayson turned up at her dorm with a basket of honey buns and some wine he'd nicked from the kitchen. It was the weekend tomorrow, after all. So... You're going to tell me the deal between you and Axel? She asked, as he threw himself down on the spare bed and picked up a honey bun. He grimaced. Trade me, then, he said. Can't go around giving my secrets away for free. Briar snorted. All right, how about this? One question at a time. If you don't want to answer, drink. A game Maddie had suggested to her once when they were sixteen. Grayson grinned. Yeah, all right. I'll go first, since you know my question. How do you know Axel? Part of the same program as me, wasn't he? Both were kids off the streets in Carrenford, sponsored so we could make a better life for ourselves. Grayson air-quoted the last few words. How does he know Silas, then? Lyran nobles come from western cities. Excellent question, Grayson shrugged. No idea. It's my turn. He 
he scratched his nose, wrinkling it thoughtfully. Briar considered how cute it looked before she caught herself. You just bloody met him, girl. Reel it in. It was Maddie's voice in her ear this time. Where do you come from? Bravisk, Briar replied. It was a city on the outskirts of Karenfort. She crossed her legs, picking up a bun. Family were servants for a well-off house, grew up on the grounds. She'd never traveled before the academy. Okay. She had her question ready again. Why did you choose to come to me that day in town? Grayson picked up the wine bottle for a second, staring at it. Then he set it down. I knew you were involved with Axel. I mean, I guess everyone thinks you're involved with Silas, but the two of them are inseparable. He met Briar's curious gaze and took a deep breath. I wanted to get to Axel. He shrugged, as if it was of no consequence. I thought from what I could see, you didn't like him much either. Spot on, Briar said. Well, she appreciated his honesty. Somehow it made her more relaxed, knowing his motivations had nothing to do with her. You know Axel would be here when you came? No, I'd have been trying a different academy if I did. He scowled. What are the chances you come to a place like this and know someone from the outside? Briar paused. There was one person she'd known from before. It was clear, though, from day one, that they wanted nothing to do with Briar, and Briar wanted to avoid them whenever possible. Grayson would make that much easier. All right, easy question, then, Grayson was saying. How old are you? Twenty, you? Briar asked. Twenty-one, he replied. Not a surprise. Applicants had to be between the ages of twenty and twenty-five. Okay, he pondered. What was your reason for coming to a place like this? Briar blew out a breath with a laugh, and then grabbed the bottle of wine, taking a drink. No way she was telling him the answer to that. Only place in the world someone's safe from a dawn noble. That's what she'd overheard back in Lord Oran's house once. The memory was too raw, too recent. What about you? she asked. Grayson took the wine from her and drank too, which got a laugh from her. Decided on a demon you're going to try and kill in the trial? she asked. They'd reviewed the six demons, but had only studied two so far in class. Tixens, for those who wanted fey forms, and Luperats, which made biomages into wolf shifters. Grayson contemplated. To be honest, I haven't given it much thought. Wouldn't mind a Luperat, those claws and teeth are something. But I'm not combat ready. We'll get there, Briar said. What about you? Grayson asked. Briar grabbed the wine and took a swig. If Grayson knew how likely it was that she'd be dead at the end of the trial in four months' time, he wouldn't want to get to know her more. Anxiety skittered in her chest, and she suddenly felt guilty for skipping the pits today. She lifted the wine and took another deep drink. Interesting, Grayson mused. Weird thing to not want to talk about, he pondered. You told me Axel took the lock on your door? Yeah. She eyed him, wondering where he was going with that. Ah, Grayson looked uncomfortable. He hasn't... Has he hurt you? A few scattered images tore through her mind. Axel waiting outside of the shower, slamming her into the wall. She thought about drinking again, but then the question hadn't sounded like part of the game, and Grayson looked deeply uneasy. Not badly. I'm not going to lie. I know he's a piece of work but I'd never have pegged him as the terrorizing women type. Briar snorted. I'm not the stabbing someone in the chest type either, but the three of us are trapped in a special kind of hell together. You stabbed Axel? Silas. No way. Briar raised her eyebrow. Spread that around school and he'll probably murder you in your sleep. 
There was a long pause between them, in which Grayson looked awed. What's between you and Silas? It wasn't even her turn, but Briar grabbed the bottle of wine and drank to drown out the memories. She'd been so close to death. She'd crawled toward him, as desperate as she had been oblivious to the monster he was. That taunt in his eyes, oh, it haunted her nightmares. Briar felt suddenly nauseous. No one could know about her relationship with Silas. It was, as he'd pointed out repeatedly when he came for her blood, dangerous. Do you miss anyone back home? She needed to change the subject. Grayson shook his head. No one to miss, not anymore. Neither me. No one? he asked. Not even, like, teachers or friends? My track record with friends is pitiful, she muttered. Teachers, too, come to mention it. What does that mean? Grayson asked. Briar picked up the wine bottle. I have a knack for accidentally burning things to the ground when it comes to people I care about. Fair warning. She indulged in another swig of wine. What you did to me, Briar, was unforgivable. How can you even get close to someone else? Briar chewed on her lip, trying to silence Maddie's voice as Grayson laughed, the sound void of humor. We're perfectly matched, it seems, he said. He'll hate you one day, as much as I do, Maddie taunted. Traitor, tramp, snitch. Briar took another bite of a honey bun, as if chewing aggressively would rid her of the tears that burned in her eyes. But the voices didn't stop. New place, same mistakes. You'll never change. You okay? Grayson asked. Yeah. But she took another long drink of wine. Last week in class, we discussed the most basic demons available in the trial, Luperats and Tixen. Straightforward for those who want to get out quickly. Next week we will discuss the two vampire forms, but this week, my personal favorite, because these two demons reveal character. Ozark sounded almost enthusiastic, which was rare for him. The two deal-forging demons in the trial, the Eladrin, a protector made of vine and crystals, and the Drockert, an onyx dragon, gold hoarder, and drawn to sacrifice, the Drockard form, also known as the Drake form, is the rarest claimed, except the Valmor. Now, while the Valmor is limited because there is only one in the entire trial, the Drockards are limited because they are the most difficult to call. With a flurry of motion, Ozark drew the sheet from two canvases behind him. On each, a demon was painted. Briar had to crane her neck to get a good look. Drockards were obscure as demons went, and she'd not learned about them in class when she was younger. It was a great lizard with black and red coloring, frighteningly thick claws and teeth, and, per the lines on the painting, stood twelve feet tall even crouched. It had a long neck and black spines along the red scales of its back. In the picture, it was breathing a plume of fire from its jaws. Beneath its feet were piles of golden coins. Do we get the gold too if we bond it? Someone asked. Ozark smiled. Quite so. A few people renewed their attention at that. When you bond a drawcard, you get a double-headed coin, with the power to forge one magical bond and break one magical bond. Do you get something when you bond the Eladrin? Venus Donovan asked. You do. These two are the only demons that offer something beyond their forms. Can anyone tell me what you might get if you bond an Eladrin? Briar even felt she might know the answer to that one. Eladrins were one of the more well-known demons. They appeared to people defending the vulnerable. They were generally considered benevolent. But the students here had drunk the Biomage potion and not yet bonded a demon. So even an Eladrin would attack. All demons would. It was why there was such a powerful protection spell around the school. Medora Rose was the one to answer. It gives a crystal which shows one truth and hides one truth. 
Briar could see her at the front of the class, slouched in her seat, Locke beside her, his arm draped around her shoulder. In fact, these days it was hard to catch one without the other, out on the grounds or in class. Correct, Ozark said. How do you think one might call an Eladron in the trial? Just protect someone? Another student replied. Briar's mind drifted a little. How did it work with the Voira group? Locke was the clear leader among them. Did he just get first pick? There was a faint, sour taste in Briar's mouth at the thought. She drew her attention back to Ozark. The Eladrin comes to those defending the vulnerable. So in the arena, you must be careful about how you treat your allies, or you'll find yourself facing off against this beast. He indicated the painting of the Eladrin. It depicted the great beast in a swamp. It had a similar shape to the drawcard, with its four thick legs, but it was made of brown bark and green vines. From it hung crystals that glowed all different colors. Its neck wasn't as snake-like as the drawcard's, instead more bullish. It had two horns on either side of its head, curled outward like twisting trunks, where more crystals and vines hung. Eladrins are why a lot of students prefer to take the trial alone. If it's not your goal form, you don't want to get caught up with one. He says that like we can just take our pick, Grayson muttered. The only monster I've seen so far I don't think I'll be eaten alive by is the Tixin. Briar was staring at the pictures, trying to imagine besting either of those beasts. Right, Ozark was saying. Now let's go into strengths and weaknesses. How do we defeat and bond these demons? Briar left the class feeling pretty shaky. The Tixin and Luperots had seemed bad enough last week. She wondered how many students wouldn't get through the trial. Chapter 7 What the fuck? It was his idea. Briar's rosy cheeks went redder as she pointed to Grayson who was on the spare bed in her dorm room. Silas felt anger rise in the pit of his stomach. His idea for what? Grayson, who clutched a pillow between his arms and stomach to keep himself steady, peered at Silas with unfocused eyes. His grin was lopsided. Wanted to know if you'd get drunk from her blood, obviously. You told him? He's good, Briar murmured. All he knows is that you come for my blood every week. Not all the other stuff, like... Silas leaped at her, clamping a hand over Briar's mouth. Hey, hey! Grayson sounded concerned. You shouldn't touch her like that. Theos above. Leave. Briar grabbed his arm, pulling away. I don't want him to leave. You want me to bite you in front of him? Silas asked, incredulous. Briar shrugged. I want you gone as... She hiccuped. As soon as possible. I'm not doing it with an audience. Fine. Briar stood, swaying slightly, tugging on his bicep as she picked her way over the mess of cloaks and other clothing on the floor to the bathroom. Oh, for fuck's sake, Silas hissed. This was bloody degrading. It's private. Briar said with a shrug. She stepped into the bathroom, watching him with drooping eyelids as she waited. You should leave the door open. Grayson's brows were drawn in concern. You and Axel are both such dicks. It's so, so inappropriate for you to come for her every week like this. He was being inappropriate? Did either of them have any idea how humiliating this was? Right, of course they did. It was exactly why they'd done it. The stubborn part of Silas got him to step into the bathroom and slam the door shut behind him. Let Grayson simmer with that. When he turned to Briar, she was leaning on the shower door frame, trying to drag all the pieces of her hair to one side of her neck. He didn't often see her with her hair out of its ponytail or bun. The mess of curls reached much further past her shoulders than he'd thought. Silas watched her struggle for a few seconds, 
her fingers catching on curls and tugging them back and forth, over and over, lending her no progress. Okay. He was trying not to get angry at her. He was so pissed off, but he knew not to lose his temper with a drunk. It just wasn't fair. Can I get this over with? She stared at him quizzically, something weary in her eyes. She nodded. Just do your thing, you know? Silas stepped up to her, not looking forward to what this was going to be like. He tried to be gentle as he pulled her hair over her shoulder. It was hard to ignore how the now familiar scent of mint haunted his dreams. He tugged her to the wall. Sometimes she was unsteady after a bite, and it would be worse tonight. Whoa, just like Axel. Her voice was slurring. Guess I have clothes on this time, though. Silas paused, feeling uncomfortable. And you know, she added, I didn't want to kiss him. You don't want to kiss me either. For the love of Theos, don't start saying things like that. Not true, she replied. I always want to kiss you when you drink my blood. Is it? Do you not want to kiss me? No. It was a fucking lie. Completely the bond, of course, but he certainly had thoughts when he was drinking her blood. And after. And almost every goddamn night. Well, she looked defeated. Bit unfair then, isn't it? She asked, as she tilted her head to the side, exposing her neck to him. He tried, tried, to be gentle with her as he sunk his fangs into her neck. Even when her alcohol-ridden blood was like poison, and this time he had no urge to kiss her at all, he warred with how degrading it was. Other types of vampires were revered, and he got their status by title. But he was nothing more than a rat, bound to whatever scraps, poisoned or otherwise, he could get his hands on. He would always be limited in this world by what would save him from becoming... Silas squeezed his eyes shut, drawing away from her. He'd had enough. The howling shadows would stay at bay for another week, even if her drunken blood was like a screaming banshee in his veins. He wiped his mouth on his sleeve. What? Briar's voice was quiet, her eyes wide. Something changed in the way she was looking at him. What do you become? Silas stared at her horror twisting within him. She'd... she'd heard his thoughts when he was drinking her blood? Was that pity in her eyes? He took a step away. Screw this goddamned bond. Hey. She reached out to him. I didn't... you never said. Silas's temper finally cracked. He closed the distance between them, gripping her shoulders. You don't... Get that part of me, he hissed. You've taken enough without stealing that too. He let her go just as quick when he saw the fear in her eyes. When Silas stormed out, he almost crashed into Grayson, who was leaning against the dresser next to the bathroom door. Silas fought the urge to deck the man and his stupid, suspicious expression. He froze when Grayson's hand caught his shoulder. Silas spun knowing shadows were clawing across his face. Grayson didn't look the slightest bit afraid, though. He's a fool, remember? Silas had to remind himself. It's not going to last forever, Grayson told him. I'll find a way to free her of your foul little claws. Silas grimaced. Well, aren't you just a real hero? Briar stepped from her shower late the next evening her eyes darting around the room habitually as she tugged off the wrap she'd used to keep her hair dry. She froze as she saw something on the bathroom counter that hadn't been there before. The piece of metal shone in the firelight, a beacon of a threat, the lock from her dorm. Adrenaline shot through her system as she fumbled for the towel she kept on the floor next to the shower door. Axel had been here, in here. Again. She bit back tears as she wrapped the towel around herself. 
The wooden door was shut, though. He'd come and left? She'd expected something to happen after last night, but she hadn't realized how unprepared for it she was until this second. Her mind and body were sluggish today with a hangover. Silas must have come for her last night. There'd been bite marks on her neck in the morning that she'd hastily healed, but she didn't remember a damn thing about it. She could smell the burned wood coil scent in the air. Her fingers shook as she tugged her patchwork cloak around herself tightly. It was hard to reconcile that if Axel was in her room, their plan had worked. Why would you want this, you stupid idiot? She thought. Regret was one hell of an emotion. Better than doing nothing. She poked the bathroom door open slowly. The metal bolt clutched in her fist as she peered around the room. No one was there. She stepped out cautiously, realizing the double balcony doors were open. A few more steps, and she saw his hulking figure, back against the railing, the slight red glow of the coil visible in the darkness. Briar's eyes darted between him and the dorm door to her left. Could she make a run for it? Axel grinned, teeth holding his cinder coil in place as he crossed his arms. Your choice, kitten, he said. But if it were me, I'd take the olive branch. Briar stared at him for a long time, something bitter in her throat. Axel turned around, leaning on the railing and facing the grounds. Did that mean he wouldn't even try to chase her if she ran? Somehow that seemed worse. She imagined herself trying to sleep tonight or tomorrow or the next until he came again. Briar wet her lips, nerves grating, as she stepped up to the balcony door. She leaned against the frame, hugging herself. Olive branch? she asked. That's what you call not waiting in my bathroom for me to get out of the shower? She tried to keep her voice steady. He said nothing. Smoke billowed around him, silver light of the moon illuminating it. She waited, anxiously tapping her elbow. But he remained silent. What was he waiting for? She had a hunch. Briar slowly stepped up to the railing, acutely aware of how small she felt beside him. She glanced up quickly to see the ghost of a smile flicker on his lips. He turned, resting his hip on the balcony as he regarded her. What do you want? She hated how her heart rate took flight. You had a good night last night, Axel murmured. Briar said nothing, not able to meet his eyes. She'd been tense all day, waiting for the repercussions. Since you're being such a good girl tonight, he continued, how about this? If you can give me a laugh, too, I'll let you off easy. What does that mean? she asked. That bravado you get when you're around Grayson. It's pretty cute, especially when you act like this if I catch you alone. He snorted, a plume of cinder smoke coming from his nose. Since you owe Silas an apology, I think I'd get a kick out of watching you say it in front of Grayson. This is a game to you then? Hatred twisted her up as she stared at him. Axel leaned down close, and she fought not to take a step away. No. See, that's the thing, kitten. None of this was a game, until you made it one. His voice was dangerous. If you want me to get serious, I'd be happy to oblige. It had been reckless, getting drunk last night. But she hadn't done it because she thought it would be funny. Silas was coming for her every week, and she had no understanding of him, no weapon in her arsenal for leverage if she needed she lived beneath him, at his whim. She had no control. She fought the urge to scream that at Axel. But he really was playing with her today. He knew why she'd done it, just as she'd known there'd be blowback. 
and to be honest, this blowback was actually manageable. I'll do it. Her voice was strained as she tried not to think about what that would look like right now. She was sure she'd be up all night imagining Grayson's face. Axel straightened, sneering, as he plucked the almost finished coil from his mouth. Tomorrow, Axel said, and don't tell him. She nodded. Before she could duck away, he ruffled her hair. The motion was enough to nudge her whole body forward. Good girl. He grinned at the flare of anger that lit her eyes. Then he strode from the room, taking the last puff of his coil and flicking it onto her desk. She glared at the door as it slammed, her fingers running through her tangled hair. While she really had been too drunk last night to remember Silas's visit, there was a takeaway from it all. It had pissed the two of them off enough to merit a visit from Axel. So that meant something, right? Okay. Briar paused beside where Axel and Silas sat. It was the start of Demon Studies class, and she thought it better to get this over with. So about this week. Silas raised an eyebrow as Grayson stopped at her side, clearly confused. Do you even remember any of it? Silas asked. No. Ah, good. Silas definitely looked relieved. What does that mean, mate? Grayson asked, and Briar didn't think she'd ever heard him sound so unnerved. She's sweeter on me than I thought, Silas said. Briar wrinkled her nose. Well, if that's not creepy as hell. Yes, the whole thing wasn't my idea, Silas glanced between them. And I never said I was sweet on you back. Sorry, little vixen. Go fuck yourself, Briar muttered. Then she caught Axel's expression, and her blood went cold. But, she gritted her teeth. I'm sorry. Won't happen again. Shit. She doubted that would be good enough for them. But Axel actually laughed. She refused to meet Grayson's surprised gaze. Wow. Silas was nodding. Really heartfelt. Briar was stalking away before he'd even finished his sentence, tugging Grayson along with her. What was that? Grayson asked her as they sat down. Keeping Axel happy, that's all. He asked you to do that? Sure did. When? Yesterday. I was with you all yesterday until the pits. Yeah, it was... She trailed off. Suddenly it was very important that she organized her quill and notebook perfectly on her binder. He came into your room? Grayson asked in a low hiss. Again? It wasn't a big deal this time. Why was she defending him? How is that not a big deal? Well, we did kind of screw about with Silas. Do you hear yourself right now? Okay. She looked up at him finally reaching out and squeezing his arm. This is it. This is the deal. I don't like it, but I live with it. If you can't, then leave. Don't you get it, though? Grayson asked. They're playing you. You have what they need. They have to pretend to have the power here because they don't. Briar paused, her eyes narrowing. What does that mean? You've got to get them to come to you on an even field. If they won't respect what you have, make them. How? Take it away. Chapter 8 Briar spun the wooden ring on the cord around her neck as she hurried down spiral stairs. One day, years ago, she had sat by the fireplace late into the night, as she waited for her father to return from work. When he'd come home at last, he had clasped her hands and said, It's worth it for you, Blossom. You're going to write your own story. I won't have others telling it for you. Cold night air brushed her skin as she hurried onto a pathway to the gardens. Slung over her shoulder was a satchel full of leftovers from dinner, 
and her thick patchwork cloak was hugging her tightly. For ten years, her father had saved every penny he could for her. And in ten seconds he'd died, and that dream along with him. Today, she'd have been in the school he'd dreamed of, but for the games of nobles. Nobles just like the one who'd be coming for her tonight. Something had to give. Sorry, Father. She found a secluded spot tucked behind bushes in the far gardens. The Duskwall Academy? Not quite your dream school, but still I'll be damned if I let Silas write my story. So tonight she'd taken Grayson's suggestion literally. Time to see how the vamp fucker did without his regular supply. There was no way for her to stop Silas. She couldn't fight him. His magic was stronger than all the other students in their term put together. But he couldn't have her blood if he couldn't find her. Briar settled into the grass, atmospheric magic swirling about her like a merry fire. Among the peaceful sounds of rustling leaves, she tugged a book from her satchel. Bestiary, Rogue Demons, Volume 3. She cracked it to her bookmark, finding enough light under the full moon to read. There was static in the air tonight. Since Silas had got mixed up with magic and demons, he could feel the full moon even when he couldn't see it. Tonight was a night when things went wrong, as if destiny was toying with them. As long as it didn't choose him, he didn't care. He walked up to her door and paused stealing himself before he rapped. When there was no response, he rapped again. Was she ignoring him deliberately? Something she'd do to piss him off, he didn't doubt. His jaw clenched. He'd come to this academy to escape chains like this. There was silence from within. Had she got so drunk she'd passed out? He opened the door a crack and listened. Nothing. He furrowed his brow. There were no sounds of activity, no scratching of a pen or the rustling of clothes. He entered, searching the empty bed and desk. Perhaps in the bathroom? He listened but heard only the faint drip, drip, drip of her shower. He peered in just in case. No one was inside. Now his eyes searched desperately. She could be out, maybe with Grayson? but then he saw the folded piece of parchment on her pillow. He grabbed it and peeled it open. The words within made his blood run cold. See you in two days, prick. Yours truly, just a kitten. Fuck. It was like every inch of his body was suddenly alight, the monster surfacing as it sensed his desperation. No, no, no! He cupped his neck, trying to shove it down. His eyes darted about the room as if she might appear. Two days? No way he'd last that long. He reached the door, about to turn the handle, when he realized his hands had shifted to black claws, the darkness bleeding up his arms like the corruption it was. Silas took the hallways at a sprint, panic constricting his throat. When he reached his room, he threw himself inside, leaning on the door and sagging. What's going on? Axel was up in a second. What did she do? Silas couldn't answer. He opened his palm where he'd crushed the note. Axel read it, his eyes going dark. I can't. Silas was shaking. I can't wait two days. The knowledge that he'd have to wait, it was cracking him now, baiting the creature to the surface as it sensed weakness. We'll find her. I need you to go to Grayson's room. Silas's voice was a rasp. He might know where she... I can't leave you. You have to. There was no reason for Axel to stay. He'd chained him to the pillar in his room once. It hadn't made a damned bit of difference. Axel measured him, his eyes fearful. I'll be quick. When Axel left, Silas slid to the floor, claws digging into his scalp. The monster's screech rose within. 
its energy clawing into the very static of the air in this godforsaken academy. The whispers of others began slipping through his defenses. I should never have come here. Why didn't I listen to Mum? This academy, full of desperate souls, was a ripe feeding ground. He pressed his palm into his upper chest to try and drive the demon away, feeling the healing signy scarred into his flesh. It flickered with warmth. Peace swelled for a glorious moment before sputtering out. He moaned. He didn't have enough magic now that she'd taken half of it. I'll be dead at the trial, torn to pieces. I can't die like that. Silas tried to drown the first of the voices. Kotai vai atlan ivor. His trembling voice whispered that stupid vioka rhyme that sweet, sweet Kira had translated for him once, so long ago. Aloavax ore mar menor. But Kira was a ghost for the failure of that very rhyme. He shuddered, shoving the images of her from his mind as he clutched the signy once more, hoping the shitty translation would somehow fuel it. Black hair beside ashen skin, crimson blood crept into tangled blades of tall grass. Another voice crept in, smothering those flashing images. I'm supposed to protect him, and he's so small and sick and alone. What if this was a trick, and I came for nothing? He pressed the signy again desperately trying to light it. This was all happening too fast. The voices were rising like a tide. She warned me. That one voice rose above the rest. Told me she'd get rid of Dad. Silas clawed at his face, trying to ignore the howling in his head. Why didn't I listen to her? Why did I come here? He could see the glow of his own amber irises against the onyx skin of his hands. And as he watched, the orange glow changed to a deep purple. That static in the air he'd sensed, it had been for him. Briar curled up in the grass, using her satchel as a pillow, hoping to get some rest. Sleep, though, was getting harder to come by these days. Briar was in the woods, and invisible walls of magic made up a massive arena. Demons were manifesting around her, as her classmates jumped into fights they'd been trained for. The aim was clear. Conquer the monster and claim its form. In her dreams, Briar couldn't move, not even to reach for her dagger. Every night, one of the six monsters came for her. Every night, she woke to the terror of the snarling teeth of a Luperot, the flames of a Drockard, the strangling vines of an Eladrin. Briar forced her eyes closed, practicing the meditation that Professor Naveen insisted was crucial come their time at the breach. Eventually, the meditation worked, and her dreams took her. Silas's essence was made of brittle, charred branches that were crumbling into the abyss that was his demon. He was the one in the cage now. His demon had shifted into their beta form, and Silas could see everything it did. Shadows enveloped him, dancing like flames, and not leaving an inch of his flesh visible. Purple static burst into life here and there, sparks of lightning fighting for life before being swallowed up again into roiling clouds of black. They stood on the top of the tallest tower in the academy, a barely corporeal figure of shadows and violet static. One of the students, Morin Lance, was at their feet, Morin was crouched on the edge of the tiled roof, his hands desperately clutching the ridges as he stared over the edge. The only sound in the air was Morin's pitiful sobs and the rustling of nestling birds in the dovecote behind them. Silas threw himself against his cage with all his might. He couldn't watch this again, but he was nothing before his demon, not when it was like this. His body, a void of blackness, sat down on the tiles beside Morin. Accept you'll never be enough. The guttural rasp came from his own mouth, words from his demon. Morin Lance's pale, freckled cheeks were wet with tears. What's the point? 
his demon asked. Another week of torture, behind everyone in training. It let out a hollow laugh. To be torn to pieces in the trial. Morin was shaking. To Silas, he was just a frightened little boy. Their power had him by the neck, though, urging him on. It was coercion, but not like anything in the textbooks. Morin had no more control over what happened next than Silas did. His demon was taking its time. It could speak the command, would speak the command, but it wanted to feed on every second it could before it did. You are nothing, Morin. Never enough to protect your mother. Who are you? And you thought you could face demons. Would it not be better to end it now? On your own terms? And what a sick, twisted slant that was. A taunt and nothing else. Morin shifted, his breath catching as he looked over the edge of the tiles. Suddenly their power stuttered his demon's grip on the young, tormented man weakening. Silas knew what that meant. Shit. It shouldn't be possible. Not within the protection spell. But Silas could feel the protection spell as if it were a living thing, and it was splintering. A hole was being clawed open as something came through, desperate to stand against their corrupted power. As the hole became large enough, another creature of shadows manifested just as tall as them. It was a hooded figure of black wisps, with its wings outstretched into the night as it shrouded Morin, protecting him from Silas. A Theos Vic, a god of death, the demon that came to those about to kill themselves, to whisper in their ear and convince them to live. Theos Vic always came for Silas when his monster emerged. They opposed him hated him. Despite the protection spell, what Silas was doing to Morin Lance was enough to drag it through, just to match his power. Morin, the Theosvik whispered. Your mother loves you. She waits for you at home. Silas felt his creature snarling, venomous at the interruption. Better to die, his demon taunted. Stop burdening your mother with hope. Keep going, Morin. You survived the potion. You can survive the trial. This Vic was trying so hard. Silas wanted to close his eyes, to look away. What will it be like? His demon asked cruelly. To die by the teeth of a looperot. It won't kill you quickly. They never do. I... Morin's voice was weak and trembling. I don't want to die like that. I'm so afraid, all the time. You can survive the trial, Morin. The Vic swept in closer, its shadows holding him in an embrace. It was too late, though. Silas felt coercion magic in his demon's voice when it spoke next. End your fear, Morin. He knew what would happen because even though a Vic came to oppose him every time, it never won. Silas's demon was too strong. There was one silent moment, and then Morin's shaking body betrayed him. He hauled himself right to the edge of the tower, then wailed, reaching desperately toward the Theos Vic as if he could take its hand and be saved. No. Silas wept. The Theosvik was not corporeal, and Morin's fingers closed around smoke before he tumbled off the side of the tower. The last thing Silas saw was his eyes, wide with terror. The Theosvik plunged after him, its shadows holding Morin until the very end. Silas tried to retreat. He tried to close his eyes and ears as Morin's final shout faded. But he never escaped this part, though. And when the sickening crunch came, it was a jarring knife to the chest. At the Duskwall Academy, the students had to kill their demons to claim power. It was a soulless bond. Silas, though, 
was something much worse. He was a living biomage. He was chained to a creature that was still alive. Chapter 9 You chose life, a strange voice whispered into Briar's dreams, amidst so much death. A different scene seeped into her nightmare. Trees and demons warped and changed into a real, tangible memory. In it, she was being ushered down spiral steps to a broad room filled with rows and rows of chairs. Around her, white walls glowed with pale light. It was the strangest room she'd ever stepped into, and she was sure it was full of magic. This was the first day she'd entered the academy the day of initiation. There were two men on the seats beside her. They'd taken off their cloaks and she couldn't help side-eyeing them, noting distinct extravagance. Given Briar was in muddy rags, their clean, well-cut outfits seemed out of place. The one further from her looked frighteningly familiar. He had dark hair, hooded eyes, and high cheekbones. No. She was being stupid, there was no way a noble was at this academy. But still, there was something about the two that filled her with anxiety she couldn't shake. Eventually, when that anxiety didn't fade, she slipped away and found the furthest seat in the opposite corner of the large room. The chamber slowly filled with nervous men and women. Some came in pairs, but most were alone. Wretches, most of us, she thought those the world had forgotten. At last, the final chair was taken beside her. The room was quiet. The occasional rising whisper or rustle of parchment were the only sounds. The strange, ethereal glow from the walls pulsed slowly, and she stared at it while she waited, captivated. She jumped as someone tapped her on the shoulder. It was the man who'd been sitting next to her before, the same one she'd seen light the coil at the gates outside. He had a hulking figure and messy dark red hair, which he was running his hand through as he glanced about. What? Briar asked. Wait, weren't you? But he cut off, shrugging. Whatever. Trade me spots? Excuse me? Come on. He rummaged in his pocket and flicked something at her. She caught the glinting thing and looked down at a gold coin. Well, that was ridiculous. Why? she asked with narrowed eyes. But actually, it wouldn't hurt to start here with something. Not that I plan on dying today, the man grunted. But if I do, I'd like to be as far from him as possible. He nodded toward the other side of the hall. She stood. Her nervousness about that other noble-looking man had been irrational anyway, and the coin would be helpful. The red-haired man sat down, but before she left, she turned back, fiddling with the coin in her fingers. This is a lot. Yeah, well, no offense, but you look like you're going to die. Probably get it back anyway. Right, great. She didn't have the stomach to challenge the glint of humor in his eyes so she just made her way back across the hall. When she sat, the noble-looking man turned to her. That's not your seat. Briar didn't meet his eyes. He wanted to trade. He paused. Prick. He stood, eyes darting around the hall, but the glowing light from the walls dimmed dramatically. She heard his curse to her left before he sat again. A tall, spidery woman with silver hair stepped into the hall atop the few broad steps ahead. The initiation has begun, she announced to the room. Drink and seal the contract you signed when you arrived. You will be bound until your service is up. Everyone is to try to remain in their seats. After twenty minutes, those who are able shall exit through these doors. She waved at the doors behind her. Make your way up to the dining hall for the mandatory initiation ceremony. She waved forward several helpers, 
who hurried in with baskets full of little bottles. Each was full of a black liquid, and everyone was given one. Briar's grip was weak when she took hers, staring at the glimmering dark liquid. Was this what her death looked like? Death, perhaps, but it was the only chance someone like her would ever see to become a mage. She closed her eyes, let Theos decide. She downed the vial instantly, but she was one of the first. Glancing around, she saw many of the others clutching their vials with wide eyes. The dark-haired man at her side shot her a curious glance before taking his. Around her, a few people began sobbing, and others stood and took their chance to flee the chamber. The initiation was weeding out the weak already, and she wasn't among them. A spark of hope lit in her chest. This was the first evidence she had seen that she was truly worthy of what she wished to become. Except then the poison set in, and she felt more stupid than brave. The first thing Silas sensed when he regained control of his body was the crack in the protection spell. He'd anchored a Theosvik, and that action had created a hole. There was another problem, though. Something else was manifesting through the hole, too. He could feel its power calling in his mind, and a memory determinedly tugged at him, dragging him into a vision. Silas had sat, tense upon the stone chair in the chamber under the academy, the first day he'd arrived. A ragged woman was in Axel's chair. The pricket left him, just stood and said, Gotta find somewhere to piss. He'd never returned. And that might be the last fucking thing he'd see of Axel? He clutched the bottle of black poison in a trembling fist. He was the only person in the chamber it wouldn't affect. He'd had this potion before. He tried not to let panic drown him as he glanced around. His eyes snagged on the woman at his side. She was pulling the cork from the bottle, her eyes resolute. Around them, Others were staring at the poison with pale faces. Some left. She caught his eyes for the briefest flicker as she lifted the potion to her lips. And then she drank without even the slightest hesitation. Silas couldn't help but think it was exactly what Axel would have done. You're going to die. The deep voice was only faintly audible through Briar's agony. She writhed on the cold stone from the potion she'd taken. Her eyes sought the source of the voice until it found the dark-haired man. His imposing figure was relaxed on the chair next to hers, a short distance away, and although he'd taken the same potion, he was untouched. What had he said? She couldn't think straight. Survive twenty minutes and become reborn, they'd been told. She just had to hold on. Briar didn't know how much time had passed. At some point, she'd slipped from her chair, and now she was curled up on the ground. Echoes of her own pain sounded from others around her. The air of this strange room, made of porous stone that pulsed with a dull white glow, was rent with the sounds of its challengers. How many others were going to die like her? Other desperate fools with nothing left. She closed her eyes, screaming as another wave of pain ripped through her. Everything in the world vanished for one moment, two moments, three. She could feel the poison within her, seeping through her flesh and her organs, warring its way into her heart. The potion was going to win. She was going to die. I can save you. His voice was calm against the screeching pain and fading world. Her whole body shuddered as she gasped for air. She tried to bring him into focus again. He hadn't moved. Come to me and live. But she couldn't. Why doesn't he come to me? Was he perhaps suffering too? She lifted a trembling arm and dragged herself onto her front. She wouldn't become a number. One in two, dead. Just another failed applicant to the Duskwall Academy. She had to be more. One 
agonizing movement at a time, Briar dragged herself toward the man seated on the chair. It was a slow journey, and she wasn't sure if it took seconds or minutes. All she could feel for sure was the poison creeping toward her heart. Tears swam in her vision, but so did a set of lavish leather boots. She reached out, fumbling at his leg. Then the world spun, and she trembled as if she felt a spike of the poison in her heart. It was too late. Another pain intruded, muffled comparatively. It was as if her scalp were about to free itself from her head. Something grabbed her by the hair and dragged her up until she was looking into hooded, amber eyes. She blinked, trying to steady herself, but deep, ragged breaths racked her whole body. He let go of her, and she clutched his knee for support. Better, he said. Warning bells rang in her head. Briar took him in fully now. His broad shoulders slouched forward, resting a forearm on his knee as he peered at her curiously. He had a pale, chiseled jaw shadowed with stubble and long black hair tied in a loose bun with strands of it floating about his face. High cheekbones intense eyes, frightening beauty. A noble, she was sure of it, even if that made no sense at all in this damned place at the edge of the world. Her father echoed that warning. You've seen this before, Blossom. Run. But she had run. Four months, she'd run from her monsters. This was where it led her. This was her last hope. He was tugging off his left glove, and there was an obscene number of rings adorning his hand. He drew a small silver knife and carved a cut along one of his fingers. Blood began oozing from it. Drink and live. Through the pain and shock, she felt her stomach turn at the idea. But she shook as another spike of poison pierced her heart. Her watering eyes found the blood desperately. She must have leaned toward it because he moved his hand away. She looked up at him, confused. The fingers of his other hand curled around her chin as a smile edged across his face. His thumb pressed roughly against her lips. The tone shifted like a jarring punch to the gut. Briar tried to pull away, fear and pride screaming louder than ever the threat to her life. Louder still, with the images of her father, laying on the floor surrounded in rose petals, his life and his pride stolen from him. But the amber-eyed man drew Briar closer, the victor against her waning strength. Remember to whom you owe your life, he'd said. And then he pushed the finger toward her, his blood now dripping onto the white stone below. It called to her, the momentary burst of pride waning, waning, waning at the offer of her instant survival. He's a noble, she was sure. No one else had arrogance like this. A monster. But he's not your monster. She stared at the blood for so long that another tremor shook her. She must be seconds from death. He let out a breath of amusement. She couldn't help but look back into his eyes. Around them, groans and shrieks of the dying rose like a threat. Why? she asked. The price of such things could be worse than death. His pointed canines glinted as he grinned, as if delighted by her hesitation. He shrugged. To see how good it feels? Of course it was a game for him. And where nobles played games, lowborns fell like used-up toys. They will always have everything, and she would always have nothing. She gritted her teeth. Each second that passed could be her last. Die right now, Blossom, and you'll never prove them wrong. She closed her eyes and moved forward, hating herself, hating him more. Her lips brushed against his finger, hesitant at first. Is that enough? he asked. That fragile thing inside Briar cracked in two as her lips closed around his finger. But when her tongue brushed against the liquid, life rushed through her like an ocean tide. She 
She hadn't known it at the time, but the moment she'd chosen life over death, chosen to take his blood, was the moment their magic became bound. Chapter 10 Atmospheric Magic One of the Five Instinct Magics The Altering of Homeostatic Functions Common uses include adjusting temperature, pulse, vessel pressurization, or oxygenation and blood thickness. Briar awoke with a start, pulling herself up. The forest around her was bright, too bright. She blinked, adjusting to the light. It was unnatural. As she drew herself to her feet and the world came into view, she caught sight of the creature before her. Her breath caught. It was beautiful, and not a demon of cautionary tales. It was made of solid light and shaped like a fox. It had long, delicate legs, standing taller than her. Most notable, though, were the broad antlers on its head. A Theos Atlan, the healing god. She'd never seen a demon like it in real life before. Theos demons were of the rarest, and this was a symbiote. It should only manifest when it heard its calling, the plea of someone willing to give anything to save another. How? How are you here? Briar's eyes darted around the trees, but they were still within the protection spell. The fox tilted its head as it regarded her. It was getting brighter with each second that passed. It took a step forward, dipping its nose toward her, inches away, and Briar reached out, wondering if she'd be able to feel it. In that moment, it flickered and vanished. Briar was plunged into the dark of the night. She dropped her hand, pulse pounding, a thousand confused thoughts all crowding in her mind. Had it been real, or, or had she imagined it? It was impossible for a demon to have manifested anywhere on school grounds or the town. It was too cold, she realized. She drew her cloak around herself tightly, reaching for her atmospheric magic when she heard the loud cracking of a branch above her. Briar looked up, and her heart nearly bottomed out of her chest as she saw a creature clinging to the branch above. It morphed as she watched, dipping into the moonlight, a face made of nightmares. The creature was bluish, and its peeling skin was taut over the warped face of a woman. Its mouth twisted in a maniacal smile, and thin strands of white hair fell from sporadic patches across a scabbed head. Its body was vile, skin stretched over knobbly bones and limbs, none of which stuck quite in the right direction. And even in the dark, Briar could see it grip the branches above with claws instead of hands. Briar stepped away on instinct, her mouth open in a silent scream, panic wiping her mind blank. The bracken, for there was no mistaking this creature, moved in jerky, twitching movements, its claws crunching wood as it skittered down the trunk of the tree. Briar's hand was on her dagger as she stumbled back, but the demon didn't pounce. Instead, its limbs unfolded with too many joints as it towered over her, ten feet at least, and made of nothing but scabbed, scratched blue skin and bones and oversized claws hanging at its side. The fool. Its mouth barely moved as it spoke through a toothy smile, its voice a high creak and barely comprehensible. You got on your knees for those you seek to kill, those who stripped your father of his life, of his pride. Right, that's what drew it. Cowards who'd traded their integrity away. Its eyes were beady pupils that were fixed on her. Briar's grip on her dagger was trembling, and a panicked sob escaped her lips. The second she moved, it would be on her. Her brain wasn't working properly. Everything she'd done to get here, 
only to die to this slice of hell? It was supposed to, to do something. To offer her a trade, right? But it wouldn't. The potion she'd taken on initiation made sure of that. Unless she was bonded to a demon, they'd all attack. It had been staring at her for too long. Briar launched herself into a sprint, and it pounced. She pulled a veil of stealth over herself, the strongest she could muster. But did it even see with normal eyes? Somehow she'd made it into a run without claws sinking into her flesh. She heard it behind her, a snarl sounding in the quiet night, heavy feet tearing up grass. She knew she had to fight it, or she was dead either way. She was almost at the arch that led to the courtyard. She threw herself at the stone pillar, using it to veer around the corner to the wall. She turned with her dagger out. The bracken ran on all fours, with its claws scraping along the stone tiles, ripping them up as it skidded sideways to turn on her. Briar tried to see a weakness, perhaps the chest, but demons died in different ways, and if she was wrong, it prowled closer, standing on its hind legs, arms and claws splayed. Her knife seemed pathetically small in her grip, but she didn't run this time. Kill it or die. It let out a high-pitched scream and leaped for her, and Briar lost all sense of what she was supposed to do. Grimy, yellowing, bared teeth and ragged claws were all she saw. Then blackness exploded into her vision. She was thrown sideways, her shoulder smashing into the stone wall before she crumpled to the ground. When she looked up, the bracken was obscured by a tall figure of shadows. Another demon? Dark claws sunk into light blue flesh as the bracken screamed. As she watched, the skin of the bracken turned to dust as if burned. It lashed out desperately, trying to sink its teeth in anywhere. But the creature of shadows ripped the bracken's head from its shoulders, and its pale blue body dissolved into smoke and dust. Briar didn't have time for relief at its demise. Instead, she scrambled away as the dark figure spun on her, and for a flash, it was worse than the bracken. A pit of hopelessness opened up within her. This thing, whatever it was, would be the end of her. It was an indisputable truth. End it before it can get you. That demand was like a fist closing tight around her brain, not letting go. The dagger still shook in her grip as the creature made for her, but Briar couldn't move. Then it changed, violet eyes fading for amber, the shadows dispersing for Silas's form. What? He was... But he moved to her side too quickly and was dragging her to her feet. The dagger tumbled from her shaking grip, his face was a mask of rage and terror as he shoved her against the stone wall of the gardens. Did you touch it? What? Briar's mind hadn't caught up. Her body might as well have been petrified. She couldn't think straight with his hands on her shoulders, the same hands that had just been claws of shadows, shadows and whispers pushing her toward, Did you touch it? N no. Are you sure? Yes. Why? Why was that what he was angry about? She'd... God, she'd hid from him. He let go of her, running his fingers through his hair, his eyes wide. You were trying to fight it, he hissed. I saw you. If you'd killed it, you'd have bonded it. Was he insane? I was more concerned about not getting torn to pieces. Her voice was high-pitched. How was it here? His expression still warred between terror and rage. Before she could react, he'd seized her by the shoulders again. Why? His voice was just a breath. He closed his eyes as if trying to restrain himself. Why did you do this? His grip trembled. Briar shrunk against the wall, seeing the monster that had just been lurking. She stared up at him, afraid to say anything. She could feel his magic through the bond and it was wrong, poisoned and twisted. Was this what happened to him without her? Just, just take the blood, she whispered. Silas's eyes widened, and he made a sound in his throat. Briar thought it was a laugh, but he let go of her, turning away. Fuck. 
His voice was low. He dragged his sleeve across his eyes roughly. Briar didn't move. He could still take her blood if that was the issue. Was he this upset that she'd tried to fight the Bracken? I don't... I don't understand. He glanced at her, and there was hatred in his expression. It was the same look that made her feel like he was a stupid, small child. Why don't you explain? She hated it. He rounded on her, his jaw clenched, his face twisted with disdain, though he didn't touch her this time. I can't. He rubbed his forehead aggressively. I just... I need the blood. Everything was off balance right now. The terror at the bracken of seeing his form. So she just nodded. He didn't wait, gripping the base of her neck, thumb against her chin to tilt it up, and the other hand painfully digging into her waist as he pressed against her. Usually, he tried hard to avoid as much physical contact as possible. But right now, she was crushed between him and the wall. She jumped when he sunk his fangs in, but swallowed her protest. She wanted this night to be over. He drank for longer than usual. She blinked away tears, her gaze stuck on the cracked stone tiles and scattered soil. He was shaking. She didn't know why that off-balanced her more than anything else. Perhaps because she'd just seen what he was. A demon with power she'd never felt before. And what she'd done, it made him tremble to the bone. She'd fucked up. She didn't know why. He wouldn't tell her. But she could feel it. Feel it with every drop he took, fueling more than energy for him. It fixed something. Warded away something so very wrong within him. Enough! Her magic was gone, completely, and he hadn't stopped. She grabbed his arm, trying to shove him off her. He drew back without a flicker of remorse. She stepped by him, happy to return to her dorm and get some sleep. But her world spun. She saw him reach to steady her and ducked away, writing herself on her own with difficulty. She could hear his footsteps next to her as she rounded the corner to the academy gardens, but she didn't look at him. They were almost at one of the heavy wooden doors when Briar sensed it. She searched the walkways and gardens, coming to a stop. Even with no magic left, something was calling to her in the darkness and shadows. What? Silas asked, but she was hurrying toward the courtyard. Briar! Silas caught her shoulder, stopping her. What are you doing? He was tense. Go to bed. She shook her head, tugging at his grip. Something's here. And her eyes fell on the ground, a patch along the stones darker than the rest. Energy buzzed in the air, energy she could sense. She hurried toward it, ignoring Silas calling after her. As she got close, the still shadow became something real. A body, she thought, laying on the stone ground, but... Briar's breathing hitched. A student lay in his nightclothes. He was chest down on the ground, his head to the side. Oh! A panicked whisper slipped through her lips. A patch of blood seeped into the cracks of the surrounding stones. Briar dropped to her knees beside his body, but she knew the truth before she pressed her fingers to his neck. Briar reached for his eyes, needing to see for herself. She gently opened an eyelid and reeled back at what she found. The man's eyes were completely dark, like two voids. Turning, she saw Silas hadn't approached, and his expression was unreadable. A Vic. Briar got to her feet, backing away. What had happened to the protection spell? but Silas didn't react. His eyes are black, all black. She reached him, grabbing his arm, trying to make him understand. It was unmistakable. Every child in Vostra knew the mark of the suicide demon. A Theos Vic tried to save him, she cut off at the sound of echoing footsteps in the night. 
she glanced to the arch they had walked through in time to spot a figure sprinting around the corner. He searched the grounds until he caught sight of Silas and Briar. Briar tensed at the sight of Axel. There was something vicious on his face as he made for them, but when his eyes met Silas's, they flashed with relief. Silas said nothing as Axel's gaze fell on the heap beyond them. Axel stopped his approach, staring at it for a long, long time. Briar couldn't help but to look back too. She had no idea what was going on. Someone was dead. Demons were, were everywhere, it seemed. And what was Axel doing out here? You. Briar jumped, spinning to Axel. He was making for her, his expression murderous. You little cunt! His shout echoed around the courtyard as Briar leaped back. Then Silas jumped between them. Leave it. Silas's voice was tight. Fear rose like bile in Briar's throat. There were demons inside the protection spell. Panic saturated her voice. Someone's dead. Why? What the fuck is going on? Axel paused at that, tugging his arm from Silas's grip and looking between them. Demons? A bracken, Briar said, eyeing Axel wearily. A Theos Atlan, and now a Vic. Silas spun on her so fast she cut off. You saw the... An... Atlan? He demanded. She edged another step away, unnerved at the intensity of his gaze. In the gardens. Vanished right before the bracken appeared. There was a long silence, during which Silas stared at her in shock. Axel turned from them both, running his fingers through his hair before he barked a humorless laugh. Axel looked back, waving a hand at her, his voice ice-cold mirth. Fright. Of course. He dug in his pocket rather aggressively for something. Of course she fucking did. He pulled out his matches and coil case. Just the kind of year we're having, isn't it? What does that mean? Briar demanded. Silas looked lost for words. Axel tried to light a match, but it snapped against the coil case. What? Briar began, but she noticed for the first time there was blood smeared across Axel's cheek as he snapped another match. He wasn't looking at either of them, and his frame was as tense as a cat. It took her a second to focus on the question, peeling her gaze from Axel to Silas. What about the protection spell? What if more demons... The protection spell is fine, Silas replied. How do you know that? Briar asked. Silas's eyes were on Axel, who had just snapped the third match with a curse. I can feel it. It's part of my magic, he said absently, putting a hand on Axel's arm. Mate? Axel shrugged off Silas's touch, successfully lighting the fourth match, cupping it as he held it to his coil. He took a deep inhale, finally meeting Silas's eyes, nodding briefly as he shook the match out. Silas cupped his neck, eyes dark as they slid over to the body behind them, and then to Briar. You're... Briar narrowed her eyes at them, going to tell me what the hell is going on, right? Silas seemed barely to have noticed her question. Just go to bed. You're fucking joking! She glanced between them. Axel scowled for a second before taking another drag, still refusing to look at her. I'm not going anywhere until you explain. Axel breathed a laugh, smoke billowing from his nose. Silas glanced at him wearily, and when he spoke, his voice was quiet. Go. Nah. Alex took the coil between his fingers. She wants to fucking know. Why don't you tell her? You know I can't. Silas's voice was stiff. Axel sneered, nodding as he finally glanced to Briar. Right. Because you, he waved the hand with the coil at her, found new ways to screw everything up. Me? Her voice was high-pitched and disbelieving. I don't even know what's going on. Absolutely stunning, isn't it? Axel asked, taking a step toward her. But Silas's hand closed around his arm. Axel stopped. 
and you've managed to so royally that he can't even explain anything to you now. What does that even mean? That's enough. Silas's voice was quiet. Both of you. But Briar was done. Every second she stood here, she could sense the body behind her, a threat grating against her mind. She should be just as still and lifeless, torn to pieces by the bracken. No, Briar breathed. That's it. I'm done. I don't care what it costs me. She pointed a finger at Axel. Your mate is never getting his blood when he needs it again, even if I have to leave the protection spell to make it happen. Axel's eyes went dark. She's baiting you. Silas stepped in front of his friend, hands raised, but this time Axel moved too quickly, the blur of his figure so fast it had to be amplification magic. She barely got a step away when pain split her chin. Her world careened out of control, and then the hard stone ground smashed into her arms and back and legs. Axel, Silas's voice was a groan. The weight of Axel winded her. Her hands came up, finding Axel's chin and neck, trying to shove him off. A sob broke from her chest, her world spinning from the blow. Axel crushed her wrists, shoving them out of the way. Axel! Axel froze, a nasty scowl twisting his expression as Silas's command rang out. His face was so close to hers, his fists pinning her arms to the ground. This close, the blood smear on his face looked like fingerprints, as if someone had grappled with him as she just had. The coil was bent between his teeth, its lit end in danger of grazing her cheek. Too many brushes with death tonight, and Briar's mind was coming apart at the seams. Might as well do it. The whisper slipped from her lips as she felt the ash from his coil burn as it tumbled across her skin. I'm dead in the trial anyway. The confession carved her in two, and hot tears blurred her vision. She'd known it since she'd looked into the beady eyes of the bracken tonight. She didn't stand a chance. I would so like to. But then Axel's weight was gone. His voice was fainter as he stood. I'm over her manipulative bull... Enough! Silas sounded tired. Briar rolled on her side, the world not quite standing still. She's playing games. And now the Atlan? Not really the point, though, is it? Silas's voice was cutting. And she's right. If she dies in the trial, it's over. Briar sat up wiping her eyes with her sleeve, not wanting to look up at either of them until she'd got her tears under control. What are you suggesting? Axel asked. I'll train with her after class every week to make sure she's ready. Mate, we both know. No way am I, Briar cut in. That is enough! Silas was loud enough to cut them both off. She'd never heard the nobility in his voice before now. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Axel fold his arms, going silent. Then Silas was kneeling beside her. She glared at him and spat on the floor between them, which was a lot grosser than she'd intended, since it was mostly blood. Fuck off. Let me help you get past the trial. His voice was unusually soft, and he just looked so exhausted, it was hard to find a place to fuel her hatred. You just don't want me to die with half your magic. He shrugged. True. There's nothing you could offer me that would make me want to spend a second with you and your dog. Just me. Silas, think about this. That was Axel. I have. Silas said quietly, as Briar pulled herself to her knees, rubbing her chin. There's no other choice. Could let me use my magic more, Briar muttered. Silas regarded her, and on his face was the most hurtful expression he'd ever given her, because that was definitely pity in his eyes. You'll be slaughtered, he said. The Academy can't offer you enough. Half my magic can't offer you enough to save you. She stared at him. 
Was it true? All of this suffering and shame so she could walk into the final trial and become demon fodder. She thought of the bracken with its pale claws and taut, scabbed skin. Her eyes squeezed tight shut reflexively. He'd saved her. She'd hardly processed it, but Silas had saved her again. And right now, he wasn't even rubbing that in. Briar wanted to run. Run from this academy that would force her to face those demons. She'd taken on too much. She'd thought of herself too highly. She was pathetic. She picked herself up without his help, drawing a ragged breath. Her body was drained. She met Silas's amber gaze. He looked tired but so sure of himself. You can help me survive? She asked. Silas shrugged. The Academy doesn't give a shit about us. They're here to pump us full of magic and see who comes out the other end. They don't care how much you want it. They want raw power. That stung, and for a moment it was like he could see right into her soul. I'm your best bet. Her stomach churned, every instinct screaming at her to tell him to fuck right off again. But what if he was right? She'd never been face to face with a demon like a bracken before, and there were worse monsters at the dusk wall breach. She shuddered. Most of the demons at the trial were worse than a bracken. Okay, she muttered. Tomorrow at 8 p.m., meet me at the third potions room. She nodded and walked past him. Before she could take off, Axel stepped in her way, grabbing her arm. You win, she said, stopping the tears trying to spring into her eyes again. She didn't want to look at him. No, he replied. His voice was so dangerous that she glanced up to measure his expression. He lifted his hand to his own face, his thumb smearing across the smatter of blood on his cheek. Then he grabbed her chin, pressing his blood-stained thumb against her lips until it hurt. She tried to tug away from him in disgust, but he didn't let go. No one wins tonight, he said quietly. Especially not that little weasel you call a friend. Briar's eyes widened. His words sent a chill down her spine. She was searching the bloodstains on his cheek for a moment, seeing the imprints of fingers. Grayson! Better run, kitten. There was absolute venom in his expression. Or there might be two empty spots in class tomorrow. Briar spared one last glance to the dead body on the stone behind them, and then she was tearing across the courtyard. Chapter 11 He's not actually going to die, is he? Silas asked. Axel glanced at him sideways, and it wasn't reassuring. He had no problem killing. Silas had seen that firsthand. But they both knew why they were here. Temper isn't exactly in check. Might have overestimated my healing, but she's... Axel looked strained. She's better at healing than me. Silas could tell when Axel wasn't on his game. A right cocky prick most of the time. He held his six-foot-seven frame as if he owned any room he walked into, even his first bloody meeting with Silas's mother. He'd walk to his death with a straight back and a grin, no problem. Right now, as he lit a second coil, Axel was hunched over the match like it needed all his attention. She's out of magic, Silas said. Alex frowned. Fuck. Course. He straightened only a little, scratching his temple as smoke billowed from the fresh coil between his teeth. Then he shrugged. Well, she'll wait for enough to come back. She'll manage. If nothing else, she's relentless. Briar's magic would trickle in, but how close to death was Grayson? Would it be such a loss, really? Axel asked. Silas's eyes widened, and Axel looked away. Came here for a new start, didn't we? He's a threat. 
a new start? Silas demanded. To get away from all the death, so let's kill everyone that gets in the way? He tried to contain the anger in his voice. He's not everyone. Axel sounded strained. You talked me out of killing him last time, and now look what happened. Silas didn't want to. The crumpled shadow of Morin Lance's still form was ever present, even when he shut his eyes. Tonight, Silas said, wasn't his fault. You didn't see him. Axel finally met his gaze, green eyes blazing, taunting me. Everything, all of it, is because of him. He's only hanging out with her to fuck with me. You know what he blames me for. He blames you for that, or you blame yourself. The words slipped out before Silas could stop them. He winced, regretting it instantly. Axel's eyes went dark, and he opened his mouth, then shut it. It had been the night, not long ago, that had, one way or another, led them to this academy. Grayson, too, Silas had no doubt. It was a night that ended like this one, except worse, so much worse, for whose blood had seeped into the grass at the end of it all. When Axel replied, his voice was uncharacteristically quiet. I'm not wrong about him. Silas shut his eyes, trying to ground himself. He wasn't ready for this right now, wasn't prepared to have to balance Axel too. Okay, what did he say that makes you think he's after you? Silas asked. Axel took the coil from his mouth, staring at it as he turned, nose wrinkled in a scowl. What? Silas asked. Axel gave his jaw a scratch, still fixated on his coil. What did he say? Can see it in his eyes. Axel fixed Silas with a defiant glare. You attacked him because of how he looked at you? We both know the moment he learns about, This is too far. This is what he does, Axel spat. No one else can see it, and it's not just you. She's in danger the second he finds out. I get it, Silas snapped. I do, but you can't just... He drew his fingers through his hair. This was completely out of hand. I'm not wrong on this. Axel was so tense. Silas opened his mouth and shut it again, fighting the words that wanted to tear from his lips, the accusations, the blame, the rage. But they wouldn't do any good. Axel would be a scapegoat anyway, because they were both doing their best. Silence hung like a sharp hook in their throats. It went unspoken between them, the real reason Axel was unhinged tonight, even if Silas wouldn't say it. Briar's signature on the note had been clear as day. Although it had been left for him, Silas had never called her kitten. They couldn't ignore the fact that maybe he'd pushed her too far. Silas took a breath. They should wake a teacher. Some of them were good healers, but then Silas winced. Then they'd have to explain, and Axel would almost certainly be expelled. Where is he? Silas asked. Her room? So, no one had seen. Fuck. Fuck! Silas already had a nightmare of a conversation with the warden tomorrow, and might well be facing expulsion himself. He couldn't deny the small part of him that didn't want to save Grayson either. The part that wanted to do the same thing Axel had, saddle Grayson with all the blame of their past, let him die with it, and slam the door behind them. It would be easier. If Grayson dies, Silas sighed, I'll take credit. And if he lived? If he told the warden what Axel had done? Well, they'd deal with that when it came. Silas shoved it from his mind. Add it to the fucking list. A Vic got right through the protection spell. I anchored it. The warden's going to be pissed. 
What about the other two demons? Axel asked. He seemed to be avoiding speaking the Atlan's name. When the Vic came in, it made a hole in the protection spell. Silas had been considering that already. I think the Atlan tried to break through but couldn't get in. Too powerful. So the Bracken manifested instead. Once it was in, the crack sealed, though. It... Axel swallowed. The Atlan came for her? Silas needed to shut down that line of thought now. It doesn't matter. Doesn't change anything. But if... I won't entertain this. He couldn't. They'd beaten this topic to death already. There was a pause. Tonight. Axel's voice was rough. It was my fault. The lessons you offered her, I can do them. She won't come. She'll manage. You said it's hard for you to be around her. Right. He had said that. And it was, but he'd have to deal. Axel was trying to fix it like he always did, and it twisted him up. He held Axel's gaze. Guilt, fear, anger, all the shit from what happened tonight simmered in his chest, amplified by the abyss he was still trying to bury. She needs a different approach, he said after careful contemplation. Briar was a bit more complicated than they'd initially thought. She wouldn't be bullied into doing what they needed. Axel sighed. Fine. I'll deal with this then. He threw a nod toward the ever-present shadow. Silas could hear Morin's weeping. I never stood a chance anyway. Mum was right. I should have listened to her. I never should have come here. Silas realized he'd taken a step away. He was grateful that there was no pity in Axel's eyes, but he could tell by his strained expression that he knew what was happening. Go, Axel said. Shamefully, Silas didn't argue. Briar first ran to Grayson's rooms, banging on the door. His bleary-eyed roommate opened in a dressing gown. Where's Grayson? Briar demanded. Gone, ain't it? Dragged out with that brute and a while ago now. I don't know where they went. He looked nervous, his eyes darting down the hallway. You call a teacher? Briar demanded. You kidding? You think I want to get in Wolf's bad books? Guy's a monster. But Briar was already backing up. Her heart thundered in her ears as she tried to decide where he'd be. Axel had told her about Grayson, which meant he wanted her to find him. She turned sprinting down the hallway. This had been about her, and Axel would have made sure she knew that. She shoved open the door to her own dorm room. It was too dark to see anything, but she heard light breaths rasping. Rapid. Too rapid. Grayson? The breathing paused for a second, but he didn't reply. She stumbled toward the sound coming from her bed. She grabbed the curtain, tearing it open. In the moonlight, she saw Grayson laying on his back, a hand curled over his stomach. His whole body shook with every shallow, gurgling breath. Oh, Theos. Briar stumbled toward him and seized his arm. There was the faintest trickle of magic pooling in her reserve, enough to take an image of what was going on. She recoiled. The damage to Grayson's body was so visceral so messed up that bile almost came up her throat. There were bruises deep enough to rupture vital structures in his abdomen, lacerations across his chest, blood seeping from his flesh, fluid drowning his lungs from the inside, and his heart. Her breath caught. Grayson's heart was trying to keep his blood flowing everywhere it needed, but there were so many tears in that circulation that it wasn't getting anywhere. She could feel it, backing into the chambers, each beat losing more and more fuel. She let go of Grayson, her mind consumed with terror. He was going to die. He was going to die right now if she couldn't heal him. 
but her magic was seeping in so slowly. She pulled herself onto the bed next to him, hunched over his chest, and pressed her hands under his shirt and onto his clammy skin. Her first instinct was to build up his heart and circulation with whatever magic ebbed in, but she realized it wouldn't be enough. She was too slow, and there were too many other failures. She closed her eyes, changing the focus of her healing. If she could just... There. Briar let out a sob of relief as her magic bound to his blood. She pushed it through his body, holding it in his veins when it tried to seep out, forcing it to circulate into his lungs, brain, and limbs. It took less of her magic than healing, just enough that she could hold it together with each beat of his heart. He coughed, and she focused on his lungs, slowly drawing the blood from them with each contraction, one drop at a time. She could do this. She looked at him properly now. His face was swollen. His nose was crooked and bloody. His eyes were open, wide with fear. How was he awake? I'm not going to let you die. Her voice cracked, and suddenly she felt the tears flooding down her cheeks. I'm so sorry, Grayson, she choked. This is all my fault. He held her gaze, and in the tiniest of motions, he shook his head. She hunched over him, consumed by relief as she held his body together by a thread. A minute passed, and she prayed that her magic would regenerate faster than it depleted. She just needed to let it build, and she could heal him properly. Another minute, then another. Briar trembled as she held him, something breaking within her as the truth became clear. Her magic wouldn't regenerate fast enough. It was spilling into her reserve just fast enough to get used up again. Briar sobbed. If she let go of Grayson for even a second, he would die. She couldn't run for help, not even the next room over. Okay, okay, what am I going to do? Her thoughts weren't coherent as panic gripped her. It's okay. It's going to be okay. Her shaking voice was barely comprehensible. I will not let you die. She didn't know if she said it for him or her. Help! She screamed. Please! Somebody help! But she knew it was hopeless. The walls and doors were thick, muting as much sound as possible. She screamed again, desperate for someone to hear her. Minutes ticked by, and no one came. She closed her eyes, her breaths shaking now. Just stay here. Don't move. Don't let go. So she didn't. She climbed on top of him so she wouldn't fall asleep, legs straddling him, pressed against his chest, as she forced the blood around his body. Lungs for oxygen, to organs and brain and limbs to heart, and back to lungs for oxygen. Minutes turned to hours, and she held on, forcing his body to live, whispering to him she wouldn't leave. Occasionally, Grayson's eyes opened, fixed on hers, wide and terrified, but eventually he passed out. Once she was alone, Briar began sobbing in earnest, shaking as she rested her head on him her tears wetting the crusted blood on his chest. Someone has to come at some point, right? She was exhausted, and within her, agony stirred. Her magic would seep in and vanish. She'd never noticed before, but the moment she ran out, it ached, like a knife dragged a long bone. Over time, it became torturous, an open wound with a stick grinding into it over and over, tugging it open again and again, deeper and deeper. Light filtered through the open curtain, and Briar carried on. Lungs for oxygen, to organs and brain and limbs, to heart. Her mind felt like a dead tree in a windstorm, splintering bit by bit. Her body became hollow, giving all it had, 
then giving it again. Lungs for oxygen. Someone has to come. Class must have started. And neither she nor Grayson were there. Someone would notice. But no one had ever cared. The Academy doesn't give a shit about us. Silas's words floated into her head. It was true. The teachers regarded them like cattle, never getting attached, knowing that they were destined to die. But I don't want to die. I don't want Grayson to die. Not like this. Not when I can save him. If he died, it would be her fault. Grayson hadn't regained consciousness, but Briar was relieved. She didn't want him to see this. She was overcome with another spell of sobs, completely dry now. On and on time went. She felt every second. Her reserve of magic shrieked in agony, and she knew somehow that no matter how much she wanted to continue, it would break eventually. It would crack before she would, and she wouldn't be able to hold Grayson together anymore. Something deeping and more foreboding told her she shouldn't let that happen, that if her well of magic broke, it would never recover. Let him go, you fool. One of the voices that haunted her was a taunt in her ear. Then there was a knock at the door. Briar straightened, her muscles screaming at her as she lifted her head. Someone was here. She felt dizzy at the realization. Someone had come to save them. Help! She tried to call, but the word was weak. Her tongue stuck to the inside of her mouth. The knock sounded again, and the handle turned. Briar tried to clear her throat and call out once more, when Axel's voice sounded from the other side of the door. She froze, terrified. You can't hide because you're pissed about last night. He'd cracked the door, but he hadn't opened it completely. He'd... He'd been the one to do this to Grayson. Why, why did it have to be him? If he came in, he'd finish the job like he'd intended to. Somehow her body gave her more tears. He was going to walk in and find her like this. He was going to kill Grayson after everything. The door swung open and Axel stepped in. You're lucky, Silas is. He cut off as his eyes fell on her. What? He strode over, and she moved her body over Grayson protectively. Don't. Her voice was dry, barely audible. Please, don't hurt him. Nice. Axel was staring down at Grayson with a dumbfounded expression. He's dead. Briar just stared at him wildly, not wanting to argue. If he thought Grayson was dead, would he leave? But then did she want him to leave? She couldn't. She couldn't do this for much longer. Her lip quivered pathetically. Please. It felt like her chest was caving in. Please. Help him. Axel looked at her as if she were mad. He crouched, though, placing a hand on Grayson's forehead, his eyes not leaving her. He held it there only a second, before recoiling with a sharp breath, his eyes suddenly on Grayson, unnerved. Not fucking natural. He shook his hand as if it burned. It was my choice to leave, not his, Briar begged. I can't get enough magic to, to heal him properly. Axel ran his fingers through his hair, his eyes darting between them, and a shadow passed over them as they lingered on Grayson. There was maybe more to this man than her, but she didn't care. He's... Axel was giving her a strange look. He's not what you think he is. Briar stared at him, bile burning her throat. You're... You're not going to help? Her voice shattered completely, and somehow tears were sliding down her cheeks again. Axel stared at her for a long, long time, his expression twisting into something bitter. She knew then that he was going to leave. But what else had her exhausted, delusional mind expected? A part of her even wondered if he'd drag her from Grayson to quicken the job. She'd be able to do nothing to stop him. He blurred in her vision, another sob coming from her chest, 
as she clung to Grayson. Somehow she'd been reduced to this. Everything left that mattered to her was at Axel Wolf's mercy. And he was going to watch it all crumble. Oh, for fuck's sake, he muttered at last. Well, I can't do anything about that. He looked at Grayson. Not nearly good enough. He stood. Wait, I'll get someone. Can you hold on? He asked. She didn't know why he'd changed his mind, and she didn't care. Relief filled her chest like a cool breath of fresh air. She nodded. She could hold on. Now she knew there was an end. Chapter 12 It was a miscalculation. Silas was sitting in a stiff-backed chair, facing the warden, and her tight-lipped expression, it won't happen again. It was hard to keep himself composed. He'd woken with a familiar fog of dread this morning, that directionless weight of wrongness he felt when his world came apart. They'd paused classes to announce the death of Morin Lance. There was a disturbing lack of fanfare about it, actually. He supposed that students here were expected to die, but he was shaken more than he could let on in a meeting as important as this. The warden narrowed her eyes, the color matching the silver of the hair that tumbled about her shoulders. On another woman, the loose waves might appear youthful, but there was nothing youthful about the warden. She looked to be in her late forties, which, for a bone mage, meant she was ancient. Rarely did Silas feel small around other mages, his magic outmatched most by a long shot, but this woman had set him on edge from the moment he'd met her. Somehow, Silas had left the oversight of his mother and into the wardship of another woman who might be almost as formidable. It helped if he reminded himself that what the warden wanted from him, at least, was exploitative in a completely overt nature. He'd literally signed a contract that outlined it, a contract that he'd violated last night. She'd said nothing through his explanation, her eyes fixed on him over arched fingers. If it weren't for the interest the Ebony Conclave has in you, I would expel you this instant. Her words were quiet. Silas swallowed. I would remind you that if that were to happen, I would have no obligations to keep the secret about your condition. It wouldn't be as simple as an execution for him, no. It was more than just illegal to become a living biomage. It was certain death if he was found out. The epidemic of 571 haunted Ladrina. Almost a century wasn't enough to dull that stigma, and it wouldn't matter one bit that his was not a plague demon. No, if he was found bonded with a living demon, he'd face much worse than death. The warden was one of the few people on Vostra that knew the condition of his bond, and only because it had been a necessity to get him into the academy at all. He needed to keep it that way. I was promised you had your bond under control. It was true, but when Silas had entered their agreement, he hadn't yet split his magic pool with Briar. It was best, he decided, to keep that development to himself. Show me your commitment to that promise, the warden said. See that you find alternative solutions to manage your form. Right as if that wasn't the thing that consumed Silas's life. The warden sighed. You have a lot to offer the breach, and I want to make this arrangement work. Silas nodded, but she wasn't finished. I will not, cannot, let another incident like this slide. But mark me. The warden tugged on the sleeves of her shirt, tightening her cuffs. I will do everything in my power to keep this in-house, whether or not that is favorable to you. Silas tried to gauge her expression as she rested her elbows on the desk again, clasping her fingers. 
his eyes snagged at a flash of color contrasting her white shirt. The two coin-sized jewels peeked out from beneath her cuffs, purple and orange, embedded in the skin of her forearm. Her universe stone and her instinct stone, grown, he knew, from her very bones. His blood chilled. He had seen a lot of blood mages in his time, but he'd only met one who'd not grown their jewels on their chest or torso, and Gabe was an absolute prat. He'd chosen to grow his on his hands. It was a foolish and reckless move, likely designed to piss off their mother more than anything else. But Silas didn't get the impression the warden played games. Are we clear? she asked. Silas found it hard to peel his eyes from the stones. It was like they were staring at him, a dare. Go on, they seemed to say. Try, try to divide us from our host. He realized she'd asked him a question, but he was unnerved, both by the threat and by her tight smile. I, yes, he stammered. I understand. I'll find another solution. As he left, he couldn't help thinking about those stones. He had perhaps underestimated how powerful she was. When he stepped out of the office, Axel was waiting. Silas knew instantly that something was wrong, more wrong anyway. What? Silas asked. Axel's jaw clenched as he spoke. Got your wish, didn't you? He sounded irritated, but Silas could hear the faint undercurrent of urgency. And when Axel was urgent, things were already falling apart. You need to go to her dorm right now. Briar waited, each second feeling like an hour, the agony in her chest worse than before. What was taking Axel so long? He just had to find a teacher. They'd be in the classrooms right now. By the time there were footsteps in her room again, she was curled over Grayson's chest, exhausted. She forced herself up to see who'd arrived, expecting a teacher who knew more about healing than her. Instead, What? she asked, panic setting in once more. It was Silas standing before her. You can't help me. He couldn't heal. That was well known. Were they playing a game with her? She noticed his jaw clench as she said that. I can, he said, if you want me to, but you won't like it. Anything, she whispered. I'll do anything. Silas's eyes fell on Grayson and then he closed them for a second. It hit her how exhausted he was. He had dark circles under his eyes. His skin was more gaunt than usual. He sighed, reaching for his belt and drawing out his blade. He unsheathed it and drew his sleeve up. What are you doing? She croaked. It's a theory. He drew the blade across the skin on his arm, blood seeping from the fresh wound. She stared at him, her eyes wide, almost losing focus on Grayson. Get it together. Silas knelt and held his arm up to her mouth. She understood. For a second, she was going to protest, but she was so tired and she hurt so much. She leaned forward and pressed her lips to his arm, cringing slightly as she tasted his blood for the second time. Power blossomed in her chest, magic streaking through her own veins, and the agonizing throb of her cracking, dry well of power vanished as she flooded it. She drew from him, a sob or a laugh escaping her lips, she wasn't sure. She turned to Grayson, funneling her energy into him. Briar shifted forward, pressed against his chest, holding her forehead against his. For a second, she was a part of him, so familiar she was with the beat of his heart that her magic wove easily into every atom of his being. She drew it all together the same way she had over and over in her head for hours as she felt the damage, as she'd clutched it in place, holding death away by a hair's breadth. Grayson took a deep, ragged breath, his eyes not opening, but she could feel the power in his heart now, the fullness of his lungs the ease at which his blood sped through his veins. 
his organs were alive and working. Another laugh escaped her, and she turned to Silas in a moment of exhilaration, smiling. But she froze at his expression. He was stepping away, regarding her with a venomous hatred. Then he'd turned and was gone, and she didn't care one bit because Grayson was going to live. Daylight seemed out of place as she helped Grayson out of bed. It flooded her room, likely mid-morning by now. He said nothing as she led him to the shower, and his eyes were wide and anxious. She didn't blame him. For all the anguish she'd gone through to keep him alive, he'd been the one to live through it. He didn't push her away when she helped him take his clothes off, or when she turned the water on. The bruises on his body were gone now, but there was dried blood across his face and back. Beneath it, there was a scar across his chest and abdomen, a knife wound. She hadn't had enough magic to cleanse him of that. She stepped away from the shower, giving him some privacy as he leaned into the hot water. She fished in his pockets for his key and hurried down to his rooms. She grabbed him a fresh set of clothes. When she returned to her room, she set them outside of the shower, but paused as she heard him beyond the door. She crept up to it, biting her lip, hoping it wasn't what she thought it was. Grayson was crying. She could hear deep, low sobs from the back of his throat, like a wounded animal. Briar swallowed, listening for only a second more before feeling bad for invading his privacy. She got to work, changing the bedsheets, Briar blinked away tears as she worked, and as she uncovered massive stains of brownish red, they shook her to her core. Now he was alive and safe, the brutality of it felt like it was crushing her. He'd gone through this because of her choice. Because of her stupid choice. She trembled as she flipped the mattress, biting back more tears as she found the blood had stained through to the other side and for a moment she couldn't move. The image of Alex's fists pummeling Grayson, the rage that crept behind his eyes, unleashed on her friend, because of her. She sank to her knees, hugging herself as she shook with dry sobs. Even now, between Grayson's vendetta, Axel's rage, and Silas's violent secrets, Briar felt like she was the one who'd messed this up like she was too stupid to see this huge, missing piece that would make it all make sense. Why did it feel like they were doing the right thing and she wasn't? Axel had almost killed Grayson, and then he'd returned to save him. She hated him more for that. She hated that he'd had to because she wasn't enough. She hated that she'd had to ask for help again and again and again. It felt like they were the ones who knew what they were doing, and she was some stupid child, coming in and causing problems because she was too weak. The world felt like it was crumbling. She was transported to last night, lying on Grayson again, desperate as he faded beneath her failing magic. Briar! Briar jumped as she felt someone touch her shoulder. Grayson's voice was distant. It sounded like he'd been calling her name a few times. Then he was tugging her up into an embrace. She sunk into him, trembling, clutching him. Hey, hey, Vanny. He held her. It's going to be okay. She looked up at him, and there was a smile on his face. A trace of red ringed his eyes, but you'd never know he'd been crying by the way he was looking at her. You have a shower, and I'll finish up here. You shouldn't be cleaning up after everything you've done. She stared at him, words failing her. The rich tan to his skin was glowing, and the ice blue of his eyes creased with a smile that reached them for once. His white button-up covered his scars, and she could feel the warmth of the skin of his forearm as he held her. Everything about him was so alive. No blood, no ashen tone creeping in, constantly asking, Is he dead yet? Is he dead yet? For the thousandth time she burst into tears, crumpling into him, 
and hating it, because she should let him cry, not burdening him with her tears, not after everything she'd put him through. Whoa, he said. Okay, okay. Come on. A good shower, and then you have to get some sleep. Why was he giving her this strength of his when she knew he was broken? She was numb as she stepped into the shower, watching the red of the water pool down the drain. She stood in a trance for a long time, wishing the water could cleanse her of her mind too. When she finally stepped out in her own fresh clothes that didn't have the metallic smell of blood on them, Grayson had finished putting new sheets on the bed. She hadn't actually asked him, but she'd assumed, You'll stay with me? She had to sleep. Screw classes today. Screw Silas and his after-school teaching. Grayson cocked his head. Of course I'll stay. He lay down on the empty bed, throwing his arms behind his head as he leaned against the pillows. You sleep. I'll stay here and make sure you're safe. She sat down on her bed, her eyes on him. She was so unsure, like she didn't really know the rules, but she knew what she wanted to do. He held her gaze, and something in it seemed to say, it's all right. Her stomach was suddenly in her throat, and she was unsure why. She'd been near him all night, yet still her heart raced as she lay on the bed next to him, curling into his chest. His arms wrapped around her, and he held her tight. It felt warm and comforting and safe. It felt safe in a way that she hadn't felt since she'd been living at home, the smell of her father's cooking wafting from downstairs. What does Vani mean? she asked. He pressed his chin into her forehead. It means queen. His hand came to her cheek, so gentle and caring. She looked up at him, and the icy blue of his eyes pierced her. You are the most incredible woman I've ever met. And the words were like puzzle pieces that wouldn't quite fit in her brain, so she laughed. His lips quirked in that stunning half-smile, and she had butterflies in her stomach. Why was she nervous all of a sudden? Why was it that every time his hand moved along her arm, goosebumps pricked her skin? I'm the opposite of powerful. She had to convince him, because if he was going to stick with her, she didn't want to deceive him. The way he laughed, so light and carefree, she never would have guessed he'd been weeping in the shower only fifteen minutes ago. And now he was comforting her. She dropped her gaze, guilt crushing her. Briar. The careful way that he breathed her name, as if it was something precious, drew her gaze to him. I know what you did, he said. I know you had nothing, no power left, and yet you wouldn't let me go. I had fallen off that cliff, and somehow you caught me and dragged me back. He pressed his forehead into hers and cupped her cheeks as she clutched his shirt. No one should have been able to do that. She'd feel guilty later for accepting this, for not convincing him he was wrong, that she was a fraud. She let the words in just for a moment, just to feel his closeness, and it consumed her. It brought warmth to a cold, empty cave of her soul that had been alone for so long. And when he moved closer, she tilted her head up to meet him, and his lips pressed against hers, softly at first, then with firmness and power and passion, and she felt the life in them, in him, life she'd touched, life she now knew she'd have shattered without. She wrapped her arms around his head and neck, letting him lift her on top of him as they kissed deeper. Finally, he drew away from her, his expression gentle and loving. Vani, you're shaking. You need to sleep. She didn't want to stop, but he was right. Her body was giving out beneath her. 
he held her in his arms as she closed her eyes and slept at last. For the first time, she felt safe in this academy. I bet they're fucking, Axel muttered as they sat in class, a lesson on conserving power while using passive magic. Neither Briar nor Grayson had turned up. Silas felt a sickening twist in his stomach at Alex's words. I thought we weren't going to talk about them. Yeah, but I'm just saying. She healed him for hours. I've never even heard of that happening. And they're still in that room together? How can they not be fucking? Axel asked. Silas didn't reply. Axel was probably right, though. The bastard. They'd both grown up learning enough about magic to know how healing sometimes worked, but Silas was already in a grim mood. You better thank me, the little weasel, Axel added. Silas snorted. For nearly killing him? Yeah, and getting him laid. She's probably sleeping. She's got to be exhausted. It was Axel's turn to laugh, his expression incredulous as he gave Silas a sidelong look. Are you getting weird about her, mate? Silas sighed. Of course I'm fucking weird about her. She's ruining my goddamn life. No, I mean, weird weird. Probably. There is no point in lying. First time I've ever drank from someone more than once, isn't it? Half the time, my brain is filled with images of tearing her skin off. Bit jarring to imagine her having sex with that prat. If only they were the only images his mind was full of. He grimaced. He literally hated her more than anyone he'd ever hated. This morning had sealed that deal. But her skin, her blood, even her stupid blonde curls that smelled of fucking mint, all wove into visions that flashed in his mind. Oh yeah, Axel mused over that. Guess I didn't think about that. He sighed. Still, fuck them. She literally got someone killed last night, and now she is probably having an orgasm up in her room. Not really fair, is it? Axel's trick to get through life was to take the most painful, devastating shit that ever happened to them and slap it into an immature comment, as if it meant nothing at all. Sometimes it made Silas laugh. Sometimes it made him want to strangle the man. He didn't know how he felt right now. He rolled his eyes. I don't think that weasel would even know how, Silas said. Axel grinned as Silas took the hook, thoughtful. No, now you mention it, maybe it's actually her punishment, Axel mused. Guess she won't be coming to your one-on-one -on -one tonight, though. Yeah, Silas said absently. That bothered him too much. Not that he wanted to be stuck alone with her, quite the opposite but something about her bailing on him for grace and steel got on his nerves. Chapter 13 Briar tumbled into a blissful sleep, curled in Grayson's arms in a moment of peace. So, of course, it had to be ruined by Silas. And he didn't even have the decency to knock on her door. Instead, she was jolted awake by Grayson, who sat up in bed, with a startled hiss, dragging her up with him. What? Briar asked, rubbing her eyes as Grayson's grip tightened. The first thing she noticed was the aching pit in her chest, the wounded cavern of her magic after she'd scraped it dry again and again yesterday. Get out. Grayson's voice was ice cold, dragging Briar to reality. She peered blearily around the room, trying to pull it into focus, when Silas's drawl caught her attention. I've come to get her, since she thought it'd be a good idea to stand me up. Silas was sitting himself down on her bed opposite the two of them. Well, that was unusual. He, at least, usually knocked first, even if he did plan on barging in after. I'm exhausted. Can't we do it tomorrow? she asked with a yawn. She was much more off balance than her words might let on, but she didn't want to panic Grayson. Do what tomorrow? 
Grayson's voice was taut, and his grip on her, now vice-like. Well, Silas said, beating her to the punch. She's asked me nicely to give her some lessons, which I agreed to. I'm sure you will, too. Unless you want your little lover cold and dead in your arms, come the trial. Oh, for fuck's sake. Why would you agree to that? Grayson asked Silas before Briar could slip a word in. Well, Silas mused, his smirk showing a slight point to his teeth and his irises glowing amber. She was very persuasive. Oh, Theos, is he trying to bait Grayson? She almost rolled her eyes. Can you leave off for one day? She tried to sit up, but Grayson was holding her too tightly. She placed a hand on his, feeling his grip soften as she turned to him, searching his gaze. It was fixed on Silas with venom. Grayson. He glanced down at her, his eyes softening. She touched his face gently. I'll be fine. Briar peeled away from Grayson and turned, leaning up and giving him a kiss. Please. Silas sounded disgusted. You want to come into my room unannounced? She asked, not turning to Silas. I'll fuck him in front of you for all I care. Briar cringed the moment the words slipped past her lips. Too much. But it startled a grin out of Grayson, thank Theos. She smiled at him like everything was just fine before grabbing her cloak. Right, she said, peering at Silas, who had a nasty sneer on his face. Let's go then. Once they were in the hallway, she felt the confidence sag from her like wind from sails. She glanced nervously at Silas, who wasn't looking at her as he led them down the hallway. Seems harsh, taunting him right after your mate nearly murders him, she said. Right, because I'm a soft, fluffy person who cares about being harsh, he replied without a glance. She hurried to keep up with him, trying to catch his eye. He had nothing to do with yesterday, she said. Please, can you guys leave him out of it? I'm surprised he's in bed with you after all you've put him through, Silas replied. But then I hear healing can be one hell of a high. He sneered as he finally looked to her, his eyes grossly appraising. Ride it as long as you can. The emphasis on that first word was enough for her to stop walking for a second, though he didn't wait. She hurried after him the rest of the way down the stairs without speaking, confusion and embarrassment coiling within her. The ache of her magical wound crept back in, along with the silence and anxiety, and it was enough to make her eyes water. She had to work to stuff it down this time. They walked past the library, and he opened the door to one of the old potions rooms. Within, candles burned, and shelves of books lined the walls. A mixing table stood at the far corner, surrounded by more shelves of glass jars, bottles, and a few small cauldrons. Couches and armchairs sat snugly in the center, facing one another. Silas sat down on a couch, setting a little bag from his pocket on a side table. Briar took an armchair facing him, peering around the room, a painting of Vostra was on the small area of free space on the walls, the dark eye of the dusk sun staring back at her. A few stacks of loose-leaf papers and a quill lay forgotten on a small table at her side. Finally, she was forced to look back at Silas, who had pulled a quill of his own out of his pocket, along with a few scraps of paper. I didn't have sex with him, Briar blurted before she could stop herself. Why? Why the fuck had she said that? Silas looked like he was biting back a grin. I really don't care, he replied. He was unfolding the piece of paper. Yeah, but what did you mean about healing? She asked. Once she had, she realized she didn't really want to know the answer. Silas shrugged, examining whatever diagram was drawn in ink on the paper. Healing can sometimes cause connection. The more intimate the healing, the longer it goes, 
the closer to death the victim is. He shrugged, looking back up at her, his voice lingering on the word victim too long. Poor Grayson probably can't get you out of his head right now. It was like a stone had dropped into her stomach. Oh, was all she said. These feelings she'd been clinging to, this unfamiliar sense that she'd found a place she belonged, it all crumbled. She bit her lip the moment it quivered. I'll keep that in mind, she muttered, the words a strain on her soul. Let's get on with it then. All right, Silas said. He regarded her with a hard look. First I need to know which of the demons you plan on tackling in the final trial. She stared at him, knowing she was about to start another fight, but, well, she needed the help. I assume you're planning on going after a Tixin. The Valmore, Briar countered. Better to get this over with. Silas froze. He actually seemed lost for words for a moment, searching her eyes as if trying to find the joke. Out of the six options, the Valmor was the most deadly. It was the rarest demon. Only one would be in the trial, because the Academy knew that releasing too many of them would cause mass fatalities. It was her one shot to claw back her dignity and have enough power to perhaps one day face the Lady Dawn. Silas put down the paper and buried his face in his hands. Theos above, he muttered. Is your brain legitimately broken? She actually considered that, then shrugged. But you'll... I mean... He was lost for words, and at least he'd sussed her out enough now to know when they were past argument. Why? he asked, finally. I didn't come here for a trixen, she said simply. I get the Valmore or I die trying. Yeah, he said through gritted teeth. But now, if you die, you take half my magic with you. It hit her in its full beauty. This was the first real victory she'd had here. Even if she failed completely and died, she'd still be taking half the magic of a noble fucker on the way out. There was no way she could fail to do some damage. Bonus, she replied. His eyes darkened. He looked like he wanted to threaten her again. But the beauty of this situation was settling around them. She had him. She had him completely. You can't control what I do in that trial, she said. You won't even be in it. They had established early on that since Silas already had his transformation, the trial was something he wouldn't be taking part in. And Axel can't help me. It was one of the first things they'd learned unless he is planning on an Eladrin, which she distinctly doubted. No, there was no teaming up in the trial. When they killed the demon, it bonded to their soul, to their very sacrifice. If the act wasn't of their own achievement, the power they got from the bond would be diminished. Silas took a deep breath that looked very forced, rage poorly concealed by his neutral expression. He lay down on the couch his hands rubbing his face as he kicked his feet over the arm. Briar was reminded again of how much he looked like a spoiled brat, the cuffs of his sleeves folded up, his legs crossed like he owned the place. Okay, he said. I will train you to kill the Valmore. He sounded like he couldn't believe what he was saying. So, she said cautiously, you think it's possible? No. He gave her an exasperated look. But what choice have you given me? Fair. But only if you agree to something, he continued. Yeah? she asked. If it gets killed before you get to it, or if you fail and somehow limp away alive, you will bond with something else, anything else. I don't care if it's a fossling. She regarded him with narrowed eyes. Okay. She hadn't really given any thought to what she'd do if she couldn't get the Valmore, but she'd have to do her best with what she got. I'll do that. Right. 
So Valmore, demons of betrayal that linger in mist. Transformation, the most powerful of the two vamps the Academy offers. Ten feet tall with six sets of eyes. Can't actually see in a traditional sense. Drawn to bonds of immense trust and feeds on deception. Humanoid, scaled, has enormous claws and two huge, sharp fangs. He paused. Have I missed anything? Oh, wait, yes. Will thoughtlessly devour tiny foolish girls with blonde curls who are stupid enough to wander into their path. Simple, Briar replied. I'll have to straighten my hair for the trial. Silas let out an angry huff. Why do you take this so lightly? Briar regarded him. There is nothing light about why I'm here. I'd rather be dead than fail. Why are you here? he asked. She sneered at him. Wouldn't you like to know, noble? You really hate me, don't you? he asked. What's not to hate? Briar asked. I have saved your life again and again, and now I've saved your little lover, too. He cut off as she let out a strangled scream, standing from her chair. Saved him? she demanded. Your friend was the reason he almost died. Because you upped and fucked off somewhere for no good reason. Silas had sat up now, glowering up at her. Why? he demanded. Why would you do that? I'm not your puppet, she snapped. You treat me like I'm your dog. Want me to just crawl to you whenever you snap your fingers? But you did, though, he replied his voice quiet. She could see the hatred smoldering under everything. You did crawl to me like a dog when you needed it. So why shouldn't I expect it? Her words were like knives in her chest. In her head, she leaped at him, knocking him over and clawing at his face until that stupid smirk had been wiped from his mouth. She took a deep breath, her fists clenching at her sides. You didn't save Grayson, she whispered. I saved Grayson. You were disposable energy. You could have all the power in the world, but if it was Axel bleeding out like that, you'd need me. You'd be worthless. Silas stood in a flash, and the room shimmered, shadows converging on him all of a sudden. His eyes glinted among them, his ears elongating slightly, turning black, and his fingers shifted to claws. She was both terrified and gratified that she'd finally found his pressure point, the thing that made him twisted up inside like he made her feel every second she was around him. This was a mistake, he hissed. Can't handle feeling worthless, little noble? she asked. Happy enough to dish it out, though. You should leave, he sounded strained. Now. No. Instead, Briar took a step toward him, and she realized he was looking at her with murder. But something was whispering at her to toss everything to the wind, to see where she landed. His expression was thunderous as she reached him, and she pressed a finger into his chest. I'm not yours, she whispered. You don't get to tell me what to do. He grabbed her wrist, the sharpness of his talons digging into her flesh as he removed it from his chest. His eyes were darting between hers as if he was thinking of a thousand ways to hurt her, and by the venom in his expression, she was sure he would. Then he released his transformation, the shadows dissipating, claws vanishing so it was the pale skin of his fingers gripping her. And they stared at each other for a long time. His chest was heaving, his jaw locked, and she was sure she looked similar. She felt similar. But then, suddenly that feeling fell off a sharp cliff in lieu of something else entirely. The pain she'd felt, the magical wound carved into her soul again and again as she healed Grayson for hours, it scratched its way to the surface like a rabid beast. With tears in her eyes, she tried to smother the horror of what she'd done to herself but it was so raw, the wounds so open. What are you doing? 
Her voice was breathless. Silas stepped closer to her curiously, and she could feel that tug, the desire for him to be nearer. It's wrong, a tiny part of her brain whispered. Louder, though, were the voices begging him to come closer, begging him to heal this pain. I'm not doing anything, he whispered, curiosity burning in his eyes. He reached up to her with his other hand, thumb grazing her cheek. It felt like cool water upon a blistering sun. She reached up before she could stop herself, pressing his palm against her skin. Don't let me go. She wanted to say those words. His touch was somehow sealing those cracks, and she was afraid of the abyss that would swallow her up when he let her go. It's your magic calling this time. He withdrew his touch from her cheek, but he still gripped her wrist, if much more loosely now. A tremor went through her, something desperate and agonized. He must have seen it in her eyes because his grip tightened again. He took a step back, tugging her gently with him, and then sat in the corner of the couch. His hand, suspended between them, slipped to her fingers and then turned palm up. An invitation. She didn't really even know what it meant, and she tried to read the look in his eyes, but they were blank. She shouldn't accept it. Every rational part of her mind was alight with that warning. But that hollow pit was burning, burning, burning. Briar stepped toward him, sliding onto the couch at his side, desperate not to break their touch. He tugged her closer, pulling her into an embrace. She didn't fight it. It was what she needed, and she couldn't be sure how he'd known that. The warmth of his touch began cooling that wound. They just sat there for a long time, one of his hands entwined in hers. The other laced through a few of her curls, pressing her cheek against his chest, and the cracks began to seal. She could hear the beat of his heart. He smelled like nutmeg and pine trees, not something she'd ever focused on when his intent was to sink his fangs into her. It was a long time before he spoke. There's an irony to this, after what you said. His voice was a breath in her ear. That I'm worthless? His thumb caressed her cheek. She tensed. Yes, Grayson is the reason you're broken, and I'm the only one who can fix it. The tone shifted jarringly. She pushed herself up slightly, turning to him knowing what she'd find. There was malice, and something victorious dancing in his eyes. What would he say if he could see you now? Silas asked her. For the first time, words failed her completely. If she thought she'd felt at his mercy before, it was nothing to now. He could see the expression on her face, though. I'm not forcing you to stay, he said. He tugged his fingers free, and she flinched, her whole body tensed in fear. She knew what was waiting for her, that cavern splintering again. He smiled as he let her continue clinging to his hand. You're really sick, you know that? She whispered. Is that right? He asked. You have this broken thing inside you, Briar, and you can't heal it yourself. You're at the mercy of someone else. Someone who hates you for what you are. He leaned in closer, holding her gaze so full of loathing. Taunts you and plays games and makes you feel like nothing. He reached up, fingers splaying along her cheek, and she couldn't stop the hitch in her breathing as he renewed his touch. Is that what makes me sick? She swallowed, biting her tongue. The worst of his words were dull compared to the hollowness within her. Her brain just wasn't working right. Last time he treated her like this, she'd stabbed him in the chest without hesitation. But now, now she was just so tired. 
After Grayson, she felt like she'd been shattered into a million pieces. I've never seen this side of you, little vixen. So much quieter. His thumb traced along her chin. So much more submissive. She flinched. This is what you want? To punish me for last night? She asked. Does it make you feel better? His eyes darkened. The depravity in his expression. It was as if she was looking at a different person. His fingers on her chin tightened. Infinitely. And she believed him. Once more, he left her with the feeling that there was a gigantic piece of the puzzle she was missing. His hatred of her, after she denied him her blood last night, had sunk to new depths. He dropped his touch from her face, leaving her clutching his other palm. There was another long, long silence in which he seemed to weigh her. You still want to stay, he said finally. A statement, not a question, and there was an edge of cruelty in his tone. She hated her answer, hated that, despite what he was saying, all she felt was panic that he'd leave. She just nodded. I'll stay as long as you want me, he said. Why? Her voice was dry. The longer I stay, the more time you have to contemplate what a bond like this can do to a person. He traced a circle on her palm. You and Grayson have that now. Think about that every time you're with him. Briar's blood went cold. This is not what it's like between me and Grayson. Maybe. Silas smiled again. Not for you. Chapter 14 I'm not joking. What did he do to you? Grayson's voice was low and full of rage. He didn't do anything. Briar pleaded. I just need to be alone. She'd returned to her rooms after a long time on that couch with Silas, when she'd healed enough that letting go of him didn't feel like a knife in her chest. She'd stood in front of her own dorm, twisting her cloak in anxious hands for minutes on end, knowing she couldn't leave Grayson waiting for her. Did he hurt you? Grayson moved closer, sitting beside her on the bed reaching to touch her shoulder comfortingly. She flinched away, and he withdrew. She finally forced herself to look into his eyes, and it was like being gutted, seeing the pain in them. He couldn't touch her, not anymore. She was dirty, tainted. She had fallen into Silas's arms. She bit down on the scream of rage at that thought. Once Grayson was gone... She'd be able to scream all she wanted. Please let me in, Briar. She said nothing. She couldn't look at him, and it felt like her heart was cleaving in two. But then she had no right to feel like that, because it had all been a lie. She'd felt close to him, but Grayson was tied to her. His response wasn't real or willing. Finally he stood. This isn't over. I won't let him do this to you. To us. He didn't. She still couldn't meet his eyes. She bit her lip. It's not about him. I won't let this go without a fight. Not helpful, Grayson. He stormed from the room. True to his word, Silas stayed as long as Briar had wanted him and he'd ridden that high for as long as she'd remained curled up in his arms. The innocent act was a marker of his vengeance, an incongruity he wasn't unaware of. But he hadn't felt guilty, reclaiming something from the woman who'd forced him to kill again. But then he'd sat in silence on that couch, exactly as she'd left him, rigid, for what felt like forever. For the second time, Briar had needed him in order to become whole. 
she had offered him the power he'd always wanted, and for the second time it had left him feeling hollow. He pulled a veil of stealth over himself as he made his way up to his dorm so that no one would bother him. He barely looked up until he was almost there, and then he froze. Venom seeped into his blood at the sight of the man standing at his door. After last night, it was hard to see Grayson without thinking of... of her. Black, silken hair tumbled around ashen skin. Blood seeped slowly into tall grass. Her neck was crooked in a hauntingly unnatural angle. He couldn't go back there. Every second was an effort to take a step further from that day. And he hadn't killed this rodent over it because he'd decided he didn't deserve it. Just. And only because Grayson was much more stupid than he was vindictive. But how much of a role had he played last night? Briar denied he had, but she also cared for him. He watched Grayson for a while. His stealth enough to keep him from Grayson's periphery. The man stood before their dorm door, neck hunched. He raised his fist to knock, then stopped drawing away. He tried again and failed. Fucking coward. Grayson ran his fingers through his hair, finally moving away from the door, but once more he stopped. Silas watched as he rubbed the spot over his heart, his breathing increasing. He settled for pressing his back against the wall next to the door and sinking down, burying his head in his hands. And this coward had ever thought himself worthy of... of her? He wasn't even worthy of Briar. Silas leaned against the wall opposite Grayson and dropped his stealth. I assume you are looking for me? Silas asked. Grayson didn't jump but his hands dropped quickly as he stared up at Silas. His eyes sparked with rage. He picked himself off the ground, pointing a shaking finger at Silas. What did you do to her? he asked. Right. So his fear of knocking on their door was for Axel. Silas snorted at that thought. The man really had a way of getting people so mixed up they couldn't determine where the next threat came from. Grayson thinking the snort was at his words, found the courage to approach Silas. But then Grayson didn't know who he was or how the two of them had been tangled. He knew Axel. Everyone back home had known Axel, after a fashion. And he hated Axel. But Silas had been invisible. Stupid, not brave, Silas thought again, as Grayson drew himself up. They were the same height, but his magic was mediocre. What do you need from Briar? Grayson asked. Silas felt his demon lift its head, not in the same way it had the other night, more so in the way it had when Locke had been after Briar. Axel had taken to calling them his vamp tantrums, or vamptrums, because he was a really fucking mature dude. But it was a part of his transformation that Silas didn't always mind, because when it stirred, it always felt quite thrilling and it really, really didn't like Grayson getting all protective over Briar. If she wants to tell you, she'll tell you, Silas said. Well, no, she bloody well wouldn't, but taunting Grayson made him feel better. What did you say to her? Why do you think I said something to her? After she got back from that meeting with you, she won't... He cut off unwilling to go on. Silas felt satisfaction at that. Briar had pushed him away after all. Can't help you if I don't know what your problem is, Steele. You act like a little boy with a crush. Grayson's lip curled. I don't get the impression you'd help me if I came begging. Silas quirked a smile, and the retort slipped past his lips before he could stop it but I helped you when she came begging. As fun as that taunt was, the memory that came with it was jarring. He couldn't cleanse himself of the way Briar had been pressed up against Grayson's dying body, weeping for him. And what she'd done to herself, 
what Silas had just spent hours healing. The place her magic was held, it had been a raw, vile crevice of space, its walls carved out almost to the point of non-existence. Torture. And she'd given that to Grayson Steele. I don't like the way the two of you treat her. Silas picked at his nail, not looking at the man. Now that his mind had wandered there, it was hard to shake the thought of Briar curled up in his own arms. His, not Grayson's. And you wasted it, a little voice said, making her feel small. Silas blinked as a lump rose in his throat. Definitely not rational. He needed to rebalance after yesterday. It was getting to him. He forced his eyes back to Grayson. If I were you, he said, sinking into the much more familiar feeling of vindictiveness, I'd be much more concerned about the way Axel treats you after last night. Grayson paused, his eyes calculating. How do you know Axel? Hmm, this could get dangerous. You're really all over the map, mate, Silas said. What do you mean? You act like you've known him for years, Grayson pushed on. But I've never seen you before. Should you have? You didn't grow up on our side of town. Never saw you at the palace. The palace? Silas asked, as if he had no idea what he was talking about. But Grayson was too intent, too searching. Silas could practically see the cogs turning. The kid, Morin Lance, threw himself off the tallest tower last night. Did you hear? Grayson asked. Oh, fuck. You know, Silas asked, this conversation is feeling a bit one-sided. He stepped past Grayson. A girl at the palace did the same thing a little while back. Don't react. Silas strode to his door. Fancy that, he said. Two people commit suicide throwing themselves off buildings, unheard of. Then he shut the door in Grayson's face. Double fuck. This was it, though. The reason Silas could tell Briar nothing until after the trial. There were secrets that could not get into the hands of Grayson Steele. Silas had to be more careful than he'd just been. Unfortunately, he would have to amend his previous assessment of the man. He was not quite as stupid as Silas initially thought. Dear Maddie, I don't know how I'm going to make this work with Silas but I have to. I was never supposed to survive the potion. It's why I can't do amplification magic. I just know it. He's right. I need all the help I can get. But I hate him. I hate them both for what they've done. I can't keep my head straight, not when I think of what Grayson went through because of me. I've ruined it again. Cost him so much, just like I cost you everything. You were right. I never should have let him in. Briar. Chapter 15 Amplification One of the five instinct magics. Physical amplification alters strength and speed. Sensory amplification alters the six senses. Sensory amplification, unlike bolstering, is a rare ability even to those with access to instinct magic. Silas wandered the forest that night after his meeting with the warden. Unlike other students, it didn't matter if he crossed the protection spell, as he couldn't bond to another demon, and he wouldn't die to one either. He told himself he needed a walk, but truthfully, he was searching for something. It was the thing that gave him peace like nothing else did, that healed him more than Briar's blood or any signy. The thing that made him feel, for just a few fleeting seconds, like he didn't need to carry so much of this guilt. Let me take it, a gravelly voice whispered in his ear. He jumped as a Vok appeared in his periphery. The eight-foot demon materialized beside him. It had a papery, tattered black cloak, spindly arms, and hands made of aspen twigs. 
Its white mask had an expression of open-mouthed rage painted upon it upside down, as if by a juvenile. It craned its neck in unnaturally jerky movements, peering at him. Give me your guilt, Silas. The offer had been made, which meant he could send it on its way. Fuck off. He certainly wasn't here for a valk, a creature that preyed on the vulnerable, offering to steal away unwanted emotions for a devastating cost. Out here past the protection spell, gateway energy, energy demons consumed to manifest, was dense. The academy was closer to the dusk wall than Karenfort, and the demons here weren't fighting to appear like they did in the cities. Vaguely, he wondered if that challenge was why spirit demons used Valk as anchors. Could demons evolve? From what he read about the things that spawned at the breach, they might well. The Valk at his side hunched, sadly, then vanished into thin air. He realized he'd come full circle. Before him was the white glowing line among trees and grass that marked the edge of the protection spell. He wanted to try one last thing before returning. He shifted into his beta form, hoping the powers saturating the world around him would be enough. He stood for a long moment. I know you're here. There was nothing but darkness and the sound of branches rustling in the light breeze above. Silas was about to return to the protection spell when the light cascaded around the forest. He turned, seeing it was like taking a breath of air after being underwater. The Theos Atlan stood before him, his Atlan. Antlers of light reached up into the trees, its fox eyes blinking as it took him in. It should only be able to manifest for its calling, but Silas had found that demons followed their own rules, or perhaps rules humans weren't yet familiar with this Atlan could manifest for something else. Silas sat against a tree as he basked in the Atlan's light. It had come for the bastardization of his power like the Vic had, but they were two opposing demons and had very different responses to him. The Atlan sank down onto the ground, curling up around him like a crescent moon, resting its head on its paws and closing its eyes. Silas sat, for who knows how long, until the light faded and he was left alone once more. The fear Briar felt was different this time. Nothing had been the same since what happened to Grayson. She hated to admit that this time Axel had found leverage she'd not fight him on, because Briar had fallen for a guy, hard. Even if, after what Silas had told her about healing, she couldn't be with Grayson right now. But also, because the brutality he'd been subjected to haunted her. She also didn't want to have to heal him again, not if she wanted anything between them to be real. She felt a flush creeping up her neck as Grayson set his tray in front of her at the dinner table that evening. You're in a hurry, Grayson noted. Got training tonight with... She cut off reluctant to say Silas's name. Grayson's beautiful ice-blue eyes darkened anyway. His jaw ticked, and he looked down at his plate of peas and chicken. She hated how much it hurt him, hated how he tensed every time Axel entered a room, or how he tried to hide that from her. Look, I know you said you didn't want to talk about Grayson. Hear me out, please. I'm worried. The concern in his eyes was fixed on her with such need. Okay, fine. I just... I don't trust him at all. I think he's hiding a lot from the rest of the school. I knew Axel before all of this, but I've never seen Silas before. What are you getting at? Those two don't act like they've just met. You knew Axel that well? We... Grayson looked torn. I would have known his best friend. He's always been a loner, as far as I knew. I still don't know how that matters. Grayson clasped his hands together, not meeting her eyes. Tell me, she pushed. Is it possible that Silas 
had something to do with the suicide? How? Briar asked. A chill ran down her spine at the reminder of what had happened that night. I don't know. Like, was it a suicide, really? We don't know what creature he's bonded to. A shadow vampire? What does that mean? It was a suicide. Briar's voice was quiet. She'd seen the evidence of the Theos Vic. But, but something nagged at her about the entire night. How murderous Axel had been when he'd seen it. Like, like somehow it was her fault. And that made little sense. What about his magic? We know nothing of what he can do. And you're putting yourself in a room with him every week? Grayson asked. Do you blame me for being worried? Briar smiled slightly. It's sweet, to be honest. Grayson snorted, but the silence settled around them again. He's not going to hurt me, she said finally, which might be a stretch. Silas didn't want her dead, but he was literally a blood-sucking predator. You're right, though. We don't know anything about his power or what his demon is. It'll make me feel better if we actually knew what we were up against. Okay, well, how about this? Briar reached out and took his hand in hers, squeezing it reassuringly. I'll use my time down there to see what I can figure out. If we find out what his demon is, maybe we can use it against him. Grayson nodded slowly, his touch absently tracing along her forearm, and the feeling of his thumb caressing her skin was enough to send another swoop through her stomach. She felt so comfortable with him. Her nerves settled, and the voices that haunted her quieted when he was around. Just, just don't do anything that will make him angry, he said. I don't. His voice shook slightly. His grip tightened on her arm. He can hurt you so easily. I'm going to be okay she said with a reassuring smile she didn't feel. But I should go. She was dreading tonight, but best to get it over with. As she made her way down to the potions room, she couldn't help but to think about what was between her and Grayson. How long should she wait before the healing thing was no longer a problem? She didn't dare to hope for it, but it seemed like he cared about her beyond what he'd felt that day and she cared about him, fiercely. When she arrived in the potions room, Silas was sprawled out on the couch. She tried not to think about the last time she'd been in this room with him, but that evening had crept into her dreams every night that week. She blushed as she recalled his fingers woven through her hair, the warmth of his chest, and the beating of his heart in her ear. Right. When he saw her, he sat up, planting his feet on the ground. I was thinking this week we could... Wait, Briar interjected. I need to... I need to know Grayson won't get hurt again. Talk to Axel. I never touched him. There was something challenging in his expression. Briar imagined that conversation, gritting her teeth. My deal is with you, not Axel, she said. Silas crossed his arms a spark of amusement dancing in his eyes. Your deal? He snorted. Is that our new code for bailing your ungrateful ass out once again? Briar's cheeks heated. And now you're adding more terms to your deal, Silas laughed. It figures, coming from you. Carefully, slowly, Briar stood. Dealing with how they'd treated her since the beginning of term had been one thing. It had crept up on her, diluted by a million external fears. After what happened to Grayson, though, everything was crystal clear. Last week, she'd still been in shock, but now she'd had a week to think about it. Silas was watching her with incredulous curiosity, as if he was expecting her to do something stupid. She just walked toward the door. He muttered a curse. Where are you going? he called after her. You need these lessons, you know it. He cussed again, and his footsteps caught up to her. He pushed the door shut, standing in her way. 
Could you stop playing games? he asked. I'm getting whiplash trying to keep up with them. Games? she asked, her voice hollow. Grayson almost died. Silas shook his head, his eyes narrowed. We're going to pretend you weren't acting like a total idiot before that? It's easy. Don't do something stupid and everything works out. For you, you mean, she asked. But he gave her a bewildered expression. No, for you. Don't be an idiot and you get half my magic. Nothing works out for me. I get nothing from this deal. Wow. And she realized it was really how he saw this. You know I don't want your stupid fucking magic, right? She asked. If I could redo this. And it was true. They had reduced her to something so small and pathetic, she'd never want her father seeing what she'd become here. You'd have died. Maybe. Maybe not. It still wasn't worth this. Silas looked bemused. You'd have risked death rather than taken my power if you got a redo. It's just about the power for you, isn't it? She asked. And suddenly everything made a lot more sense about him. Everything's about power in the end. And he just sounded so sure that Briar actually laughed, though it felt dangerously close to a sob. I'm a fucking person, she said. You know that, right? She waved a hand in front of his face. You treat me like I'm worth so much less than you. You... But he cut himself off, his expression twisting with annoyance. What? she asked. Go on, say it. We both know you're thinking it. He shrugged. I came here for a reason, and it's bigger than me. It's more important than whatever sorry reason you dragged yourself to this godforsaken place. Briar's fingers closed around the hem of her cloak again. There it was. The thing that had drawn out the tension between them for so long. Right. So, yes. You are just more important than me. Take that however you want to, he sighed. But mark me when I say I'll do anything to get what I want. Except treat me like a human being. I asked for a few simple things. I don't know what your problem is, Briar. Who raised you? She demanded, a surge of incredulity seizing her. She ignored the surprise on his face. Most people ask nicely when they want something. She stepped right up to him. You demand it when it's not owed to you and jump straight to bullying it out of me when I don't like that. She jabbed a finger into his chest. You should be ashamed of yourself, she spat, both you and Axel. She took a step back, realizing what a waste of time this was. You're all the same, aren't you? Too high born for the rest of the world. We're just here to kneel or serve or, or be collected. Silas's eyebrows drew down slightly, but his expression was unreadable as he gazed at her. Briar wanted to leave, to shove past him, and show him she'd rather risk doing the trial on her own than spend another moment tied to him. Because she would, in a heartbeat, make that trade. Except, her chest felt like it was caving in. I just... I just want him left out of it. Her voice was barely a breath. If it was only her, it would be different but they knew what Grayson meant to her now. They stood in a long silence. Silas finally scratched his chin, his eyes uncertain for a flash. I... Silas didn't sound angry, as she'd been expecting. He sounded more tired than anything. I don't think that you'd have been any more willing if I'd just come and asked you. What if you told me what this all-important thing is, then? Why don't you tell me why you need your magic and my blood every week? Why? he asked, exasperated. Why do you deserve my secrets, Briar? She paused, his words somehow hitting true. She sighed. I suppose I don't. He blinked, 
off balance at that response. So what now? He stepped away from the door. Are you going to go? I need to know Grayson won't get hurt. Why? Are you planning on ducking out on me again? He seemed on edge. I need your word. Silas sighed, returning to the couch. I can't promise you a damn thing when it comes to Grayson. He threw himself onto it, watching her. Briar frowned. It wasn't good enough, not even close. She followed him across the room. It's not a hard ask. It's not so simple. Why not? Because... He took a breath. What happened between Axel and Grayson might not be entirely to do with you. Briar stared at him, a thousand different feelings swirling within her. Panic, insecurities, a guilty relief. He said he knew Axel from before. I don't understand. If I tell Axel to leave off because you asked, he's going to think Grayson... Silas trailed off, looking uncomfortable. He's going to think Grayson is using you for protection. Briar was acutely aware that Silas wasn't meeting her eyes. And that's what you think, too, she asked. This conversation was going sour fast. I don't know Grayson personally. Silas rubbed his chin. But after what you did for him the other night, would it really be a bad bet? I thought Axel attacked him because of what I did. He left him in my room. Her words caught at that memory, and she had to clench her teeth to shove back the tears. Silas chewed on his lip. Has Grayson told you how he knew Axel? No. Well, let's just say that there's been a time past where Axel wanted Grayson dead. So what, he enrolls in the academy the same year? Dumb luck, Silas shrugged but there was something else skulking in the back of his eyes, something he wasn't saying. Why did Axel want him dead? Briar asked. Silas's eyes darkened, but he tucked his hands behind his head and shrugged. Grayson's not too fond of me. Do you think he'd like it if I started telling you his secrets? Silas asked. Briar narrowed her eyes. Fine. She sat down in the armchair. But Grayson isn't using me. He hadn't asked her to protect him. That had been her decision. Right, Silas shrugged. Because he doesn't seem scared shitless of Axel or anything. Briar resented that. He's not a coward, she muttered. He didn't tell Axel anything that night. Did he know where you were? Briar wrinkled her nose. Well, no. He's not using me. Okay, whatever you say. Shall we get studying then? He asked. If we have everything else squared away. Briar ran her tongue along her teeth. Guess so. Dear Maddie, we all have a reason we came. A reason dark enough we'd risk death for. And we all sat in that hall in the basement of this academy. We all saw them drag the bodies away. No matter how close we get to one another, those reasons hang above our heads like dark clouds. I love him, but I'm afraid of his reason. I suppose he might be afraid of mine, too. Sometimes I want to tell him, but then it feels like I'd be carving my heart out. I'm not ready to be that vulnerable. Guess it just means I stay lonely. I've been lonely ever since you left. Briar Chapter 16 Briar trained alone in the pits that evening. It was the weekend tomorrow, and it was raining heavily as Bronick faded for the autumn month of rain. She was dreading the weekend. It had too many silent hours to pass. Though she still spent time with Grayson, it was different. She was torn between the longing she felt to fall into his arms and the fear of what that would mean. She hadn't been able to sleep well since the night Morin Lance had died. That had been a week and a half ago. 
Briar leaped from one platform to the next with determination. She had no problem scaling the walls now, even wet. She had no issue getting around the complete loop of the course, in fact. She did it over and over, as if the pain in her lungs would burn away her racing fears. When she closed her eyes, she was back in that nightmare, holding on to Grayson, begging him to survive a little longer. Speak to Axel. That's what Silas had told her. But her mind frayed when she thought of him. She remembered what he'd done to Grayson. She thought of the brutality of it, the rage and cruelty he'd committed. She'd gone over what she might say to him again and again. How she might beg or threaten or shout. But when she saw him in class, in training, or around the academy, her mind went blank. Briar hauled herself atop the wall as movement caught her eye, and then almost fell. Even wet slicked, Axel's red hair was clear in the faint light of the weak torches and moonlight as he took the steps down into the pit below. It was late, ridiculously late. The moon was high in the sky, and Briar was only still out because she couldn't contemplate sleep until she was so tired she'd be in dreams the moment her head touched the pillow. That took a heck of a lot these days. Axel's boots squelched in the deep mud as he made his way to one of the low platforms. He hauled himself onto it and sat, legs dangling. He folded his arms, peering up at her. He wasn't even wearing a cloak, just a black button-up that stuck to his skin in the cold rain. Call me surprised, but you're getting pretty good. Fuck him. Her heart thundered in her chest as she dropped to the mud and approached him. What do you want? she asked. This is your chance. Don't be a coward. Do something. I need to talk to you about Grayson, he said. Grayson's name on his tongue was like a shot of lightning in her veins. She wanted to scream. She wanted to pull out her knife and drive it into his chest. But he was a monster, and that wasn't enough for real monsters. She walked up the stairs slowly, paying attention to each of their wooden groans as she tried to keep her mind grounded. It was hard. She felt like she was cracking around the edges. For a moment, she was with Grayson again, and she wasn't enough to save him, just like she hadn't been enough to save her father. The wooden boards creaked as she stepped up next to Axel. Petals tumbled to the ground around her, one by one. She sat down next to Axel, close enough that he raised an eyebrow at her. Her father's body crumpled to the wooden floorboards with a thump. That sound had shaken her to the soul, like rattling an old, rusted cage, and she was the fractured, tiny thing inside. Axel had nearly done it to her again. He had nearly made sure she wasn't enough again. She realized he was speaking. That grounded part of her mind, the part paying attention to the way the icy rain hit her skin, heard. Axel had leaned back, resting on his elbows as he spoke. Going to hurt you if you let him close. It was difficult to process those words. That's what he'd come here to say? He came here to give her a warning so she didn't get her heart broken from the man who'd almost shattered it into a million pieces? A laugh slipped from her lips. Axel stopped, peering at her curiously. When she met his eyes, she realized he looked different. Instead of a thousand threats of the smoke and mirrors, he was only one. Any threat between where they were and Grayson's death became dust, scattering in the wind. Come, sit with me, and I'll make you an offer. That voice, a howling shadow from her past, sounded in her ear. He wasn't present, yet he dared her on. Prove to Axel you can match him. He isn't me, after all. Briar pulled her legs from over the side of the platform, that dare in her mind disintegrating every screaming instinct. If you can't, Grayson will never be safe. 
Before Axel could do anything, she'd lifted herself on top of him. She was facing him, her knees touching the wooden floorboards on either side of his legs. As soon as she'd done it, she knew it was a mistake. Theos, she had to... No. What happened last time when you were selfish? What happened when you weren't strong enough? Briar didn't move. Axel straightened where he sat, his eyes suddenly calculating. His hands closed around her hips as she looked up at him, too close. Another flutter of panic tried to grab her attention, but she shoved it away. Her past was whispering real words, spoken once upon a time. All you have to do is be a pretty little thing. She'd made her choice last time, and it haunted her. She closed fingers around his shirt, the cold, wet fabric clutched in her fists. She was holding herself against him, like she'd held onto Grayson. For a flicker, she was back there. Every second her magic had been bound to Grayson's blood was excruciating as she'd shoved it through ruptured veins and collapsing organs. A blade scraped across the barren crevice of her magic pool. Grayson's cold body was below her. One moment more, then another, and another, for hours, until she was nothing but a cracked, broken shell. She couldn't let go, not for one second. Briar was ripped to the present as she felt Axel brush her knife hilt as if checking it was still there. She smiled and leaned close to him. You're a monster, Axel, she said. But you are far too late to be my monster. Her voice was a resolute whisper as she cupped his face between her hands. He didn't move away from her or stop her. You will never threaten him again. She'd been taught by evil worse than him, but it was a language he understood, a language of bluffs and dares, and she'd be crystal clear who'd break first. I'm dying to know why not. His voice was a casual murmur, but his body was still tense as he searched for a threat he couldn't yet find. You have so much power here, Briar. Would you really let your own house suffer for your selfishness? She was so close to being stolen by the past completely. She focused on her goosebumps, on his fingers gripping her waist through her training garb. The slight scar on his cheek over which those desperate fingerprints of blood had smeared. Grayson's pain and terror. It was enough to drive her on, even as her past loomed. I'll be anything you want. That's what she'd said all those months ago. And she'd carved a hole in her soul that day. One she stepped into now. Because. She held Axel's emerald eyes. Directionless magic was wasted as it seeped from her fingertips and into his skin. I have what you want most. Beneath her, she felt Axel tense as Silas's magic flowed, useless, into the surrounding air. Axel narrowed his eyes. How well will that threat hold up after you get your form in the trial? He asked. If I survive it. So... He let out a humorous laugh. I don't touch Grayson, and you won't kill yourself in the trial? His indifference was offset by the rigidity of his body. Briar's lips quirked up. Do you want to know why I came to this academy, mutt? The most dangerous secret from any student. Briar leaned closer still, her fingers caressing the shadow of stubble on his chin as she whispered into his ear. To watch nobles fall like used-up toys. She felt his fingers dig into her flesh where he held her. So I think I win, no matter how we look at it. If I get the slightest sense I won't make it back to Carinfort for my real monsters, I'll settle for Silas as a substitute. She drew away at last, pleased at his alertness. How long do you think he'll last? without his magic. A long silence hung between them as Axel watched her. 
the rain slicked his auburn hair to his forehead. Water trailed down rich skin and drawn, expressionless lips. The light of weak, fluttering torches, their magic fighting the rain, gave off enough light to carve the strong ridge of his clenched jaw. Raindrops clung to his eyelashes as he held her gaze for what felt like forever. As the seconds passed, her mind flickered between screams of her past, calling her further into this abyss and reality, which were claws in her brain causing flutters of absolute panic. There was no way in hell this would be enough. The depravity in his eyes weighed her, a goddamned anchor, promising worse to come. She was screwed. One of his hands let go of her waist, and he tucked a lock of her wet hair behind her ear. She jumped, and his mouth quirked in a half-smile. Guess I don't have a choice then, do I? Uh, she hadn't really thought this far ahead. Did she reply, or act cool? And would he actually leave Grayson alone? She definitely shouldn't say that out loud. She let go of him, leaning back. All of a sudden she was extraordinarily uncomfortable with their proximity. He was still measuring her. One hand was still on her waist with a painful grip. She also became aware, leaning back as she was now, that she'd probably slip right off the platform if he wasn't holding her so tight. She tried not to imagine how embarrassing that would be. Well, he cleared his throat. I'm tapping out. So unless you were planning on coming back to my dorm with me, I don't think so, Briar shuddered. When she tried to climb from on top of him, she almost lost her balance, and his one hand clamped like a vice on her hip bone, steadying her before she fell. Blood heated her cheeks, and she was less than graceful in how she hauled herself to the platform. She dared to glance back, to find a glint of amusement in his eyes, before he dropped to the ground and left. She couldn't move a muscle until he disappeared from view, past the railings above. Then she simultaneously wanted to jump with the thrill of it and throw up all over the mud. She settled for one more circuit of the course. Then she'd see if Grayson was still up. She owed him better than the distance she'd been putting between them the last week. Briar clenched her fists nervously as she stood in front of Grayson's dorm. She knocked quietly enough that he'd only hear if he were awake. She'd passed his roommate around the fire in the gazebo, drinking with a few other students. She waited for a long time, her hope and anxiety warring with one another. Then the door opened a crack and Grayson answered, wearing a loose brown top and baggy trousers for sleeping. What are you doing up at this time? he asked. Then he took her in completely. You were out at the pits all night? Yeah. Briar clutched the inside of her pockets. Thought, if you were up, you might want to hang out. It's the weekend. No point in sleeping until Elijah comes back. He makes a bloody racket. She couldn't stop glancing at him as they made their way down the hallway. What's up with you? He asked as they reached her dorm. Briar shrugged. Good training in the pits. In this rain? He asked. You care if I hop in the shower? She guessed it might be a bit rude to invite him over and then vanish, but Grayson was already rifling through their latest pile of books from the Academy Library. Pryor took a little longer under the hot water, making sure she was warm to the very core. She blinked back images of Axel's face in the darkness. She'd been so afraid he wouldn't listen. But he had. Or at least he'd said he had. When she stepped out of the shower, she pulled her night robe around herself. She pressed her fingers around one of the flickering torches on the wall of her room. She'd found if she pushed the tiniest bit of magic into them, they glowed brighter for a time. Grayson peered up at her as the room lightened, bathing them in warm light. Briar sat down, anxiously clasping her fingers. Okay, Grayson set the book down and turned to her. What's going on? You're acting really weird. Axel won't come near you again, she whispered. Grayson's eyebrows came together, 
What? What did you do? He asked. Briar met his bright blue eyes, nerves careening through her tummy like butterflies. I just... She paused, but there was no point in lying. I blackmailed him. You just did what? I don't want to be looking over my shoulder with you all the time, she said. Whatever's happening between me and him and Silas, it stays there. You have nothing to do with it. But Briar, I want... I want you to be with me, not because of Axel. Those words almost got stuck in her throat. Hey. His hand was suddenly on her cheek. His touch was warm and soft, not the icy grip of Axel just an hour past. That's not what this is anymore, he said quietly. Briar reached up and caught his hand in hers. Silas told me that sometimes you can get a connection with someone if you heal them for too long. She swallowed. I didn't want to be with you because because of some magic bullshit. Grayson's eyes grew hard for a moment. That's what he said. But he's not totally wrong. I looked it up. And I felt something. But I don't think I feel it anymore. Do... She swallowed. Do you? A smile tugged at Grayson's lips. I saw you differently after that day, Vani. His thumb stroked her cheek. But it's not magic. It's because you held on to me in a way no one else had before. He tilted her chin up just slightly, leaning toward her. You're important to me. Briar moved in closer to him, marveling at the way his eyes sparkled in the firelight, the way his skin glowed in the dancing torches around them. And he drew her into a kiss. His lips were so warm as they pressed against hers. She tugged his fingers away from her face, drawing them into her dressing gown, letting it fall open just slightly. Grayson paused as she pressed his fingers against her bare waist. She cupped his cheeks and drew him into an even more passionate kiss. Her blood was set alight as his touch ran along her skin, his other hand coming around her waist, nudging her gown farther apart as he drew her toward him. He finally broke the kiss and leaned back, eyes wide when he realized she was wearing nothing at all beneath the fabric. Briar, I want you, she whispered. She tugged the dressing gown further, so it pooled around her shoulders. Grayson's cheeks were hot, taking in her body before meeting her eyes once more. A smile crept across her face. She took his hands and pressed them back to her waist. She drew him against her again, kissing him deeply. His touch became more deliberate as they explored her body now. Goosebumps exploded across her skin where his fingers brushed. There was another flutter of excitement and nerves in her chest. She hooked under his shirt and he let go of her so he could tug it over his head. The next thing she knew, he'd lifted her, holding her against him as he turned and pressed her against her bed. His hands pressed into the blanket on either side of her shoulders. She reached up, tracing his cheeks, then down to the ridges of muscle along his chest. His eyes were charting her body, a bundle of longing and nerves. Have you... before? Her voice was weak. He nodded. Just with one person? He looked sheepish. You? No. She hoped he wouldn't find that odd. I hope that's okay. Are you sure? He asked. I wasn't like holding on for anything in particular. She giggled. I'm just kind of a loser. She would decided the moment she'd left the pits. Not that she hadn't thought of it with him before, but she'd been too nervous. She'd expected him to laugh at her statement. But he swallowed, his eyes tracing her body again. I... His expression of wonder was probably the most relieving thing she'd ever seen. I don't think you are. He leaned closer, drawing her into a kiss again. He moved down to her jaw, to her neckline, then her collarbone. 
Briar moaned as his lips traced along one of her breasts, his palm brushing against her other. Fuck, she murmured. Heat was making its way into her very core. I want you, Grayson. He paused, leaning away. He was looking at the freckles on her hip, and his bright blue eyes were dark with something. I do know you've got this cluster of freckles on your left hip that look like a Gavina signy. That's what Axel had said weeks ago, taunting her. No, no fucking way was Axel getting in the way of this. But then what was she going to say? There was doubt in his eyes as he met her gaze. She just shook her head. He's never touched me. She sat up beside him, tugging her gown around herself. She reached for his cheek, but he flinched away. Please, she whispered, shame crushing her. She could hear the desperation in her voice. Don't let him be a part of this. Grayson closed his eyes. So many seconds passed that her hope started to fail. I do, he said at last. He looked back at her, and there was so much sorrow in them that it felt like a blow to her stomach. I believe you. When he drew her to him this time, it felt even more loving. His touch was no longer nervous. I want to let you in, Vani. She smiled, lying back, tugging him until he fell into the blankets with her. In this moment, he glowed like the sun, with dancing ice in his anxious eyes. She took his face and kissed him gently. Grayson broke away to move above her again, and then he leaned down, kissing her fiercely. A fire lit within her core as she felt his tongue press along the roof of her mouth, passionate, desperate. She moaned, her grip digging into his sides, trying to tug him against her, needing more. He resisted, though, holding himself above her as one hand vanished from her face. Then it brushed against her stomach, running further down, down, down. Her breathing hitched, a moan deep in her chest as his lips crushed hers and his fingers traced unexplored areas of her body. She arched up as he broke the kiss, leaving her breathless. I need... The whisper slipped from her lips. I need you. He remained above her for a long moment, punishingly still. He held her eyes, biting his lips slightly, as if deciding on something. Then he drew away, his touch grazing the inside of her legs, before he nudged them apart. His lips caressed the skin of her inner thigh, and she tensed, knowing her own eyes were wide. That impish smile was on his lips as he looked up at her. One of his hands clutched her thigh, tugging it down. The other wound around to the spot of freckles on her hips, his finger tracing it as he kissed her again, lower this time. You're the only one, Grayson. Her voice was low, desperate. The hand that had nudged her legs apart was gone suddenly, and she gasped as he slid a finger into her. His other hand clamped down onto her hips roughly, as if to claim that Gavenna signy. I know. And then he lowered his mouth down and onto what had become the axis of her entire body. Her world shattered into a million pieces as all her anxiety collapsed into ecstasy. Chapter 17 You convinced, Axel? Silas asked. She was peering over a textbook next to him on the couch during the next session they had together. Looks like you got your wish on Grayson. He's going to listen? Briar asked, then winced internally at the insecurity in her voice. Silas snorted. The way he told it, you were much more sure. I was. Am. She blurted. It's just Axel. Silas raised an eyebrow. Sure. He told you what I said? She asked. He's not much of a talker. Must have been good, though. Careful, she muttered as she scanned the page. Almost sounded like a compliment. 
Haven't seen Axel back down on something for someone else in a long time. Well, it figures that you're blind to his weakness. His weakness? Silas asked. Briar gave him a flat look. Your bromance costs him more than just his dignity, you know. You leveraged me? Silas asked. Maybe. She eyed him tensely, but Silas shrugged, an air of curiosity in his eyes. So, she turned to the notes in his notebook. The session. You said you did some research on our bond? Best I could, yeah. You know if, after the trial, our magic will still be bound? She asked. Silas shrugged. From everything I've read about remotely close to what we did, and it's not well documented, it's for life. What does that mean? Briar asked. That we should probably be in the same squad come third term. It would be stupid for us not to fight at the wall together. Beyond that, I have no idea. Briar's brain warred against that. In the same squad? That meant she'd be with him all the way through their year at the wall. Somehow she'd been living with the vague assumption that she'd be done with him after the upcoming trial. Now she was realizing how stupid that expectation had been. What would Grayson think when she told him that? This was all getting too real. Silas laughed. I'm not happy about that either. Maybe... Can't we just see closer to the time? Really, it might not be necessary. He shrugged, giving her an, if that makes you feel better, look. What else have you found on it? She wanted to understand more, if she could. No book in the Academy Library had anything about their bond. So, as Rich Nobles did, he'd just ordered one from Carinfort. Well, he leaned against the couch, rubbing his face. Documented similar cases were people trying to forge a bond. I couldn't find any examples of someone who did it by accident. I don't know how many of their observations will translate. And none were concrete. Each bond was slightly different. Observations like what? There's a big emphasis on trust. Bonds are stronger the more you trust each other. But it was always couples, most often married. I just can't be sure that their intention when setting the bond changed it, and that would leave us back at ground zero. What about the... the thing that happens when we... She wrinkled her nose. When we touch sometimes. Yeah, he snorted. Maybe that's why it's only married couples who decide to do something like this. They sat in silence for a long time, Briar staring at the words on the page without seeing them. We're fucked, then. Silas's laugh was hollow. What does your boyfriend think about it? Briar shot him a sharp look. About the other part of the bond? You haven't told him? Silas grinned. What exactly would you suggest I tell him? You know what, I'm glad that's not my problem. What about you? What'll your parents say when you get home? Briar asked, happy to change the subject. Bound to a lowly peasant. Do you have an arranged suitor or something? Nothing like that. Silas's eyes were dimmer. But if we are smart about it, my mother will never find out about this bond. Why? Because she'd use it against me. I really don't think much of your noble woman, Briar muttered. Didn't really think about the meeting the parents thing, though. What about yours? You're in luck. Briar said quietly. None left. Courtesy of another noble woman. Ah. Silas glanced down awkwardly at his book. Sorry. The Duskwall Academy isn't the place you expect healthy, intact family units, though, is it? Guess not. So are you planning on keeping your demon a secret from me for the rest of your life, then? Silas thumbed a page back and forth. I'll tell you everything you need to know if you survive the trial. Why is it a secret? she asked. There were thousands of types of demon out there. His was not a conventional bond, but it was strange that he didn't want people to know. It causes me problems when people know. 
So, it would be a more well-known demon then. Grayson, Briar took a breath, knowing it was a risky topic to bring up. Grayson thinks you had something to do with Morin Lance's death. He told me as much. Silas's voice was tight. But he killed himself. I saw the Vic's mark. Briar side-eyed Silas. He was rigid beside her. You're a vamp, so you have coercion. But coercion can't make someone kill themselves. Silas sighed. If I asked you nicely to leave this be until after the trial, would you listen? No. Well, there we have our data point on how well that strategy works, he grumbled. Hmm. So next it's threats and bullying, right? Briar asked. Silas's lips quirked up. Only if I thought you and Grayson were smart enough to figure it out. He dug in his pocket and drew out a coin made of crystal. Briar narrowed her eyes at it, the thick hexagon shimmering in the candlelight. A sleet coin? she asked. They were a gimmick magic from ice drakes, but their role was very specific. She'd only ever seen them on wedding days. Got it in town last weekend, Silas said. If you leave my secret alone, I'll give you this when you come out of the trial. A drop of his blood on one side, and she'd be able to witness one day of his memories, the worst day of his life. A sleet coin exchange exercised trust. It will give you all the answers you need. Why would you do that? she asked. Because I need this bond to work but I'm not just handing out my secrets to anyone. If you survive the trial, things will be different. We'll still be bound, but it won't be so one-sided anymore. You'll want it back, though. With her blood on the other side, so he'd know her darkest secrets, the idea made her stomach turn. Silas sighed. We can't pretend that this won't be beneficial if we can't both trust each other equally. But it's not a stipulation of the deal. You, Bishop, have come further than any student this term in combat training. Naveen was glancing down at a few notes across her desk. Briar's mood lifted a little at those words. She'd been anxious about it all week. It was midterm evaluations on the tenth week of term, during which they sat down to discuss their goals come the trial. What is your target? Naveen asked. Briar didn't want to admit the truth. I'd like to hear all my options. The problem, Naveen looked back to Briar, clasping her fingers, is your magic. Right, of course. Briar bit her lip, bracing herself for the worst. With the improvements we are seeing in combat, I'd have said you were well on your way to being able to challenge an Eladrin, perhaps even a Drawcurt if we could get your reaction times up. There was a big but coming. Briar said nothing, her heart in her throat. But I can't, in good conscience, recommend such a thing. A drunkard's scales, the Eladrin's crystal inner armor, there is no way you'd be able to pierce them without amplification. There was a long silence. Grayson had been improving at almost the same rate as her, and because he was handy with amplification... They'd told him he'd perhaps even be able to claim a Brock if he put his mind to it. Aside the Valmor, a Brock was the most dangerous demon in the trial and gave the other vampiric form. Fuck. This wasn't fair. A Tixin without a doubt on your trajectory, Naveen was saying. But if you keep putting the work in we've been seeing, I know you'll be able to hand a Luperat. They're fast, but it's a simple dagger to the heart. Briar had known this was coming. It had played out over and over in her dreams last night. In them, Naveen had told her she was so weak that she'd only be able to bond to a cogrot, and then when Briar shifted, she turned into a barnacle. Grayson had to keep her in a little jar on the battlefield when they went to the dusk breach. Briar tried to shake that memory from her head and focus on Naveen. Right. Her voice was dry. I'm sorry, Bishop, but perhaps it's for the best. 
They don't go easy on the stronger transformations at the breach. And if you don't have amplification magic by then, well... She didn't have to finish that sentence. No, I understand. Briar tried not to let her disappointment show on her face as she left. Grayson was jotting down a few notes from their textbook in Demon Studies when he noticed Silas stand in the row to his left. It was a curse, but Grayson couldn't help staying attuned to what the man did. Silas muttered something to Axel and then exited the room. Maybe there would have been nothing suspicious about it, except as Silas stepped through the door, Grayson saw the bright flutter of stealth manifest. Grayson set his pen down and stood. Briar glanced at him. Bathroom, he muttered as he stepped past her. His hand lifted, brushing her shoulder affectionately as he passed. Too much, a voice whispered. But so often he just needed to be close to her. Guilt twisted his gut as he hurried from the room, shoving the tangled, confusing mess that was his relationship with Briar from his mind. If Silas was using stealth through the hallways, he was up to something, and Grayson would find out what. Grayson drew his own stealth around him. He followed Silas along the hall and up the spiral staircase. Grayson almost lost him when he exited out onto the first floor, but then spotted Silas past the balustrade, crouching down beside a flower bed. Around him his stealth swirled, and to Grayson's eyes it was a shimmer of colors. Grayson had been born a vey Leem, a secret seeker. He could see stealth magic like a beacon. It was a modest ability that served him best when it remained a secret itself. He watched as Silas brushed a few fingers through the flowers until he snapped the head from a sprig of lavender. Silas stood and returned to the colonnade, only a few paces from where Grayson remained veiled. The man had a strange focus, as if he were listening to something. Grayson followed him to the end of the colonnade. Silas paused, stepping in one direction before changing his mind and going in the other. Then he moved quickly, striding down hallways until they entered the dining room. Grayson slipped around the edge of the hall as Silas strode through the center, heading straight for the kitchens. Grayson waited at the wooden door, hoping that whatever Silas was doing inside wasn't the end of his journey. There were too many eyes in the kitchen for it to be worth him going inside. He'd surely be noticed despite his stealth, something Silas clearly didn't care about. He waited silently as a minute ticked by, wondering what on earth the man was doing with lavender and a trip to the kitchens mid-class. Was it a recipe for some sort of potion? And why now? To his relief, Silas emerged from the kitchens through the same door he'd entered, though to add to Grayson's confusion, Silas had a mug of steaming tea in his hand. Is he pranking you? A little voice wondered. Does he know you're following him? Grayson left a few more paces between them as Silas ascended the spiral staircase. It was brighter up here, and Grayson carefully slipped through the closing door behind the man as they entered the second-floor dorm hallways, thankful the ancient, heavy doors of the academy shut so slowly. Silas turned a corner, and Grayson was glad he'd peered around at first. Silas stopped by a window and set the mug of tea and a sprig of lavender on the stone sill. From his pocket, Grayson saw him pull a piece of paper and a small pen. Silas sucked on the nib. He wrote something, then scratched it out before fishing in his pocket for another piece of parchment. This time he took longer before scrawling something down. He folded it and fished in his pocket one more time, drawing out a thin object wrapped in cotton. Silas opened it and broke something small and dark from the slab before tucking it back into his robe. Was that chocolate? All of Grayson's spiraling ideas about potions and magic dropped from his mind. Was this for a girl? Had he caught Silas ducking out of class to write a love note? And did that mean he wasn't interested in Briar after all? Grayson felt a burst of hope. He knew Briar hated the noble, but it still bothered him that they spent so much time alone. Silas gathered everything up and walked down the hall before bending and setting it carefully before a door. 
Silas stood, then stared at the arrangement. Quickly, he ducked down and adjusted the sprig of lavender. Then he straightened and rapped on the door. To Grayson's surprise, Silas turned and hurried from the hallway. Grayson was tucked in the shadows, perfectly still, so Silas didn't see him as he passed. Grayson didn't follow him this time, more interested in who would answer. It creaked open, and Venus Donovan peered out, which was strange because she should be in class right now. She first glanced down the hallway, her figure hunched and tense before her gaze dropped to the floor. She crouched down by the arrangement, reaching for the sprig of lavender. Even from here, Grayson could see that her hand trembled. Venus examined it before reaching for the note, holding it as if it would burn her. When Venus finally unfolded the paper and read it, she burst into tears. Her knees hit the stone and she leaned against the doorframe. Great, racking sobs shook her body as she clutched the note to her chest. From what Grayson knew of Silas, he was a brute and a bully, and making a girl cry was far from beyond him. But something about this situation was unsettling. Why chocolate and tea? Was it a taunt? Perhaps a threat? Grayson felt his blood chill at the thought. Dark threats in beautiful wrapping. That was how Axel worked, after all. Venus, though not a noble, was high-born. It was certainly possible she knew Silas from before the academy. Had Silas noticed she wasn't in class and assumed something? Grayson watched Venus cry against the doorframe until steam no longer rose from the mug. Chapter 18 I need to give you actionable ways to beat the Valmor. Silas was exasperated as he held out the bracelet. There were four and a half weeks until the trial, and they were running out of solutions. Briar folded her arms. What is the big deal? he asked. It was the tenth time they'd met for a lesson in the potions room. She had her wild hair up in a messy bun as usual and wore that odd patchwork cloak she favored in the evenings with its mismatched patches and colors. I don't know why you need it. Her voice was tight. You've seen me use magic in class. He'd asked to check the readings of her magic on the quartz bracelet, and she'd flat out refused. Why is this such a big deal? You're supposed to be wearing it as much as possible for the wisp ceremony in term two anyway. He'd never seen her wear it, though, and Silas had an idea of why. She was weak in glint magic, and he'd still never seen her use amplification. Just put it on. He tossed her his bracelet, and she caught it instinctively. No. She threw it back at him. Then leave. There's no point to our lessons if you won't bother cooperating. He'd drunk her blood at the beginning of the lesson, something she'd suggested since it put him in a better mood. So it didn't matter to him if she left. She narrowed her eyes. Show me yours first. No, that was just ridiculous. Briar straightened, frowning. Why not? Because my magic doesn't matter. Yours does. She stood and approached him. Show me. He raised an eyebrow at her tone, his sensitive pride warring with the little swoop in his stomach at the sight of her crossed arms and daring eyes. He was suddenly very aware of her closeness, barraged with a landslide of images and memories. He recalled holding her on this very couch, his fingers woven through loose tangles of her blonde hair as she lay against him. He could almost feel her hand clutching his as he'd felt her wound slowly heal because of him. He sighed dramatically. Only because it will make you shut up. And certainly not because she'd told him so. He slipped the leather bracelet around his wrist and pushed magic into it. Amplification magic lit up like an orange beacon, glint not far behind. Atmospheric was moderate, and stealth only a faint glow. The healing stone remained dull and white. He didn't look up at her 
as he took it off and held it out. I knew it, she hissed. And Willow made fun of me for being weak at a type of magic? Right. He glanced up at her at last with an incredulous expression. I might accidentally tear your arm off, and if I do, I can't fix it. Sounds like the right guy to make fun of. She wrinkled her nose again, glaring. As she sat down beside him, his heart began beating faster. She slid the bracelet on, and he kept his eyes trained on the stones. When it lit up, all he could stare at was the vibrancy of her healing stone. Absolute power. But then his eyes fell on her amplification stone. It was completely blank. That was what she hadn't wanted to show him. This explained a heck of a lot. She had half of his magic pool, and he'd been confused why she was struggling so much. While there were distinctions he couldn't find answers to regarding biomages, one thing seemed the same across all mage types. Magic pool and magic power were separate. So he'd wondered if, while she had access to his magic, she just didn't have the power to make good use of it. This proved otherwise, though. Briar was bloody powerful, like he was. It just presented differently. Actually, it presented as his complete opposite. Best not to mention this to Axel. The man already had ideas in his head about what was going on with her, and it would send him into a spiral if Silas brought it up. Theos? Silas leaned back on the couch, fingers pressed to his temples. He'd known she struggled with amplification, but to have none. And you still want to go for the Valmore? I need it. Her voice was quiet as he straightened at her side. She removed the bracelet and returned to the armchair facing him. He tried not to focus on the way the space next to him felt empty. You know, on the other side of this, you'll be a powerful mage, even if you bond a Tixin. What in the bloody dusk sun did she think she'd be facing that needed such power? Her jaw was set, though, her lips drawn as she held his gaze. It's the Valmore, or it's nothing. I know you're putting in the time. That was indisputable. She was working harder than anyone else in the school, and it was showing. You're improving in combat. You're a match for most of the class in the pits. But Valmore have an exoskeleton you won't be able to crack without amplification. It doesn't matter how strong you get. Why am I here, if you are just going to tell me the same as Naveen? Briar asked. Silas hadn't dared to ask her what she'd been told during midterm evaluation. So far these sessions have been more about our bond than me getting the Valmore. Have you got anything to offer me? If you don't, I could use this time better. I wouldn't have offered if I couldn't help you. He tried not to sound bitter. She didn't know the things he and Axel had done before the Academy to discover obscure magic, to find a solution for his form. If Briar wanted unusual solutions, be they legal or not, he was the best person here for her. Well? She lifted an eyebrow. I can get you amplification magic. He'd been reluctant to suggest this, but they were running low on time. She straightened, her eyes narrowing. How? You won't like it. What? It involves Axel. No point sugarcoating it. Even if Axel had offered already, Silas hated the idea of it. Silas had wanted to avoid it if possible, but her quartz reading was indisputable. It was the best option they had. Briar's cheeks, that were flushed from her embarrassment from the quartz bracelet reading, paled at Axel's name, but there was still determination in her eyes. Just tell me what it is. A blood, Signy. Briar's jaw dropped, and she shut it quickly, trying to stifle her shock. You know how to do one of those? Her voice was hushed. No, that's what I'm saying. Axel does. Axel? Her tone was a bit shrill. You want Axel to brand me? No one's forcing you. Briar looked uncertain. 
Only signies like that I've seen are Voira signies. It's not like a Voira signy. He could feel his own grimace at that suggestion. Only you can use it, and just the glyph we choose. Okay. She was still pale. But where did he learn to do that? It's beyond illegal. Ask him. Silas shrugged. Not that he'd tell her. Even Silas had found it hard, getting it out of him, and that was after years. Briar was nervously tapping her skirt, not meeting his eyes. It'll give me amplification? At a cost. Right, because burning a magical symbol into my skin couldn't possibly be cost enough. Even if I give you most of our magic the morning of the trial, it'll take a good two-thirds of your magic pool to use it once, and then it'll only be one kind of amplification. Strength amplification is what you need to crack the Valmore's exoskeleton. Would this be enough to get her to rethink the choice of the demon? She seemed to be considering when she glanced back at him. That's what you need the magic for? What do you mean? Silas could feel his hackles rising. You have a healing, Signy, don't you? Silas ran his tongue along his teeth, knowing there was a sour expression on his face. In a manner of speaking. It had to be a very specific kind of healing to repair the cracks in the barrier between him and his demon to keep it contained. It had taken them an age to identify the signy for it, and even then, it wasn't a reliable solution. She sagged back in her seat, her gaze weighing him again, and he didn't know if he liked it. Somehow she seemed less sharp around the edges. Okay, I'll do it, she said. Not like it matters if it's illegal, right? We're biomages anyway. Axel's Signy brands turn invisible once they're set. You can only see them when you use them. Theos. Briar looked unsettled. He learned that in Karenfort? Silas shrugged. But truth be told, Silas wasn't the only one with enemies in Karenfort. What Axel could do was a bastardization of mage scripts, twisted and corrupted, so it was even accessible to non-mages, or, more specifically, criminals. The payoff may be high, but so is the margin for error, and the cost if errors were made. It was a heavily gated skill, developed over generations, and there were people in the bowels of Karenfort who considered Axel's knowledge of their secrets a threat. I'll talk to him, get it set up. The summer breeze swept up loose wisps of Briar's hair that had fallen from her bun in the pits. She and Grayson were heading down the balustrade after combat class, her hand clutched in his. Did you see me at the end? She asked, doing a little skip. Oakley's face when I reached the platform first? She cut off at Grayson's drawn expression. Oh shit, that's when Naveen paired you with Tamara, right? Damn it. It really had been her best performance yet. I didn't see. Grayson sounded sheepish. Briar narrowed her eyes, taking her hand from his and folding her arms. She was about to make a sarcastic quip when he drew her against him hands coming to her cheeks. I'm so sorry, Vanny. I wish I'd seen it. He was too serious. She laughed, her eyes darting between his curiously. He'd done this enough times that she wanted to get to the bottom of it. It wasn't your fault. I mean, you missed out on me kicking some Voira butt. She gave him an unsure smile. But I'm not mad. She paused. Why do you do that? Do what? You over-apologize with stuff like that, like you're worried I'm going to blow up on you. I guess. He scratched his head. I just don't want you to be upset. Do I usually get really upset or something? She didn't think she did. No, I don't know. She slipped her hand back into his as they kept walking. Are you worried I'll be mad because you partnered with another woman? 
when he got like this, it did usually involve other female classmates. Shouldn't you be? Mad? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if you thought it meant something. Oof. Briar looked at him quizzically as they stepped into the academy hallways toward the stairs. You think I'm that insecure? she asked. His face actually paled. Okay, back this up. She tugged on his arm, drawing him against her, and pulled him back a step, so she was against the stone wall of the hallway. What's going on? I'm not trying to freak you out. His hands laced around her waist, his eyes trying to gauge her. I'm not mad, Grayson. I'm just confused. I think... Maybe I don't entirely know what this is supposed to look like. Okay. She bit back a smile, the frown on his face and the cute crease of his eyebrows melting her. How about we start at the beginning, then? If you don't know how I feel about something, ask me. Whatever I say, we go with. He bit his lip, fighting back his own smile. Sounds simple enough? If it doesn't work, we reevaluate. All right? Briar leaned up and gave Grayson a kiss. He returned it, hesitant at first, despite the few passers by. Then he took her face in both of his hands and drew her against him, more passionate now. When he let her go at last, she had to catch her breath. I really fucking like you, he whispered. You know that? She beamed at him butterflies stirring in her stomach. Then it collapsed as she heard an unwelcome voice. She has a room, you know that? Axel had just turned the corner and was approaching them. Briar felt the briefest tightening of Grayson's grip at her waist before he released her, turning. Axel leaned against the wall next to them both. What do you want? Briar asked bitterness in her voice at the sight of him. She slid her fingers back into Grayson's grip, noting his tension. Axel's eyes were on Grayson. You've been skulking around our rooms. Don't think I haven't noticed. And now, one of our books is missing. A book? Briar asked, incredulous. I have no idea what you're talking about. Grayson's eyes were calculating. Axel gave him a false smile. You've really done a number on her, I get that. But if I don't get that book back by the end of the week... You'll what? Briar's voice was low. Axel had left them alone for almost a month and a half. She felt like she could breathe these days. Axel turned on her. You know, our little deal. Axel's voice twisted slightly as he said that last word doesn't apply when you aren't involved. The fuck it doesn't, Briar snapped. It's all right, Fanny. Grayson's voice was gentle for a moment before he turned to Axel. I didn't take no book, so I can't return it. He shrugged. Do whatever you want. Then he tugged on her hand and led her down the hallway, away from Axel's scowl. With three and a half weeks until the trial, their weekly training was part of Silas's routine. Briar would come into the potions room at eight. Usually he was already present, and today he had been for a while. To say that coming up with a plan that could get Briar through the trial with a Valmore transformation was pushing his limits would be a severe understatement. After she arrived, Briar would perch on the edge of the couch, facing away from him. He would position himself beside her so he could draw her neck back slightly, and she could clutch the arm of the couch, holding herself poised away from him, minimizing almost all contact while he drank her blood. And somehow, they'd made a dance out of turning the bite of a vampire into something impersonal, clinical, meaningless. Years of solitude, and this was what the universe blessed him with. Today, Briar must have just come from her shower. Her hair was damp and smelled like mint from across the room. She barely looked at him as she sat down, her eyes distant, as if her mind was somewhere else. That bothered him more than it should have. 
His stomach turned at the idea that though she held the keys to his salvation, a thing he'd give almost anything for, it had become nothing more than an irritating chore for her. Okay. So he hadn't realized that the contempt he was feeling would come through in her experience. But when he sank his fangs into her neck, she jumped violently. Her fingers gripped the arm of the couch with a shudder. Silas didn't want to stop. Something about her blood today was different, alight with energy that buzzed through him along with her magic. Fuck, she muttered. What's pissing you off today? He drew back, wincing as he forced himself to stop. What does that mean? He asked, wiping his lips. Only hurts like that when one of us is pissed. Well, I'm fine, he muttered, somehow too stubborn to admit to her his irritation. What's getting you all high-strung? Briar turned to him, eyebrows cocked. You aren't fooling me, prick. No one would be pissed after the sex I just had. Silas winced. That was why it tasted so... different. You know what? I'm good. He'd drunk a quarter as much as he usually did, but he was often overcautious. He could make it a week on what he'd had, right? Briar stood, folding her arms, damp curls tumbling over her cloak. Her cheeks were rosy red. Feral instincts demanded he tug her back toward him and finish. You don't want to drink my blood because I fucked Grayson? She asked. He rubbed his thumbs across his nail beds, a vamptrum stirring within him at the thought of that weasel. Don't think about it. Could you just... Keep it to other days of the week? Briar grinned. Theos, you two are predictable. First you have to make sure I can't have any friends. Then you want to control my love life. Theos forbid a man is mad enough to get involved with me. Let's try to kill him. No biggie. So why not my sex life too, right? It's one day out of eight. Can you hear yourself right now? Level with her and tell her why. If she understood, she might not be so stubborn. Because next, she'd be planning sex with Grayson just to piss him off. It tasted different, he muttered. Briar scowled. You're disgusting. He blinked. Well, that was surprisingly hurtful, actually. This is new territory to me too, you know. I'm not going to argue if you won't drink more of my blood, she snorted. Then her eyes narrowed, a little spark of something mischievous appearing in them. It had been a long time, but the dizzying high alcohol content of her blood that one time had been memorably sickening. Silas gritted his teeth. Do what you want, he snapped. I just assumed you don't want me to be a part of your sex life. Briar pursed her lips, thinking that one through. Good. I don't know if I've had enough, he said with a sigh. We'll revisit it at the end, when you're not. All hot and bothered? she asked. Guess the shower wasn't enough. Briar grinned, turning and sitting on her usual armchair that faced him. The shower was the point, actually. Silas forced his eyes down to the notes on the couch beside him, trying to drown the images that flooded his mind. It was hard not to think of the way her blood had been tainted with a hint of ecstasy. This was downright demeaning. The trial couldn't come quick enough. Over halfway there. Eleven lessons out of fourteen done, if they did this every week. So three more times he'd need her blood. Her disgusting, tainted, low-born fucking blood. His heart was still quick. His veins felt as though they were on fire. For a moment, he wished it was him in that shower with her, instead of, Anything with amplification? He asked, tensely. She didn't deserve to have that sort of power over him. Briar shook her head. Nothing. My glint is useless, too. One good punch from Grayson, and it shatters. Really fucking weak, then. Silas couldn't help himself. He's strong enough where it counts, she shot back. He dared not look up at her. 
they spent the rest of the lesson with similar curt interactions. And Silas got her to use every spell he'd been able to dig up, hoping to scrounge some amplification magic from her. Anything they could do to avoid a blood signy, Silas was willing to try. No language or incantation worked, but he knew better than anyone that where there was no well for something, it didn't matter how many spells you knew. What do you think, then? she asked after he'd closed his notebook, frustrated. I think the Valmore's going to eat you alive. I meant about the blood, she snapped. Right, yeah, I need some. It had been too brief before. Briar sat back down on the edge of the couch. Let's get it over with, then. His fingers were maybe a little tight on her shoulder as he bit down, relieved that her blood tasted almost completely normal now. Almost. The small measure that wasn't called to him flashes of her in a shower, hands taut against the wooden walls as water cascaded around her, into her hair, down her back. The os below. Silas had to fight not to draw away from her, knowing it wasn't enough yet. It was dizzying, the warmth of her soft neck beneath his lips where he pierced her flesh, his mark and claim. She always healed it once he was done, erasing all evidence. Not this time. This time he'd make sure she returned to Grayson with his... Briar moved slightly beneath him, and he realized his other hand had seized her waist, his grip digging in. Let her go. He tried to get his body to comply, fighting the images, the urges to tug her closer. He was drawing back reluctantly when he felt the warmth of her hand against his fingers. Only she wasn't trying to push him away. Her breath caught slightly as her other hand found his on her shoulder. Briar sunk into him, and everything shifted, the jarring imaginings of her dropping in an instant for something much softer. His hands came down, wrapping around her stomach as he held her against him, drawing what he knew were the last few drops he'd need. Finally, he withdrew his fangs. It was easy to hate the visions and the dreams, but this was different. The warmth of her body pressed against his, lit up long deserted corners of his soul. It had been over two months since the night she'd saved Grayson, the night she'd lain in his arms for hours. He'd dreamed of that almost as much as the other kinds of dreams. The part of him that was still the boy who'd lived up in a silent, lonely room, who'd never had the things of true value she'd found with Grayson, that piece of him ached. Wounds opened that he hadn't even known he had. Cool, damp hair pressed against his cheek like silk. For every moment that Briar somehow didn't move, didn't take her own hands from his, that wound yawned wider and wider. He withdrew his hands, frightened of this feeling, almost as frightened of the hollow emptiness that came the second their touch broke. Briar straightened, only half turning to him. She was chewing her cheek. That was weird, she muttered. I shouldn't have... She trailed off. Neither me. This again. Three more feedings and it would be over. Would Grayson be waiting for her in her dorm? Would she take this feeling to him? To be honest, he didn't even know why he wanted that. That possessive creature stirred. It wanted her to take something of him to Grayson in return. Silas stood, unable to be near her anymore. When he reached the door, she called after him. I shouldn't have said you were disgusting, she said. It, it wasn't your fault. My blood was different. I get it, he replied. Not disgusting by intent. A humorless laugh slipped from his throat, just by nature. Chapter 19 Axel was a hound, and Grayson knew it would be impossible to throw him off his track. 
but he had to make it happen somehow. He'd spent a lot of lonely moments watching his classmates dissolve into stealth, keeping secrets upon secrets. Despite Axel's accusations, Grayson hadn't stolen his damn book. But from the patterns he'd spotted of their classmates, especially ones who abused their stealth, he was very sure who had. It was a student he'd seen lingering around Axel and Silas's room one too many times. So Grayson would get it back, even if the universe was playing games with him, tangling his nightmares with his deepest dreams. The book, which marked his freedom with Briar, had been taken by Venus Donovan's roommate and presented a temptation like no other. He'd get it back, though, so he could return peacefully to Briar's arms, the woman who knew he was broken and loved him anyway. Axel believed Grayson was after him, bent on vengeance. But Briar knew the truth, that he had been. But he would let it all go for her. Grayson made sure all the right people were busy in the dining hall before slipping outside and creeping through the bushes. He scaled the academy wall to the right balcony, atmospheric magic making it easier for him to grip the ridges on the stone. He wasn't surprised to find the balcony door locked, but he'd spent enough time on the streets of Karenfurt not to be held up by that. He made quick work with a pick and tension wrench, having tried it on his own balcony door a few times to get a feel for the academy locks. Grayson stepped in, his eyes drawn instantly to Venus Donovan's side. He wasn't here for that, for investigating the woman who Silas had threatened, no matter how temptation tugged at him. Yet he couldn't help himself glancing at Venus's bedside table. Upon it was a stack of books, romances and study guides, a glass bottle of perfume, and a comb. Find the book and go. Investigating Venus Donovan wasn't his job. He'd been watching her carefully after what he'd seen Silas do, but he was letting go of that now. His gaze flickered to the other side of the room, the side he was actually here for. There was a perfectly made bed and nothing on the bedside table. Grayson started with the chest at the foot of the bed. He rooted around in the folded cloaks for a while, finding nothing. He sighed, pulling a few of the bedside drawers open and unsurprisingly finding it void of the book. There was only stationery lined in a bin, a locked box, a roll of sage, and a few blackened cinders upon the bed of his drawer. He started on the dresser. Inside, the shirts and trousers were so neatly rolled up he had to be careful, wanting his time here undiscovered as long as possible. He was in the bottom drawer before he felt the hard edges of a book. He tugged it out, eyes darting across the huge tome between his fingers. Live symbiotes and other unusual biomage bonds. Well, if that didn't sound like the kind of illegal tome Axel would have found a way to bring in. The brute could leave him the fuck alone once and for all. He made to leave, adjusting the lock of the balcony doors so that it would latch behind him. Grayson tugged on the door handle, about to close it, when he paused. His grip trembled for a moment, desperate for the conviction that Briar deserved. He gritted his teeth pressing his forehead against the glass. Leave. But he was here already. Grayson slipped back inside, eyes now focused on Venus's side of the room. He opened the bedside table drawers, a few quills, a pot of ink, and some half-wrapped bars of soap. The bottom drawer had a few more books and a bundle of empty scrolls. In the chest at the foot of the bed, there was nothing but a mess of cloaks and winter clothes completely normal. But what was he looking for? A hint that Venus was involved in something dark? What would that be anyway? Grayson hesitated once more, peering at Venus's bed. Her blankets were messier than her roommate's. When he flipped the covers, beneath was a sewn brown teddy. A little juvenile, but he couldn't make fun. Briar had a fox she clutched when she slept, and he'd thought that was cute. He was about to drop the covers when he paused. A glint caught his eyes. 
he shoved Venus Donovan's pillow out of the way. Grayson froze. A necklace lay on her sheet. Its pendant was two hexagons of glass pressed together. A type of necklace he'd seen lots in Carinfort, popular for its customization. His sister had bought one once, a sketch of her son drawn by her husband pressed inside. But there wasn't a picture in this pendant. In the pendant under Venus Donovan's pillow was a cutting of lavender, crushed between glass. Grayson stared at it, brain not able to process what he was seeing. He lifted it into the air before him, examining it as if it would start explaining itself. He'd thought the lavender was a threat from Silas, but... But this wasn't how one treated a threat, immortalized and beautiful. Grayson set it down numbly, his mind racing as he replaced her sheets. When he returned to the balcony, though, he stopped and reeled in his thoughts. This was exactly what he was supposed to avoid. It wasn't his problem what Axel or Silas did. Proving that was his only chance at peace with Briar. Grayson picked up the book and stuffed it in his pack. He made sure the lock had clicked on the balcony door, then hopped over the edge, making the short climb to the grass. He returned to his room, setting the book down on his bed. One hour until he met with Axel. He hated his shiver of fear. For a second he was back on Briar's bed. Axel's raw, red knuckles were cracking ribs and splitting skin. His body was failing. Green eyes he'd once trusted were full of hatred as Axel delivered him what should have been a slow, brutal death. Grayson closed his eyes beating back the terror. The truth was, something else dark had happened that day. Beyond the threat of death, beyond Axel's fury, something loomed, screeching and gnashing. It was something unnamed and horrifying, and Grayson couldn't shake the feeling that it was chasing him. And Briar was enough to quieten it when nothing else could. She kept it distant and gray and faded even when it whispered that it would catch up one day. That was why she deserved better from him. His fingers ran along the book cover, tracing the ridges of the title as he tried to center himself. Then he felt a ridge along the pages and glanced down to see an earmark. Grayson stared at it for a long, long time. Don't open it. Kira had wanted him to be happy. She'd told him that. Leave the past in the past. Briar would make him happy. She centered him when she was near. Every time she touched him, all his fears dissolved from shadows and became light. Axel's good for the blood, Signy. How's the end of the week? Silas asked Briar during their twelfth session. What? She looked up at him from her book eyes wide. It was two and a half weeks until the trial. They had spent most of this session staring at images in a book he'd ordered in from Carinfort. It depicted areas of nature in which Valmore had been known to appear. The locations were varied, trees, rivers, a mountain path, but they all had something in common. The nature in the painting had some sort of symmetry. His eyes felt like they were going cross-eyed, trying to see the way a few protruding rocks in the river looked like mirrors of one another. Betrayal drew it, too, but he didn't think that would be a problem. It's possible it gets drawn, he'd told her last session, but I don't think those who want it, like the Voira, trust each other enough to manage a genuine betrayal. And besides, the Valmore would manifest somewhere in the forest regardless of its calling once night fell. The book suggested, though it wasn't proven well enough for discussion in their classes, that it was symmetry that drew it. The author of this one was dubious, but anything that would give her a leg up in the trial was worth it. If you still want to, Silas said, dragging his brain back to the conversation. I do, she said, despite her scowl. 
You said he learned that shit in Carrenfort? Yeah. If Axel's from Carrenfort and you're from a coastal town, how did you meet him? She asked. You know, Silas laughed. If that was supposed to be a subtle dig for information, you're terrible at it. Briar chewed on her lip for a moment. Okay, but Axel's not a noble and you are. How did you meet? A blind date. Silas's tone was snide. Huh, Briar mused. Who set that up? He's much too good looking for you. She paused as Silas snorted. And there are a lot of logistical questions I have too. Yeah? He asked. She'd become more comfortable with him in the last few weeks. It had been a long time with no real incident between her and Axel, and the Voira were long shot of her. It was almost all right having these sessions, until he remembered that she'd definitely be dead to the Valmore soon, along with his magic. Yeah, like, how did you get to the date? She closed the book and turned to him, a sparkle in her eyes. What do nobles do in town to avoid stepping on the same stones as peasants? Do they have a servant carry them? Or do they all possess the ability to levitate so as not to sully their shoes? Briar took a sip of her tea, but Silas barely missed a beat. We do, in fact, have the gift of extraordinary balance. I stand on my servant's shoulders first, then jump from one peon's head to the next until I arrive. Briar snorted the hot drink out of her nose. She covered her mouth, her eyes watering. Silas was grinning before he could catch himself, and Briar wiped her face with her sleeve. He froze, suddenly not meeting her eyes. This was maybe a little too friendly. She was stiff at his side, though, as if thinking the same thing. The weekend? Silas asked, clearing his throat. For the Signy. Voschel's the best day. It would give you the entire weekend for recovery. He wondered for a moment if he should bring up the book. Axel was absolutely convinced Grayson had stolen it, which Silas wasn't sure about. It was one of the most important books they owned. All right, then, she said. I'll ask Axel to meet you here at 8 p.m. No, best not bring it up. If they were going to do the Signy at the end of the week, the air needed to be clear. Perhaps reminding her they'd accused her boyfriend of thievery wasn't a great idea. You're not going to be there? Briar's hands were firmly clasped, twisted slightly, as she held them in her lap. Silas narrowed his eyes, thoughts of stolen books gone from his head. Do you want me there? He'd assumed not but Axel had rattled her after the Grayson incident. He had rattled her before the Grayson incident, if he was being honest. No, it's fine. Her voice had gone a little high again. Silas rubbed his thumbs along his nail beds, unsure. Had a bit of reading to catch up with, though, he said, trying to read her expression. If I were there, would it bother you? She shrugged and the motion wasn't quite natural. Don't care. Silas fought a scowl. How was he supposed to know what that meant? Is this enough for you? Grayson asked as he dropped the book into Axel's lap. The man sat on a bench out in the back of the academy. At this time of the evening, it was late enough to be dark despite the long days. There was not much traffic but that wasn't an accident. Nothing Axel did was an accident. Axel leaned back, crossing his ankles as he adjusted the lit coil between his teeth. It brought back memories. Burning wood, the scent of the old fire pits in those damp alleys, layers of soot on stone bowls, charred soup they'd reheated in hopes the taste might be manageable. Axel was looking up at Grayson with an analytical gaze and Grayson had to work not to step away, his heart racing in his chest. So, did you take it? Axel sounded unsurprised. Stupid oaf. I want a new start, Grayson told him. Hedge bets you weren't sure about. 
The rules were simple. It was very unlikely Axel would believe that Grayson hadn't been the one to steal it. So don't fight him on that assumption. He could win regardless of it. Maybe Axel would even pay the price of that lie. The lie that there weren't others in this academy after Silas. Funny way to get one. Grayson swallowed. I... No. Tell him you love her, and he'll use it against you. If it's not enough, tell me what I need to do. Axel's eyebrows rose slightly as he looked up at Grayson. Try not having been born a sniveling weasel. Bile rose in Grayson's throat, desperation pushing him to take a step closer to the man, while his adrenaline whispered of danger. Just leave us alone. You shouldn't start things you can't finish. Axel shrugged. You know that better than anyone. He turned the book in his hand. Thanks for this, though. There was a bitter taste in Grayson's mouth. Axel would not drop it. He could feel the desperation unraveling his mind as he dug for something, anything he knew of Axel, to fix this. Hey, hey. Grayson had chased Axel down palace hallways once upon a time. You know Kira, yeah? Axel had been an enigma, quiet, hulking, and a reputation that had to have been more bravado than actual truth, or so Grayson had thought. But he'd sent a few of the nobles running last week when they'd been picking on Grayson. I'm not your friend, mate, Axel had said. Grayson had ignored that. They were two kids from the Dawn program, two kids who didn't fit within pristine walls and marble floors. I like her. Grayson hurried to keep pace at Axel's side. Put in a word for me? What word would that be? Oh, Grayson thought fast. I can pick locks, navigate the current foot alleys well enough to shirk a tail, swap a man's purse with a sack of rocks in the time he takes removing a hand from his pocket to scratch his nose. What do you think she likes? Grayson asked. Axel side-eyed him a grin playing on his lips. Wait, wait, I can juggle four daggers, and I'm a great shot with them too. She's down trying to get a look at the weapons lanes all the time. Right. Axel stopped, leaning on the wall and crossing his arms. I'll make sure to tell the Lady Dawn's daughter that you're excellent at throwing sharp things. He had at the time thought Axel might have been making fun of him. But then, the next time he'd been near her, Kira had noticed him. Grayson stepped back from Axel. That memory was like twisting a knife in his chest. Once he'd looked up to this man, he kicked a nearby bush, sending a few tulips flying. I didn't fucking know you'd be here when I came. Yet you still got involved. Grayson's fingers clutched at his head as he spun back to Axel painfully tugging at his hair. I fucked up. He strode back toward Axel, despite every screaming instinct. He had to convince him. He could offer the information he had on the students in this school, but that was the last line of defense he had. Living without those secrets would be like living without a dagger in his belt. What could he offer Briar if he'd given over all his protection to Axel? Vostra was not a world you survived in, with no sharp edges. So instead, he did the second hardest thing. He dropped to his knees. Please. Briar needed something from him, anything. She'd brought him back from the brink of death. She'd entered a deal with this monster just to keep him safe. He would beg for this. He didn't care. Besides another rule. Act pathetic, and they'd treat you like you were. Just let me start again with her. I'll never come near you or Silas again. Axel gazed at him, disgust in his green eyes. How many times have I seen you try that shit on nobles? He asked. I'm not. Grayson felt hopelessness rise within him. Don't they just love to believe we can make something of ourselves? that they can save us? Axel leaned forward, coil 
rolling between his teeth. It's not like that. Things are... they're different. You and I, we can never change, he said. And Grayson could see the unrelenting hatred in Axel's eyes. The same hatred he'd seen just over a month ago, the night he thought he'd die. The most pathetic thing about you, Grayson? Axel let out an amused breath and coil smoke billowed by Grayson's face, making him flinch back. Is that you believed her when she said you could. Axel leaned back before Grayson could react. He planted his boot into his chest and kicked him, sending him sprawling across the path. Grayson pulled himself to his feet, and shock was a white noise in his brain. Axel was striding away, his silhouette visible against the candlelit windows of the academy, the book clutched at his side. Chapter 20 Don't touch anything. Axel's voice made Briar freeze as she reached to examine the thin metal rod on the potions table. She'd arrived to find Silas lounging on the couch with his face in a book. Axel was hunched on a stool, fiddling with a black device that looked like a compass. When neither of them had said anything, she'd wandered over to the table. In bowls were piles of glittering powder, black, green, and yellow. There were glass bottles with different liquids inside and a row of long, thin coils. She saw a pot full of feathers of varying colors beside an empty mortar and pestle. Finally, in the center of the table, beneath the indent with crackling flames, there was a black cauldron full of a simmering, clear liquid. Briar glanced over at Axel, seeing the device still in one hand. She did a double take. He had a glove on one hand, a pair of glasses on his face, and a charred brown leather apron around his waist, its pockets bulging. The glasses were made of thick golden metal, with a few different circles of glass that could be slid into place for varying magnification. Despite the flutter of nerves that had taken flight in her stomach at hearing him, she couldn't help the smile tugging on her lips. He just looked so ridiculous. Does it for you, then? He waved at the glasses. She snorted. What are the coils for? One's for you, one's for me. He picked one coil up and lit it on the fire beneath the cauldron. Then he held it out to her. Uh, what's in it? Fig root. It has to be in your bloodstream for the magic to take, and some shit that's going to chill you out. She eyed it. I'm going to get high? Just relaxed. But if you don't want it, you can drink the fig root. He pointed at one of the glass bottles. If you don't chill out, though, I'll tie you down won't be responsible for a Signy blowing up half the academy because you're too jumpy. That's a thing? As possible damages go, that would be getting off easy. Right. She looked down at the coil, the bitter smell of fig root making her wince at the thought of smoking it. All of it? Yeah, go annoy Silas for a bit. He waved her away and returned to his black compass. She sat on her usual armchair, feeling much more comfortable with Silas opposite her. She might not like him, but at least this situation was familiar. She took a puff of the coil, trying not to let on she'd never smoked one before. The smoke burned her lungs, and she broke into a bout of coughs. Silas lowered the book with a grin. Glad I'm not the only one. That's foul, she wheezed and the bitter taste stuck on her tongue. You decided where you want to get the signy? Was I supposed to? Briar asked. Where's yours? Silas tapped his hand against his right upper chest. Apparently the back is more common, but I wanted to see it. Anxious Pratt, Axel said from across the room. What if something happened to it? Silas asked, sitting up. If I can't see it, how would I know if it didn't heal right? Axel just snorted, and Briar focused on smoking the sickening coil while they were distracted. This time she managed only a slight wheeze. 
does it actually matter where it goes? She asked, her eyes watering. As long as there's enough open skin not to disrupt the lines. Axel seemed to have finished with the black device, and he'd lifted the glasses up on his head, sending his hair in all directions. Unless you want to be here for a few hours. He began mixing something into a bowl. Where did he get those ingredients? Briar asked, glancing back to Silas. Some in town, some we brought in. Like, you were planning on doing a blood signy when you came to school? Nah, he ordered them in from Karenford ages ago. Briar was just about to take another drag of the coil when she froze. For me? she asked, suspiciously glancing between them both. You acted like you only thought it was a good plan after you saw my quartz reading. Yeah, well... Silas shot a glance over at Axel, who was busy crushing powders in his bowl. We don't always agree on what a good idea is. That's one way of putting it, Axel muttered. And the other? That I knew it was a good idea long before you two idiots caught up. Silas folded his arms, grimacing. Briar could feel whatever was in the coil going to her head. Her anxiety settled. Her body felt strangely distant, and she pinched the skin on her arm. Helps with the pain a bit, too, Silas said, having seen what she was doing. You'll be glad about that. Briar was taking another drag of the coil when she spotted Axel doing something that shattered the fuzzy feeling in her brain. The fuck are you doing? She stood and hurried toward him. He had his knife out and was drawing it up the skin of his forearm. As she watched, blood began dripping. Focus on finishing that. He nodded at her coil, his tone steady, as if carving his own skin open was an everyday occurrence for him. He turned to his arm and continued. She took another drag, watching as his knife carved an unfamiliar symbol into his arm. If she looked closely, she saw faint lines of light on his skin that he followed. Other signies, perhaps? Once he was done, the cut, dripping with blood, lit up with a red glow. Axel held his arm over the cauldron and let his blood fall into the simmering potion. The wound began to seal up, and she knew he must be healing it. He grabbed a rag and wiped up the blood from his skin and the drops on the table. You know, she said, her first real hesitation with the plan rearing its head. I have a shitty track record with magic, blood, and assholes in this place. Sorry, kitten. Axel grinned as he lit his own coil now and took a drag. I'm not giving you half my magic. She did a double take at those words. Seeing him like this, all charred apron and odd glasses, sending his hair in a million directions as he puttered about the potions table, it seemed like, well, like he was a different person. But as smoke billowed from his nose, as he used that nickname he favored, it was impossible to forget that he'd been the one to brutalize Grayson. He'd been the one who'd waited in her bathroom and made her feel like nothing. A shiver ran up her spine. And now she was going to let him brand her? He raised an eyebrow, and she realized she was staring at him. Uh, she stammered, trying to remember what she'd been about to ask. What next, then? I finish this, and we start, so pick a spot. He was giving her a strange look. He was burning through the coil much quicker than she was. She turned to find Silas had moved to her armchair, his book resting on a propped-up leg. She wandered over to the couch and sat down, almost finished with the bitter coil. Not really that fun, the next part, Silas said quietly, his voice barely reaching her. I can leave if you'd rather. She eyed him, still reluctant to admit she felt better if he stayed. It was only because the alternative was just her and Axel down here. You can stay, she said. I don't care. He looked to be biting back a smile as he returned to his book. 
Right. You ready? Axel asked, walking over with a small wooden tray. He'd removed his glove and glasses, though he still wore the apron. On it was that black compass, the metal rod with a wooden handle that glowed with heat, a paper clipping with the Signy diagram on it, and a small pot of black liquid. Yeah, my back, I guess, if that's where I'm supposed to get it. She took another long drag, finishing the coil. It was soothing her enough that the nasty taste was worth it. They were really doing this. He set the tray down on the couch and sat beside it. She shrugged off her cloak. She'd worn an oversized shirt today. He'd be able to get to her back easily. Briar eyed him nervously. So, what do you want me to do? He picked up a cushion and chucked it to her. Use this. Sit anywhere, as long as you can hold on tight. She settled down, facing the bookshelves, and held the cushion against her chest as she drew herself against the back of the couch. Briar jumped as she felt his fingers brush her shirt before he was tugging it down over her right shoulder. She had to lower her arm so that the fabric stayed down. I can already tell this is going to be fun, he grumbled. Apparently that was meant for Silas, because when she turned to gauge his expression, he closed a hand around her shoulder. Don't move. What did you mean? She asked. But she jumped again when she felt something hot on her back. It's going here, he said, ignoring her question. He drew a few lines on the open area of her back with what must have been the warm liquid from the pot. Fair warning. It's going to hurt like hell. I was expecting as much. I might act odd. Just ignore it. I know what I'm doing. Briar turned to him. What does that mean? It'll be fine. He was lifting the metal rod with the wooden handle, and she noticed the rounded end of it glowing bright orange. Silas spoke, though. What he smoked in the coil might make him mirror you emotionally. He started crying when he did mine. Because you're a fucking baby. Why does it do that? She asked. Axel just thumbed toward the black liquid in the bowl. My blood? Then he brushed a finger onto her back. Your blood. So we'll be like, connected? She wasn't able to hide the nervousness in her voice. Until I seal the signy. He shrugged. Just don't get too emotional. Great. Last chance to back out, kitten. I can't leave it unsealed. Just get it over with. I need to be clear. You can't change your mind once we start. I wasn't joking about tying you down. She tried to turn again, but his grip was still clamped on her shoulder. Briar took a deep breath. She needed this. She needed the Valmore. There were monsters still walking Vostra that had to die. Monsters much worse than the man about to brand her much worse than what waited for her at the breach. Yeah, I won't. This time, thankfully, her voice was steady. He dipped the metal rod into the pot of black liquid with a hiss of steam. She returned to the rows of bookshelves and clutched the pillow. Eyes forward and keep still. Okay. Her voice was quiet. Her mind was humming with whatever she'd smoked, but it wasn't enough to dull the flutter of fear in her chest entirely. Blistering pain exploded against her skin as the rod touched it. Fuck! She tensed, biting back a whimper, closing her eyes tight shut. Axel held it there for a while, and she could feel him moving it across her skin very slowly. Something else happened. She felt him behind her, like an echo in her mind. She didn't have to turn around to know he sat there at her side, hunched on the couch as he removed the rod from her skin. He dipped it back into the pot and she took a deep breath, readying herself again. Once more, pain split her back open. She cursed again and clenched her jaw so hard it ached. Her eyes burned, the light of the torches too bright all of a sudden. 
Her eyes couldn't focus on any one thing. Silas thinks, Axel spoke casually as he held the rod against her skin, that it's a good opportunity for me to patch things up with you. Briar almost turned. What the fuck does that mean? She asked through gritted teeth. Says it's a good bonding experience. Finally, the rod was gone again. Briar let out a breath. Of course he does. Then she spoke louder so Silas could hear her from the armchair, happy for any excuse to shift her attention from the searing pain. Only Silas would think a good time to patch things with someone is when they're holding a branding iron to your back. Axel laughed. Well, you'll know if he's lying to you, Silas said. So if you have questions, now's the time. Wait, really? Briar blinked. Then the pain was back, and she clutched the couch. Three more times, Axel brought the rod to her skin before anyone spoke. She didn't recognize the signy, but it had been relatively complex. She wasn't sure if Axel had even finished a single line yet. The pain was mingled with the thoughts rising in her mind at what Silas had said. Now she was pondering it. There were things she wanted to know. Things that haunted her about what he'd done. Ask then, kitten, Axel murmured as he removed the rod once more. What you did to Grayson. She tried to keep her emotions in check as she thought of it. Was it because of me? The rod came down again, and she squeezed her eyes tight shut. The room was filled with a scent of burning and a sharp mix of bitter chemicals. Axel didn't answer straight away. She could feel his deliberation. In part, he replied at last. She hissed as the pain returned. If she focused, she could feel the honesty of that answer come through the echo of him. What's the other part? She had to force the question out. Something was coiled tight and angry within him. I'm not answering that question. He drew the rod away again. The process was infuriatingly slow. Did you want him to die? Briar asked. I didn't mean to kill him, Axel replied. But I would have preferred it if he died. Briar fell silent at that, disgust rising up her throat like bile. It was the truth. That's a normal response, Axel said as if he felt her hatred of him. He sounded strained, though, something tight in his voice. That's why you... Fuck! She'd been caught off guard this time by the rod, too distracted to follow his movements in her mind. She took a moment this time to recover herself. That's why I what? Axel sounded genuinely curious. Got Silas instead of a teacher. She spat the words through her teeth. It haunted her nightmares that after everything, it had been up to her to heal Grayson. What if I hadn't been good enough? It was incongruous to feel his humor through the bond. His emotion collided with her fear and hatred. The rod was gone again, and she took a breath of relief. Why do you think I did that? he asked. To say he didn't deserve to live if I couldn't fix him myself. Huh. That's not why you did it? She could feel it through the bond. Larger than life, aren't I? He sounded chuffed. He felt chuffed. Screw yourself. You see that, Cy? Axel's echo turned to look across the room. Great bonding experience. She hates me so much less than before. Yeah, because of the tremendous effort you're making, Silas muttered. Briar braced herself as Axel lifted the rod again. She buried her head in the cushion, tears finally seeping from her eyes at the pain as it scorched her flesh. I called Silas because no other teacher in the school could have healed Grayson. Briar's shock broke momentarily through the agony. What does that mean? She felt another flare of an emotion from him, stronger than any of the others 
but this time it wasn't anger or humor. It was envy. Means. He sounded strained. That the only person who was going to bring Grayson back was the same person who'd somehow kept him alive all night. Her? Axel had seriously thought she would have been a better bet to heal Grayson than any teacher in the school? The rod vanished again, and through the echo she saw him glance toward Silas. I'm over the questions. His envy, anger, and hatred all swirled around him like an aura, all directed at her. It wasn't a shock, exactly, to know how much he disliked her, but it was still jarring. She swallowed a lump in her throat. Doing all right? Silas asked. She assumed he meant her, but she could only nod her head. Better than you. Axel hadn't lifted the rod again, and Briar turned to them. Silas rolled his eyes. I was a teenager. She noted that the tan of Axel's skin was more ashen than usual. Is there a physical cost? She asked. For me? He said, organizing the tray. Just a bit. Briar caught Silas rolling his eyes. Now she was looking for it, she noticed Axel's jaw was clenched and his chest heaved too much when he breathed. It's called blood magic for a reason. His other emotions had died down, and now she felt the spark of irritation. You don't much like looking weak, do you? She asked. I don't much like pity. I don't feel sorry for you. I literally feel what you feel. He picked up the metal rod and nodded toward the couch so he could continue. She glanced at that rod wearily, seeing it was now covered in a charred black substance. He continued for a while, and the room was silent but for the sizzle as the rod touched the liquid or skin and the sporadic sound of Silas turning the pages of his book. It had turned into a war between viciously clenching her teeth so as not to jump every time the rod seared her back and keeping her emotions in check. She didn't want Axel to sense any more of them, but it was hard with him this close to rid herself of that deep sense of unease. The next time he removed the rod, he paused. Through the echo, she could see him rummaging around in his pocket. He lit one of his regular coils, taking a long drag before returning to the rod. Unfortunately, the scent of burning cinder was enough for her mind to betray her completely. She gripped the couch, trying to drown out the memories. For a moment, she was in her shower, and adrenaline tore through her blood. Axel, who had almost pressed the rod into her back, paused for the second time. Get on with it, she snapped, praying he thought it was her fear of the pain. The pain, though, wasn't as bad as before, and perhaps that was because she was using it to drown her terror. The silence was different now as he continued. He was tense behind her. She could sense something brewing under the surface. Each time he pressed the metal rod into her back, the pain was less. Even so, it did little to ease her anxiety. Now that she knew how much he hated her, her mind wanted to re-examine everything he'd ever done. As it turned out, that was a good way to send her into a spiral. Finally, he stopped again, setting the rod down. Spit it out. You said this stupid bond will be done when you're finished? She glanced over at him. So get it done. You're never going to get an answer you're happy with, unless you ask now. She snorted at that. I don't think I'll ever get an answer I'm happy with. Try me. Should I leave? Silas spoke from behind them. Yes, Axel said. No, Briar insisted at the same moment. Ah, uh, Silas sounded unsure. There was a long pause, and then Briar felt a flood of emotion from Axel, a frustrated resignation bundled with what might have been anxiety though Briar was hard-pressed to believe that last one. 
He didn't feel hostile, though, not like earlier. She squeezed her eyes tight shut for a moment, then sighed, her desire for any kind of closure getting the better of her. Don't be a fool, Blossom. But she needed to know. Fine, go. They waited the few moments it took for Silas to close his book and step from the room. The second the door slammed shut, though, adrenaline ripped through her veins like fire. Settle the fuck down, Axel sounded unnerved. She turned to him properly, ignoring the screaming of the skin on her back. Are you joking? Ask the damn question, Briar. She narrowed her eyes, weighing him carefully now. How was she supposed to ask that question? How could she? Axel shifted the tray out of the way and leaned back on the couch, not looking at her. If you know the question, why make me ask it? She demanded. Was she really feeling enough to give it away? He scowled, taking a deep drag of the coil, almost burning through the entire last third in one inhale. He exhaled, smoke billowing from his nose. You want to know about the night I came into your room? My bathroom, she corrected him with a hiss, her veins alight once more. Theos. All right. Axel looked at her with a strained expression. You want to know what? If I'd have raped you? Suddenly she couldn't face him. Too many feelings to name were careening within her. He said nothing for a long moment. The silence was making it hard for Briar to breathe, a fist closing around her throat. It's not my style, Axel said, finally. All she could feel from him was bitterness. Briar looked at him, a tidal wave of rage burning through every other emotion. Not your Style? she whispered. It's a large playing field, the difference between what I'm willing to do and what you'd believe I'd do. She just stared at him in shocked disbelief for a long moment. And that, I suppose, was the point? Of course it was the point. I came to do a job. I did it but his words were incongruous with his feelings this time. There was doubt in there, eating at him. But, she pressed. He slowly ran his tongue along his teeth. Well, events since have indicated that it may have been a bit much. Guilt drowned his doubt, and his scowl deepened. Is that... She almost couldn't say it. Is that you trying to apologize? I don't apologize. The bitterness was back. But you know what? You were a massive threat. Sai tried to ask you nicely. Briar's eyes widened, and he cut off as she made a sound somewhere between a shriek and a splutter. Nicely? If I recall, Axel folded his arms. You stabbed him. Why might that have been? Her voice was high-pitched. Okay. He ran his fingers through his hair. You were a problem, and you weren't going easy with the magic. We know where that leads. So why don't you take your pick? Where I come from, it's a means to an end. For some, worse than what I did. Or maybe cut off a few fingers. Or... He cut off. And to her annoyance, she felt a spark of humor through the bond. Or what? Or something like what we're doing right now, only a lot less consensual. Great. Her heart was pounding in her ears. So? He asked. So what? So? What would you have preferred? None of those are normal solutions. Right. Because you come up with the normal solutions around here. He gave her a flat look. If I apologized to you, would you even believe it? Depends on why. If I was sorry. He pointed at her with a warning finger. If. 
then it would be because I pushed you too far, and now a man is dead. She blinked. They were back to this again. Grayson's suspicion about their involvement really held some weight, but she knew if she pushed about Morin, she'd meet a solid wall. So if I'd been cowed, and Morin was alive, you wouldn't be sorry you came into my bathroom while I was in the shower and stole my lock to threaten me? What kind of question is that? How is it confusing? You're asking me, if I did something unspeakable and it worked out to keep someone alive, would I be sorry I did it? He threw out his hands. Of course I wouldn't be. Would you believe that apology anyway? Silence fell between them. Her breathing became easier all of a sudden. What did I say? He asked, eyeing her suspiciously. You just simmered right down. You? She shrugged. You called it unspeakable. That's all you wanted? He asked. For me to say it's a shitty thing that I did? Well, yeah, she replied. It's a start. Of course it was shitty. He gave her an odd look and wrong and twisted, and I'm a fucked up enough person to mess about with that. She felt that, too. The emotions of guilt and disgust worn down, as if he'd buried them before now. But I'm not fucked up enough to go through with anything. What about what you did to Grayson? Can't help you, he shrugged. There, I'm just a shitty person. He gave her an appraising look. Why... Did you feel more relieved when I said that? I don't know, Briar muttered. Was worried for a second I'd not be able to hate you quite as much. Axel just laughed, taking the dead coil stub from his mouth at last and tossing it on the tray. Briar rubbed her forehead, wincing at the pain on her back with the movement. Why did you want this conversation at all? Because your panic was no fun, he said. It was mostly the truth, but not completely. You could have just finished the Signy and had it over with by now. Axel side-eyed her, grimacing. It might be... He looked to be picking his words carefully. We might be stuck with one another for a while. Because of Silas. Yep. You're still not telling me something. She'd sensed it, one last grain of doubt. There's a lot I'm not telling you. I deserve to know this. Fine. I don't want another Morin Lance on my hands. Is that how you see it? Silas doesn't get a say. You were reacting to me. I need to rethink my approach. Wait, you care if Morin dies, but not Grayson? There's not enough room to give a shit about everyone. If you believe that, you're a fool. Grayson was a problem. But it's not about the death. It's about... He cut off, looking irritated. The most palatable of any emotion he'd felt in this entire experience was lighting like a beacon. She understood. It's about Silas. Axel just shrugged, then glanced back at the metal rod. Do you want to get this over with or not? Briar grimaced, but returned to her position on the couch, clutching it. They were both silent as Axel reorganized the tray. She could see the movement he lifted the rod. This time the pain was significantly less. It was only a faint remnant of what it had been at the start. Had she somehow gotten used to it? With each stroke, she heard a shift in Axel's breathing. Finally, he bit down with a grunt of pain as he held the metal against her skin. She felt almost nothing. She angled herself so she could see him. Eyes ahead, he muttered through gritted teeth. But she got a look at him and her eyes widened. Lines of deep red signes were glowing across the right half of his face, down the same half of his neck. As she shifted her head, she could see them winding up his right arm. All were lit, glowing an angry red 
as he held the rod at her back. He drew it away, catching her staring. All the signes went dull, vanishing from existence entirely, and he relaxed. What was that? Briar asked. Uses my signes to lock in the magic come the end. How long has it been doing that? Lighting up my signes? He asked. The whole time. The pain? Not long. He dipped the metal rod into the potion with a familiar hiss. Last few. Let's get it over with. At first, she felt uncomfortable, knowing he was taking on a pain she should have. But then she remembered what he'd done to Grayson, and all that guilt vanished. Silas came back into the room at some point. Well, I'm not swimming through tension anymore. You guys make up? Yeah, we're besties. Axel dipped the rod in the bowl. Okay, last one. It'll take a few days to heal. Then you won't be able to see it anymore. Don't even think about healing it yourself. You'll mess it up. One of the bowls on the table has a white bomb you can use if the pain bothers you too much. While it's healing, you don't go to the pits. No sparring, no nothing that might disrupt the lines. If you so much as get a paper cut on this, I'll take it right back off. How do you take off a brand? She asked, incredulity in her voice. You don't want to know. His voice held not an ounce of humor. He lifted the metal rod, ready to go again. Once it's healed and faded, check in with me before you use it. I need to make sure it settles right. Okay. He held the metal rod in place, not touching her skin for a very long time. Finally, she glanced at him. He didn't meet her eyes, adjusting himself so his free arm was holding onto the couch like she was. She wasn't sure what the hesitation was for. She returned her gaze to the bookshelves, waiting. He pressed the rod into her back for the final time. For her it felt cold, like ice seeping across the lines he'd branded into her skin. Then the rod was gone, and she heard his breath catch. Briar turned to see Axel hunched over, red signies glowing across the right half of his body, pulsing darker than before. His hand gripped the couch to hold himself up. His face was screwed up in pain. Silas was at his side, taking the glowing metal rod from Axel's hand, placing it in the tray on the ground. Lay down, Silas said. Briar climbed off the couch, still not feeling any pain. Axel groaned. I'm fine. Stop being an idiot. But Axel remained hunched over, the signies pulsing still, his breathing short and sharp. What's happening? Briar asked. It's normal, Axel grunted. You can go. Right. God forbid she sees you like this. Silas rolled his eyes. Briar took the cue, though, and headed for the potions table. She wasn't able to hear their whispered argument as she found the bowl of paste he'd been talking about. When she glanced at them, Axel was lying, stretched out with his legs propped up on the couch. He looked ragged. The glowing was fading, and Briar could feel the ache on her back returning. Not a coincidence, she guessed. I'll head out then, she said, and Silas followed her to the door. He doesn't need healing or anything. Silas shook his head. Gotta let it be. She was just slipping through the door when Silas spoke again. It would be best for him if you don't mention his... Silas indicated to the same half of his own face that Axel's signies glowed on. To anyone. You're worried I'm going to tell Grayson? She could see the truth in his tense expression. Well, there had been several things that Axel had admitted today that verified a few of Grayson's suspicions, but it felt a bit of a low blow to use it against them. Right. Because I wanted to tell my boyfriend that I spent the evening in the dungeons with you two. She snorted. 
I'm sure he'll particularly love the Axel branding me part. She gave him what was probably a sour smile. Silas looked for a moment like he was fighting back his own grin, but she was gone before he could say anything else. Chapter 21 Stealth One of the five instinct magics A veil that shifts conscious eyes away from a caster Effectiveness varies with distance from stealthed target and can be disrupted by movement. It was the weekend before the trial, and Silas arrived at the potions room before Briar. While they usually did their sessions midweek, it took four days for their magic pool to regenerate completely. The trial was five days away, and they were playing it safe. There was just enough between them for him to use his healing signy tonight. That would see him through until she was out of the trial. Then this nightmare would be over. Or she'd be dead. Either way, it would be over. He really tried not to think about that as Briar entered the potions room, shutting the door behind her and looking nervous. That was the general feeling of most students this week. The tension pulled tighter with every day that passed. She came to his couch and slumped down next to him. You won't make me stare at mirror paintings or something again today, will you? She asked, tugging the edge of her cloak down as she turned from him. He snorted, his eyes tracing the skin on her pale neck. Nah. He'd thought perhaps they could just go over which other students might go for the Valmore. Good. I'm stressed as fuck right now. He waited as she got in position. She poised herself perfectly on the couch and tilted her neck so he could touch her as little as possible. It'll be over soon. He was stressed too. He had Axel to worry about as well as her dying with his magic pool. Guess this is the last time you'll have to do this, she said. Silas grunted his agreement as he shifted closer, beating down disappointment at her words, which was definitely the bond's fault. He lifted his black claws, shadows licking the side of his vision, as he made sure he'd shifted enough so they'd feel none of that lust magic, as she put it. Gently, he pressed his thumb against the top of her neck, his other claws coiling around her arm, as he held her in place. He tried to ignore the goosebumps erupting along her skin at his touch. He closed his eyes briefly, then sunk his teeth in, unable to avoid enjoying the thrill of her blood in his veins or the sensation of his magic pool filling. He was just about done when Briar tensed beneath him, a flutter of fear in her blood. He drew away, searching the room for the source. His eyes landed on the doorway. A woman was one foot in, staring at them both with wide eyes. Then a grin split Willow Finch's face. Silas let go of Briar and moved away from her slightly. Well, what have we here? Willow asked. She tucked a few vials into her pockets and sauntered in, sitting down in the armchair and looking between them. Silas's mind raced. He noted that Willow's eyes were fixed on Briar, who had pulled up her cloak. You are a noble whore after all. A ripple of rage burned in his chest. He fought the urge to leap at her. With the trial in five days, he couldn't allow the Voira back on Briar's scent. He wouldn't be inside with them, and once that barrier went up, the students could get away with just about anything. Willow was disturbingly unafraid of him right now, as if she was thinking that same thing. Fuck. What would Axel suggest? Just kill the bitch. Right, a little extreme. I wonder what you're down here for, Willow? Briar asked. Her tone was derisive and confident. He almost jumped as Briar's hand touched his, and he realized that he was still in his delta form. He didn't realize it. I'm more interested in talking about this cute little arrangement, Willow replied. You're giving him your blood? Or perhaps he's not asking. 
You don't seem so happy about it. A moment passed, and Silas wasn't sure how this should play it out. Then Briar's touch traced down his forearm to his hand, where she laced her fingers in his. He released his form, his heart skipping a beat. He was more than happy to let Briar take the lead, since his list of actions went from one, nothing, and two, kill the bitch. Willow's eyes slid to their hands, calculating, the confidence in her eyes not wavering. I think, Briar said, her voice only just loud enough to carry to Willow. You're here because you don't want anyone to know how weak your little man Ace is. Willow froze, her face losing the little color it had. I didn't think he'd still needed to bolster or that he'd get you involved, Briar said. There was something nasty in her voice. Or perhaps he's not asking. You don't seem too happy about it. I'm unattached, Willow's voice was a hiss. Voira slang, Silas knew. It meant she'd not given her mark to a partner yet. Waiting on Locke? Briar asked. Him and Medora are attached at the hip. You'll never get between them. Silas glanced at her in surprise. Briar was correct. Silas only knew because Axel kept a keen eye on Voira politics. Habits from his old life died hard, and an intense distrust of Voira was one of them. Silas hadn't realized that Briar was also aware of the group's nuances, though. Willow had a bitter expression. We will see. Her voice was tense, but there was fear in her eyes. I wish you luck, Briar said with a smile. If you can't land Locke, the rest of the school might find out you're stuck with a man who has to bolster to fit in. Willow stood, much more off balance than before. Who else knows? Her voice was unsteady. Briar tugged Silas's arm up and around her resting her head on his chest. Just us, Briar said, unless anything gets out about our cute little arrangement. Willow's lip curled, her eyes tracing Silas's hand, which had dropped to Briar's waist. He hoped he was correctly reading the impression she wanted to give. Willow looked like she wanted to say something else, but bit her tongue. Leave. Briar's tone reminded Silas of that time she'd demanded he show her his quartz reading. Heat burned in his chest. Her proximity to him was intoxicating all of a sudden. He was hyper-aware of her fingers entwined in his, her head pressed on his shoulder, and his hand curled around her waist. If I find out you've told anyone, Willow hissed as she took a few steps toward the door. I'll make sure the entire school knows including that sad boyfriend of yours. Then she was gone. Briar jumped up out of his arms as soon as Willow slammed the door, dashing over to it and making sure it was locked this time. Fuck, she muttered. I just forgot when I came in. She returned to the armchair and slumped down on it, tugging her wild hair up into its messy bun. For a moment, Silas wished she'd returned to his side. It took him a second to focus on what she was saying. Do you think she believed it? Her voice was concerned. Uh, Silas had to work to find his voice. Yes. Axel had strongly implied Briar had blackmailed him when she'd asked him not to touch Grayson. Was this what it had been like? It was just really hot. No way around it. Whoa. Silas reeled himself in at that thought. Briar was still in a fluster. If Grayson finds out, he's going to be so upset. I don't think she's going to tell anyone, Silas said. Briar was good in a pinch, as good as Axel even. It was kind of mind-blowing. She's nasty, that one. I don't know. She might just do it to spite me. Forget Ace. Why? Why did you act like you were with me? Silas asked. If she hadn't, she'd not be so worried about Grayson finding out. Briar gave him a sharp look. I don't want to be easy prey. Last time when you never came, they were nasty. They do what they can get away with. They think you're... 
she air-quoted, with me. Well, they're more likely to be cautious, right? You're leveraging my reputation? He asked. Fucking right I am, she folded her arms. Cost of my blood! Then something a little weary flashed in her eyes. Anyway, you didn't have to play along. Silas shrugged. Doesn't make a difference to me. I don't have a girlfriend to worry about. He paused, a grin tugging at his lips. You're much too high maintenance to even think about dating. I am a bit, aren't I? Had you and Axel running about like headless chickens all term. Silas barked a laugh at that. Simple fucking truths. Dear Maddie, I want to remember all the good things and let go of the bad. I know he wants to as well. You remember that time I spent all morning making that blueberry triple onion bread? A kid in school had sworn it was a good idea. For you and father and Kel? And then I left to grab some more green onions for the top, and you let it burn? You were embroidering eagles onto your headscarf, and one wing gave you so much trouble you weren't paying attention. When I came back you were crying and trying to scrape the blackened edges off my bread so I wouldn't know. It was the first time I'd ever seen you cry. You were like my older sister. You'd gone through shit I couldn't imagine, and you never cried. But here you were, sobbing over my burned triple blueberry onion bread. I remember I just started to giggle because it was so ridiculous. I miss us from that time. I miss who I used to be, and how I was happy so much of the time. And I'm realizing you were never innocent. All of this shit I'm learning about life you knew it the day I met you, and you were just fourteen. So here I am, twenty years old, and I'm finally understanding you. And I've thought for so long that I might be too late for us. But maybe, just maybe, I'm not. Briar's heart raced as she lay in Grayson's arms, her breathing only just settling. It was early evening, one more sleep until the trial. Their training gear was scattered across the floor and the spare bed, the chair jammed under the doorknob to keep it shut. Grayson had stayed over every night this week. As it turned out, mind-blowing sex was great for the nerves. She traced her finger along the ridges of his chest, following a line of freckles only faintly contrasting his tanned skin in the blazing light of the torches. She followed the line of freckles until she hit the ridge of the scar, the one that had cascaded down along his muscles, the one she'd not had the power to heal. Briar curled her fist and tugged herself closer to him. Dread for tomorrow slammed into her. She bit back tears. She didn't want to lose him. All she wanted was more time, more nights like this. Her arms held her tighter, but when she peered up at him, his eyes were distant. I need to tell you something, Grayson said, his voice quiet. She could feel him tense. Her brows furrowed. What? She reached up and took his cheek in her hand. He didn't look down at her, though. I moved into the palace in Karenfurt when I was sixteen, part of the Don program, Grayson said. It's this thing the Don family does for street kids. You lived in the Dawn Palace? Briar asked. The bundle of emotions from moments ago vanished and was replaced with unease. He'd said he was in some sort of program, but she'd never thought. Sort of. It's a big place. I had a room in one of the East Towers. They had tutors and trainers, all to get me on my feet, that sort of thing. Briar's stomach was in knots. Oh, wow. Well, I'm sure it was a great look for the Dons. Grayson gave her an odd look, a smile tugging on his lips. Nail on the head, though I won't complain. It was better there, you know. Briar nodded. So did you ever meet the Lady Dawn? She asked. When did her chest become so tight? But she remembered how Lord Oren's house had treated the Lady Dawn, like a saint, singing her praises at every turn. 
Was that how Grayson saw her, too? Yeah, once or twice. He shrugged. I'll tell you a secret, though. Never thought much of the woman. She was... Well, she was a little too perfect for me. Always thought there must be another side to it. Briar stared at him, the tightness in her chest releasing. Why? Okay. Grayson wouldn't meet her eyes all of a sudden. I should have told you this before. What? There was a girl at the palace. Grayson was on edge, and she could feel the rigidity of his body around her. But a smile was tugging at Briar's lips. I'm not worried if you liked a girl before me. I loved her. The words were so quiet. Briar pushed away slightly, sitting up at his side and taking his hand in hers. He wasn't looking at her. Grayson, she tugged at him. It's okay. He glanced her way, his gaze snagging on hers. Then it was like he couldn't look away. Her heart broke with the pain in his icy blue eyes. She died, Grayson murmured. I... I was numb after. Nothing got better. That's why I came here. All I've ever thought about is revenge. Until I met you. Revenge? Briar asked. How... How did she die? They said she killed herself. Grayson's face crumpled. I don't know. I wish I'd... He couldn't seem to go on. There was a beat. What cold and twisted things happened in the Dawn Palace. The possibilities from what Briar knew of nobles were endless. You don't think she killed herself? There had been no missing how he'd worded that. Briar's mind was suddenly jumping to Moore and Lance, and how there really may have been more to that night than she knew. A demon haunts the palace. The Demon of Dawn, they called it. I've heard of it. A prolific tale, though Briar had always thought it was an allegory for how twisted nobles were. It's real? I saw it, the night she died, this, this shadow in the darkness for a moment. I know she didn't. She would have told me. She always told me everything. That's why you came here? The place you come to learn how to kill demons? Grayson murmured. Briar rested her head on his shoulder, clutching him. I didn't know where to start. Axel told me I was an idiot, that I was blind not to see it coming. But it wasn't like that. I know she'd never have done it, not without telling me. Wait, this was too much to digest. Axel? As much of a prat there as he is here, he... Grayson's voice was tight. He was with Kira the night she died. Wouldn't tell me a damn thing. I didn't think we'd be enrolling here at the same time. Worst bloody coincidence of my life. You think he had something to do with it? Briar could hear the apprehensive tone in her own voice. Should... Should she tell him about what Axel had said about Morin? I... I don't know. I didn't think he was capable of that. I thought he was more about covering it up. Even her family didn't seem interested in asking too many questions, Grayson said. You asked why I didn't think much of the Lady Dawn. What? Briar's blood ran cold, her mind empty but for the words he'd just spoken. Kira, Dawn, Grayson whispered, and by the pain on his face, the name might have burned his tongue. You? Briar couldn't keep her thoughts straight. Nothing, nothing made sense. You were in love with the Dawn? That tightness in her lungs returned in full force. He, he had to be lying. Stupid, right? Grayson snorted. She shouldn't have looked twice at me. Briar was pulling away from him now, though, her eyes searching his for a hint of a lie. What? Grayson asked. 
I just... Briar had to fight the viciousness trying to crawl from her throat. She couldn't tell if she was more angry or disgusted or hurt. She was... She was a noble? A high noble. A dawn. She hated her title, Grayson said, his expression upset as he sat to face her properly. Was he defending her? Didn't he know what her family was capable of? What Kira would have learned to become? Just like her mother. Just like... No. Briar tried to fight the memories that were warring their way back. She couldn't look at him. The walled-off pit in her mind cracked open. I think it'll be your corpse out of the carriage before the night's out. Her throat tightened as memories grappled with her. But I would like to get my money's worth first. That voice dug into her soul. And had Grayson been with Kira that night? Miles away in Carrenford. Perhaps in each other's arms like Briar had just been in his? Briar realized she'd moved away from Grayson, clutching her nightgown around herself. And the dawns, they look so perfect. No doubt who he'd be with if Kira was alive, a voice taunted. It was the truth. His life would be perfect, and Grayson would have passed her monster in those very halls. No, worse. If things had gone just a little differently, he could have passed her in those palace halls while he held Kira's hand. Briar had to cover her mouth to force back a sob. Grayson was just staring at her with wild, uncomprehending eyes. Would he have even noticed you then? Would he have even... Looked twice at what you might have become? You need to leave. Her voice was shaking. It didn't matter what he thought. She couldn't be near him for one moment longer. Briar, get out. She couldn't look at him. He'd have become one of them for the woman he loved far more than you. Grayson stood, but he didn't move. Finally, she shot a glance his way. He looked so hurt, and it was like a needle in her chest. It's my past, Vanny, he whispered. I can't change it. Did you call her that, too? Briar asked. Grayson's lips actually twitched up at that. He really didn't know how to read a room. She might have been a noble, but she was no queen, he sighed. What we had was very different. She was... She was a broken girl. Yeah, well, Briar thought. Out of the frying pan, prick. I need you to go. Please, Briar, just... He sounded so lost. She wanted to demand he leave again, but words failed her. Briar clenched her jaw, and it took a long time for her to find the courage to look into his eyes. His beautiful, caring eyes that saw so deep into her soul. I came here to avenge Kira, he said. But I found something much more important. He swallowed. I'd give that up for you. Give her up for you. But you must, too. My revenge? He didn't understand. Not if he thought he could ask that of her. He would never understand. I see your hatred. He looked close to tears himself. But I can also see how much more you are beneath that. His words felt empty next to that abyss. I can't. I can't do this, she said. Okay. He swallowed. Good night, Briar. It was the last thing he said before he left. Chapter 22 Grayson knew Briar didn't want him after tonight. That knowledge tightened his chest with panic. A million plans to get her back were already getting to work in his brain. But the thing was, for now, he couldn't afford to wait to find out if she'd take him back after the trial. Any of them could die tomorrow, including his last chance for information about Silas. So... Until Briar would have him, he was Kira's. And that part of him, Kira's part of him, 
It had never stopped planning. As the evening dragged on, Grayson waited for a very long time in the dovecote. The breeze was enough to make his fingers freeze, even if it was summer. He waited, praying that Venus Donovan's routine would be the same tonight, as it had been for the last few weeks. There wasn't much in the way of seating in the cold tower with its wide open windows and the sound of rustling and cooing from a thousand birds. The one small slab of stone that might be a bench was covered in bird shit. Lovely. He heard footsteps on the steps outside and jumped to his feet, pretending, as he had for the last four visitors, that he was rolling up a piece of parchment for delivery. He fiddled with a piece of string as the newcomer stepped through the arch. He was relieved to see Venus. She had her hands tucked into her pockets as she stepped in, giving him a nervous smile as she walked to one of the towering pillars that sheltered the birds from the rain. Crow or dove, do you think? Grayson asked, his frigid fingers fighting to tie the string as he turned to her. Never sent anything from here before? Oh, the crows are much less lazy, Venus said. But I usually go with a dove in the end. They're easier to bribe. She pulled out a dinner roll from her pocket and began to tear it into pieces. Ah, Grayson said. Didn't think of that. I can get you one, she offered. Venus was sweet. He learned that from watching her the last few weeks. She was sweet and lonely. How far are you sending it? She asked, turning dark eyes to him. Her straight black hair was tied in a ponytail. Her pale cheeks were flushed pink. She didn't look the warrior type, but she was fierce in training. Karenfurt, Grayson said. The doves will be fine for that, she told him. That's where I send mine every week. That's unusual, Grayson murmured. Venus raised her eyebrow at him. Why is that? she asked. It's just, he laughed. Most of us don't have people to send letters to regularly. That's true, she replied a sad smile on her face as she looked at him. I suppose it all depends on why we're here. Grayson grinned. Nothing special about me. No family, really. Though I thought I'd send this one to my distant aunts, so if I die tomorrow, she'll at least know what happened. He wrinkled his nose. Just doesn't seem quite right for no one to know in the end. I get it. Venus's voice was quiet as she regarded him. I don't... I don't really even know why I send these anymore, after... She trailed off. Her hand drew up to her neckline, tugging on a necklace for a second. Well, she forced a smile. Like you said, feels weird not to. She turned back to the tower of nesting birds. Grayson watched the necklace swing free, and his heart tripped as he saw it. Two clear hexagons of glass, immortalizing the lavender. Grayson stared at it, his mind racing. He opened his mouth to say something but paused. Venus had lured a dove before taking it in her hands and turning to him, proffering the white bird. It cocked its head at him curiously. You, you go first, he swallowed. I, I don't know if it's even worth sending. Venus looked at him sadly as he forced a smile. You're lucky. He lifted the rolled-up parchment. I think mine will just end up kindling. He stepped away, crumbling the parchment and stuffing it in his pocket, before ducking through the archway as if giving up on it. He measured his steps, making sure they were appropriately slow as he took the spiral stairs. Once on the second floor, he crossed the large semicircle of a balcony. It was directly in the path between the dovecote door and the girls' dorms. He tightened the scarf around his neck, feeling the goosebumps across his skin. Over an hour he'd been in the dovecote, the cold air seeping into his bones, but the tricks he'd learned in the grimy alleys of Karenfurt had never failed him. The emerald of his scarf was distinct around his neck. She'd not miss him when she walked by. So he waited, hunched, the empty parchment with a string tied around it 
crushed in his fist. He tried not to think about Briar right now, of the fact he was betraying her. But then, was he? Or had she betrayed him? Other women, they'll just use you, Kira had said to him once. They'll take and take and never give anything back. You'll only be happy with me. Grayson had thought Briar was different after she'd healed him that night. But now, well, he'd offered her everything. And she'd looked at him with such hatred. It was like a dagger twisted in his chest. He closed his eyes, trying to remember the way Kira had looked at him. She'd loved him unconditionally. He squeezed his eyes tight shut, trying to untangle it all. So when he felt a gentle hand on his shoulder, the grief on his face as he looked at Venus was totally real. Are you okay? She asked. Course, he said gruffly. He rested his elbows on the stone balcony, looking out at the forest and mountains the summer sun had dipped behind, light still lingering across the sky. I think you're a liar, she leaned toward him. Anyone who says they're okay with what we have to face tomorrow isn't telling the truth. He snorted. Yeah, well. A long silence drifted between them. She shifted, looking a little awkward in his periphery, as if she didn't really know why she'd come or what to say. This, at least, was something Grayson was very comfortable with. Venus came from a well-off family. Her mannerisms reflected those he'd spent years with in the palace. He waited for just the right amount of awkwardness to settle before he broke the silence. That's a beautiful necklace. Venus reached for it, closing her hand around it, her smile now broken. Thank you. Grayson turned to her, holding her gaze. My mother used to sell necklaces just like that, in the stands in the west side of Karenfort. They aren't as... He glanced at an extravagant jeweled ring on her finger. Expensive as other jewelry, but I always thought they meant so much more. She looked at him with new eyes. I had it pressed. You chose lavender? Her grip tightened around the pendant, her eyes suddenly bright. Not exactly. She looked like she wanted to say more. Grayson let the silence drag on, waiting. My sister, she died a few weeks ago. Her voice shook slightly. He glanced at her out of the corner of his eyes, suddenly reassessing everything about this situation. A few weeks ago would match up with when he'd caught Silas visiting her dorm. Venus shifted closer to him, just the slightest bit. I know she's watching over me. I'm... I'm sorry. He waited just a beat. I lost my sister when I was younger. It's never been the same. There was a lump in his throat. Venus's hand came to his, squeezing it tight before letting go. Then she seemed to wonder if that was too much, her eyes nervous. The necklace? Grayson asked. It's for her? Venus relaxed and then shook her head. From her. Grayson searched her eyes. This was not what he'd been expecting. This wasn't fear, or a woman threatened into silence. Follow your instincts, forget what you know, was what old Varen had taught him. It's from her? Like she's watching over you? She was sick, just like me, Venus swallowed. I couldn't convince her to come here. The potion, poison, right? Venus twisted the necklace in her fingers. But now I'm a mage. I'm not sick anymore. It saved me. She wouldn't do it. I guess she was braver than me. Sometimes, sometimes I don't know if I chose wrong. Grayson met her eyes and found they were wet with tears. This was not a woman threatened into silence like he'd been expecting. If I tell you the next part, Promise not to think I'm crazy? 
There was a laugh in her voice, despite the fact she was wiping her eyes on her sleeve. Cross my heart. Venus tugged on the necklace nervously. I was so close. I thought it was over, that I'd made a mistake coming here and leaving her to die alone. We were... We were supposed to do everything together, but then the universe gave me a sign. A sign? Grayson side-eyed her, a smile playing on his lips. Right, okay, I know. But her fingers closed around his wrist again, like she wanted him to believe. Lav is watching me. She wants me to survive this damned place and live a ridiculously long life for us both. She lifted the necklace. When she left me this, she told me. There was too much to process. Lav? Grayson asked. Lavender, she said. My twin. My other half. Her lip quivered. Grayson's mind was careening out of control as he stared at her. She left you that after she died. You promised not to say I was crazy, Venus said, but then her expression fell. It appeared when I was about to give up. Okay. Grayson forced a smile on his face, puzzle pieces trying to fit together in his mind. Sounds like a sign from the universe when you put it like that. A long silence fell between them. Then Venus giggled. I, I'm sorry. That was really heavy. I don't even really know you. Grayson shrugged. I think we can be forgiven for being a bit emotional tonight, he said. It was nice, actually. Made me feel better. Good. Venus's eyes shone. Me too. I should go, though. She gave him such an honest smile and then stepped back from the edge. Good luck tomorrow. Briar was out of things to break in her room, unless she wanted to rip the stuffing out of her fox or tear apart her patchwork cloak, and she'd not give her monsters that. First, she opened her book full of letters and tore all the pages out, stuffing them into her pockets, as if keeping them there would give her confidence she didn't have. Then, she hurried out of her room. She'd use her time tonight to prepare, to give herself a better chance tomorrow. She knocked sharply on Silas's door, trying not to let her irritation and insecurity come up in her expression as it opened. He wasn't in the trial tomorrow, so if he wasn't doing anything, and let's be real, he was a loner, he could bloody well help her. Only it wasn't Silas who answered. Well, what do we have here? Medora Rose was looking down at Briar through the crack in the door. Briar's heart felt like it was bottoming out of her chest. Her throat was tight. She couldn't find any words. You have a visitor, Medora said over her shoulder before turning back to Briar. I was just leaving. Her ringed finger brushed Briar as she stepped by. Briar flinched away, searching her expression and finding nothing at all. She was unnervingly blank. It had been that way every time Briar had met her gaze this term. You know, she said quietly, not even contempt in her dull, violet eyes. The eyes, they suit you. Briar couldn't move as Silas appeared at the door. She couldn't look behind her to watch Medora's long black ponytail swinging behind her as her boots clicked on the stone as she departed. What do you want? Silas was asking. Nothing, Briar muttered. She was taking a step away from him. Her heart was slamming into the walls of her chest. Panic tried to claw its way up her throat. Wait. Silas stepped after her. His eyebrows knotted. Are you? He trailed off, eyes darting to the hallway behind her. Are you jealous? He asked. He sounded a little surprised. No. Yes, wildly, inconceivably. She wanted to stab him, again. 
Briar dug in her pockets, gripping her letters, desperate for them to be there, to ground her. You're off balance, Briar. Rein it in. But how? How dare he? She's... Isn't she with Locke? She doesn't seem that committed to me, Silas shrugged. Look, I have some new information. We could... No. Briar's voice was cold. I'm all set. Silas was scratching his temple. I don't... Briar was backing away. I'm set. He looked like he wanted to come after her, but she was turning and already hurrying down the hallway. Everything was falling apart. After half an hour of tormented wandering, of self-doubt, or trying to decide if she'd made another huge mistake, she found herself in the potions room anyway. She really should get a few last-minute readings in. She settled into the couch, her eyes desperately trying to read the lines of a page on one of their smuggled books. Briar couldn't take in a damn thing. Instead, she drew out the letters from her pocket and tore them all into pieces. Fuck. Then she grabbed some scraps and a quill from the little table next to the couch, scribbling furiously. Nothing makes sense anymore. I'm the one who needs you, not... Tears welled in her eyes. She scratched out the lines. I hate you. Her hand was shaking as tears fell onto the words and smeared them. She was a coward. She wanted Grayson so badly. She stood and threw the quill at the wall with a scream, the scatterings of torn-up letters fluttering around her. She couldn't believe she'd considered delivering them. Then Briar froze. Axel was in the doorway, a dumpling halfway to his lips as he stared at her. He raised an eyebrow. What? Her voice was high and unsteady. Axel tucked the dumpling back into his shirt pocket and tugged the red flask from his belt, holding it out to her. When she shook her head, he unscrewed the cap and took a drink himself. Not getting a last-minute shag on with Grayson? He asked as he strode across the room and threw himself down on the couch. You'll both be dead tomorrow, won't you? She just stared at him with narrowed eyes. Then she stalked over and snatched the flask from him. When she'd taken a long drink, she handed it back. She considered leaving, returning to her rooms and trying to get some sleep. But then, what if Grayson tried to come to her dorm? She couldn't face him yet. Instead, she went to her usual armchair, sinking down into it. Fuck today. A long silence stretched between them, in which Axel took another drink and Briar was happy for the slight buzz that settled over her brain from whatever it was in that flask. Never asked what you were going for, Briar said at last. He was laying with his hands behind his head, eyes closed. What demon, she wondered, would be good enough for Axel Wolf? Once she'd have thought the Valmore, the rest of their classmates expected it. He was top in everything. Yet Silas had said he wasn't interested in the vamp forms. Axel shrugged. Guess we'll see where the chips land. You don't have a plan? Who needs a plan? Literally everyone. Only fucking Axel would wing it tomorrow. Prick. Briar couldn't help but to glance at him out of the corner of her eye. You... You were in Karenfort before all of this? Yeah, why? Where in Karenfort? she asked. Axel eyed her, a smile tugging on his lips. He shook the drink. You need a little more inebriation to make your questioning sound more natural. I'm just curious, yeah? When I'm seeing Venus Donovan with her hands all over Grayson, sure. Ice crawled up Briar's spine. What was the fight over? Axel asked. That's the part I'm curious about. He's with Venus? Axel shrugged. Passed them on the balcony. She was showing off her jewelry. He seemed very interested. A long silence stretched. Something nasty was settling within her, making her feel sick to her stomach. Luck, Axel murmured. 
He's the Voira, going after the Valmor. Briar just nodded. It was predictable enough, but then the thought of Locke sent her mind on another spiral. Suppose there's no talking you out of it, though? Axel asked. Nope. Dixon transformations are pretty hot on girls. You sure? He cut off with a laugh at the look Briar gave him. I'm dying to hear about your tiff, though. Axel pushed. You finally realized he's going to stab you in the back? Right, back to Grayson. Briar paused, her throat thick. Opposite, actually. The more time passed, the more she felt she'd overreacted. Grayson was right. He couldn't change his past. They were here, now. And their histories weren't pretty. Not for him, or for Briar. He dumped you? No one dumped anyone. Well, she didn't think so. But maybe. If he was with Venus Donovan, did he think that? Tomorrow she was supposed to be fighting one of the nastiest demons that the Academy had to offer. Yet right now, she was a pathetic schoolgirl worried about boyfriend troubles. She felt so small. Well, I didn't see that one coming, Axel mused. I'll admit. He told me about Kira Dawn, Briar said quietly. Silence hung in the air between them. Briar watched Axel's expression stiffen just slightly. And that bothered you? That he loved someone like that? Briar breathed a laugh. That he'd loved a dawn. That's... Axel trailed off, tilting his head slightly. That's an interesting statement. She didn't reply. How could she? But the truth was shallow and sad and selfish. She saw that now. Grayson had talked about Kira like she was just another person, as if she had been just like Briar, or him, or anyone else. But Briar wasn't ready to accept that. Nobles weren't like them. Silas, and he wasn't even a high noble, had proven that over and over. Axel chewed on his cheek. That's why you had a fight? Yeah. Briar was watching Axel carefully now. Did... Did you love Kira too, then? Something about the way Grayson had been unsure of Axel set her on edge. But Axel obviously had no hang-ups when it came to nobles. He snorted. Grayson was always pissed because Kira liked me more than she liked him. So you did. She... Axel sighed. Kira mattered. That's not an answer. It's the only answer you're getting. Briar felt her stomach clench. Nobles were behemoths, towering above all their lives, eliciting love and hate without a second glance. I'm going to bed, she muttered, standing. Well, I think I'm going to join you. You were here just for my company, then? Exclusively. He joined her in the hallway, and she caught him eyeing her. Perhaps another time, even earlier this afternoon, she'd have had the energy to be on edge with him so close. But today was too exhausting. He took the spiral stairs with her, but when they met the corner at the dorm hallway, he didn't split toward the guys' hall. Briar paused, glancing at him. You're the other way. Yeah. His voice was absent, and he didn't look at her as he kept on toward her rooms. She hurried after him. What are you doing? she asked. Axel had reached her dorm and pushed the door open, peering inside as if expecting someone. What is this? Were you walking me back to my dorm on purpose? It sounded absurd when she said it out loud. Yeah. He strode into her room, pushing open her balcony doors to check outside. She leaned against the doorframe watching him with raised eyebrows. What did you expect to happen? Think Tixins are hiding under my bedclothes? Axel strode to her and closed the door, the motion nudging her into the room. Okay. Her heart was suddenly in her throat. That's enough. Get out. For him, it doesn't make sense 
to give up on you tonight, he said as he stepped into her bathroom and checked around. What? Grayson wouldn't be throwing himself at Donovan the night before the trial. He leaned against the door frame to her bathroom, eyes narrowed. He'd wait until he knew you were dead, or found out what transformation you got. Has it ever occurred to you that Grayson isn't a self-serving dick like you? In a brief moment of weakness, Axel replied. Then I found my brain. Were you planning on sticking with him during the trial tomorrow? He asked. She shook her head. Good. Don't even think about it. Why? Because I don't trust him. Not everyone is as paranoid as you. She hadn't moved from her door, trying to decipher exactly what he was doing. Silas saved Donovan this term. If Grayson's talking to her, and he had that book, then it means he's figured out. Axel cut off with a grimace. It means you need to stay far away from him until you've got a form. You think he's a threat to me? It's possible. Of course, that would be all he told her. He wouldn't hurt me. Right. Now she was ready to defend Grayson? When she'd told him to leave? She felt like an idiot. He's given it all up. She was the one who hadn't. She was the problem, not him. Axel closed his eyes, rubbing his forehead for a moment. I don't believe you're this stupid. Why? Briar asked. As far as I'm concerned, you don't think much of me at all. Might as well add idiot to the... No, he cut her off. You're relentless, resourceful, far too emotional for your own good. But you aren't stupid, kitten. She eyed him wearily. You'll say anything if you think it'll benefit Silas. He straightened. If you believe that, believe it's you I want to keep safe. Silas isn't in the trial tomorrow. She glared at him. Get out. He looked angry. She saw the way his eyes darted to the door, dropping to the open space where the lock used to be. Should have thought about that, she muttered, grabbing his arm and hauling him to the door. When you fucking ripped it off. He didn't fight her, glancing down the hallway analytically as she slammed the door in his face. She jammed the chair against the doorknob and sat down on her bed, burying her face in her hands, not sure what to think. Silas had saved Venus this term? What did that even mean? She knew Grayson wanted to find out more about Silas, but he'd told her he'd left that behind. So why was he talking to her? Briar settled under her covers, clutching her fox, and squeezing her eyes tight shut. Chapter 23 Grayson waited until Venus was out of sight before he sprinted back to his room. His roommate, Elijah, was out, probably drinking with his mates. He rifled through the notebooks in his drawer until he reached the bottom one. Then he cracked it open, flicking through the pages. There it was his notes from live symbiotes and other unusual biomage bonds. The book he'd returned to Axel. In the hour between retrieving it and returning it to Axel, Grayson had cracked it to every earmarked page and copied down the text. A complete betrayal of Briar, he'd thought at the time, but now he wasn't regretting it. He scanned the lines until he found the one he was looking for. Live biomages coexist with demons which are alive and sentient. This practice is strongly discouraged for the side effects of such a bond. A live demon will war with its host until the demon or host is destroyed. This makes live biomages particularly dangerous. The only way for them to coexist is with balancing, which is only achievable by living near a biomage of a demon that presents opposing power. For example, a pyrobiomage must be balanced by an ice biomage. Because we know little of how demon magic opposes one another, this balance can be difficult or even impossible to recreate. An unbalanced live biomage will begin to display corrupted energy. Magic 
that directly opposes that of their host demon. It is recommended for biomages to bond with demons only upon defeat. The text must be old. It was no longer recommended biomages only bond with demons upon defeat. Bonding a living demon was one of the highest offenses in Vostra. But what if Silas was a living biomage? Grayson had been coming at it all wrong. He'd been trying to research demons who would push someone to commit suicide. An unbalanced sentient biomage will begin to display energy that directly opposes that of their host demon. Silas had left lavender and chocolate for Venus when she was about to end it all. A chill crept up Grayson's spine. Briar had said a Theos Vic had come the night Morin Lance died. That was the day Briar had hidden from him and denied her his blood. Grayson had been trying to think of demons who could force someone to kill themselves, when instead he should have been thinking of the opposite. A demon that came not to incite, but to prevent suicides. Silas's demon was a Theos Vic. A living biomage bound to the god of death, unbalanced and dangerous enough to push people to kill themselves. Grayson shut the notebook with trembling fingers and slipped it back into his drawer, his mind racing. Grayson had lived at the palace. He'd never seen Silas. How could he be linked to Kira's death? And it hit him. Axel had been there the night she'd died, the night the Demon of Dawn had come for Kira. He remembered Axel's fear that night. Grayson sunk onto his bed, leaning against the wall. Axel had told Grayson to stay away. He must have known Silas back then, known that Silas was going to target Kira. Grayson had been right the whole time. She had been killed. His revenge wasn't for a demon he'd have to face once he'd survived his contract at the Dusk Breach and returned to Carinfort. It was Silas, the Demon of Dawn, at this very academy the man who'd been coming for Briar's blood since the start of term. Panic gripped him at that thought. Silas hadn't just taken Kira from him. He was taking Briar, too. Grayson had to warn her. He was at the door before he'd realized, his hand closing around the handle. Then he stopped. But what if she knows? He's not going to hurt me. That's what Briar had told Grayson once, when he'd asked her about Silas. She'd sounded so sure. Other women will use you, Grayson. Kira's old warning crept into his head. You can't trust them like you can trust me. I'm the only one who will be here for you, no matter what. But Briar had saved him that day. He'd felt the agony she'd endured just to keep him alive. She hadn't let him go. The two halves of him felt like they were at war. The half of his heart that belonged to Briar with the half that belonged to Kira. Go to Briar, a part of him demanded. Beg for her forgiveness. Tell her everything and let her make sense of it. She knew Silas better than anyone but Axel. More than that, though, she soothed him. A light in the dark that made everything better. But what if she betrayed him? What if she told Silas he'd figured out the truth? He should stay here, get through the trial, claim a form, and not tell anyone until he had a proper plan. Grayson gripped the door handle for such a long time, trembling. Fifteen minutes had passed since Briar turned the lights off in her dorm and tried to sleep. It was proving impossible. As she tossed and turned, a familiar wood-burning scent wafted across the room. She stood from her bed and stormed to the door, turning on the nearest torch. She ripped away the chair and tore it open. Sure enough, Axel was seated on the floor in the hallway, a lit coil between his teeth as he read a textbook in the torchlight. Are you joking? she asked. He didn't even look up at her, shifting the coil in his mouth. 
Tomorrow is the trial. You have to go and sleep. I've thought worse on less, he said absently, touching a finger to his tongue and then turning a page. She slammed the door, replacing the chair, heart pounding as she stared around the room as if it would give her answers. What did she care if Axel stayed up all night and died tomorrow at the trial? One less problem for her. She changed her thinner cloak to her patchwork cloak and buried herself under her blankets again. For an age, she lay in irritated silence, forcing her eyes closed for sleep that was far, far away. Fuck. She got up and opened the door again. Axel was still fucking reading. How many times have you read that book anyway? She asked. Too many, he yawned. But every time you read it front to back, it sings you a song. She glared at him, though he wasn't looking at her to see it. Go back to your room and get some rest. No can do. Nothing's going to happen tonight. One more day, that's all, he snorted. Before I never have to think about you or your insane life ever again. There isn't a chance in hell I'm letting it go to shit now. She'd never felt so incensed. He was the insane one, not her. He really believed she was in danger. It was completely ridiculous. And yet he wasn't leaving. She tapped her foot, scowling. Take the spare bed. She couldn't believe what she was saying. He did turn to her then. I'm good. Stop being an idiot. Axel sighed dramatically closing the book and standing. Well, if you insist. But put that stupid coil out. He grinned and took a long drag, finishing it. Happy? He walked by her, sitting on the spare bed and placing his book on the side table. She turned to the chair. Did she need to jam the lock if Axel was already in her room? She guessed not, turning back to see him tugging his shirt off. Stay dressed. There was no small amount of distress in her voice. It's summer. He gave her an incredulous look, tossing his shirt to the foot of his bed. Briar edged over to her bed, climbing over her chest to get to it while keeping as much distance between them as possible. She tried not to stare too hard at him, though it was hard not to eye his hulking, rippling muscles as he tugged the blankets over himself, laying down. Do you sleep wearing that much? He asked. When there are giant pricks in my room, I do, she muttered. She really didn't think she could hate someone more than she hated him as she pulled the blankets over herself. And then there was a knock on her door. Axel was up in an instant, diving for it before she was even out of bed. Don't you even... But it was too late. He'd opened it, fully fucking topless in the moonlight. Grayson was standing on the other side. Briar tried to duck under Axel's arm, which was pressed against the dresser, but her face met his hand, blocking her. What do you want, mate? Axel asked. Enough! She spat, throwing her weight at him to get him out of the way. He didn't budge an inch. Grayson! She called out to him. He's just... Despite their fight, she couldn't just... stop loving him. Everything was so confusing but she didn't want him to think she'd set this up on purpose. Nah, I get it. Grayson's voice was enough to carry past Axel. Catch you both after the trial, I guess. Axel slammed the door in Grayson's face. No! But she cut off as Axel clamped a hand over her mouth painfully. He pinned her against the dresser for long enough that Grayson would be halfway down the hall, and her struggles weren't enough to move him an inch. She hated that there were tears in her eyes by the time he let her go. Get out! Her voice was a screech. I thought you two were in a fight anyway. He gave her a derisive smile. That's why you're here? Call it a bonus. Theos. Reality was sinking in. Grayson would think she'd done it on purpose. That she was so angry at him, she'd chosen the one person in the world that would piss him off the most. But he couldn't think she'd... She'd invite Axel into her room. Well, she had. Sort of, but not like that. 
You think he's less likely to be a problem for me now? She asked, her voice thick with tears. You don't make any sense. Axel shrugged. Nothing that happens tonight will change a thing, kitten. Briar shoved him, feeling rage royal in her chest. Get out of my room! He didn't even budge from where he towered over her. Briar ducked past him, reaching for the door handle. If he insisted on staying here, she'd find Grayson herself. Explain. Axel grabbed her arm, pulling her back. You're staying here until we leave for the trial tomorrow. You can't do this! Panic was setting in. I can do whatever you can't stop me from doing, he snarled. You know that. Isn't it why you're going for the Valmore tomorrow? Her breathing was getting out of control, anxiety careening through her veins. She blinked away more tears. If you survive, he was saying, and I'm wrong, you'll have the rest of your life to explain to him what a prick I am, how I set this up. You think he won't believe you? He hates me. And if I die tomorrow? she asked. She hadn't realized until now how much she believed it would happen. This will be the last thing he remembers of me. She was sobbing in earnest now. Axel wrinkled his nose, leaning back from her. Then I'll tell him. You're a liar, a monster, he muttered, but not a liar. He hauled her across the room by her arm and shoved her down on her bed. If it makes you feel any better, this was never going to be a request. She dragged herself away from him, pressed against the wall, wiping tears from her eyes and fighting back more. I fucking hate you! It sounded so childish. Axel shook his head, snorting. You have half his magic, he said, a finger pointed toward her. I hate you for that. Briar's sleep was restless and full of demons, worse than the ones she'd face the next day. She sat in an office she'd visited a million times before, in nightmares. Professor Hart sat before her, a concerned expression on his face. He was young for a teacher and had always taken a great interest in Briar and Maddie, giving them extra help whenever they needed it. Given where Maddie had come from, she'd needed a lot of guidance in mainlander schooling. Maddie's in trouble? Briar had asked. Professor Hart nodded grimly. I've had some concerning information from a Voira envoy about her. Did you know she's on the run? Briar shook her head. Father told me she's not a Voira anymore. They'd adopted Maddie and her younger brother two years ago, when Briar was thirteen. The two of them had become inseparable. Do you know what a Voira signy is? Professor Hart asked. Yes. Briar's voice had been low, her heart racing. Maddie had told her. An invisible signy of magic branded onto the body of Voira girls at a young age. Each signy was unique. When they were old enough, a Voira man who'd learned what it looked like could take ownership of the woman. Maddie left because she didn't want anyone to know hers. These Voira asked after her. They have a list of signies from runaway girls from the island. You, you can't let them near her she'd whispered. Look, I might lose my job for interfering, but if I can get a look at their signy list, I can check if they have Maddie's. Can... Briar felt hesitant. Can you take me to see the list? No, I'm afraid it's too risky, Briar. Professor Hart had leaned forward in his chair, rubbing his short beard. Are you her signy keeper? He asked. Say no. But this was a nightmare not a dream. So Briar was forced to watch on as she made one of the biggest mistakes of her life, the day she'd given away Maddie's secret. And we can't tell anyone else about this, all right? He'd said. It has to be our secret. Get up and leave, now. Briar tried to scream at her younger, foolish self. Just draw it out for me and I promise I'll burn it after. Don't trust him. You drew it for him? Her father had asked later. She'd heard the fear in his voice, and he was always such a calm man that Briar had felt terrified. 
I thought... Tears had welled in her eyes as she'd realized what she'd done. I thought she was in trouble. He said he would help. There was a thump on the floor, and Briar looked up to see Maddie staring at her from the railings above. She'd dropped the hairbrush and head wrap with embroidered eagles she'd been holding. Father had bundled Maddie and her little brother off that very evening, and Briar had lost her best friend, her sister. Harboring a runaway Voira was illegal, so her father had been able to do nothing about Professor Hart. Briar had been pulled from the school, and she'd spent the rest of her education alone on the manor grounds. She'd never forgotten the betrayal in Maddie's eyes when she'd realized what Briar had done. Chapter 24 Luperat Magic, Instinct Demon Type, Rogue Symbiote Calling, Violence Appearance, Eight-Foot Biped Colors Vary Luperots have wolfish features, and their claws and teeth are made of silver. Biomage Form, Werewolf other. Luperots prefer to live in areas where violence occurs. They are drawn to violence, and often live in nature surrounding cities. Luperots will often try to live in the poor areas of cities to feed off of violence. Some cities in Vostra welcome them. It was one hour until the trial. The sun scorched Briar's skin on the trek down the path past the pits. The faculty set the trail up in the forest at the edge of the protection spell, so they'd have the canopy from the evergreens to shield them from the sun. Biggest relief for me. Axel was trudging along at her side, much too chipper for a morning like this. You don't snore. She was ignoring him. He'd left to get ready before she'd woken. By the time she got up, he was having a coil on her balcony. He was completely fucking insane. Squads share a room at the breach, right? Can you imagine being on a battlefield with demons all day? Then you can't sleep all night? She glanced at him with an irritated quip on the tip of her tongue, but she kept her mouth shut. He didn't even deserve that. Her eyes scoured the other students, hoping to spot Grayson. This was not how she wanted to leave things. She hugged herself. She'd slept like shit, waking over and over, for one moment thinking that she'd find Grayson next to her and instead spotting the slumbering shadow of... of him. She shuddered. There he is. Axel tapped the back of her arm with his finger, then pointed. She followed the direction of the gesture. Trees were sporadic past the pits, getting denser as the forest closed in. Leaning against a tree arms folded and tense, was Silas. Even from this distance, she could see his scowl as he watched the other students trudge by. Glad for an excuse to get away from Axel at last, she started toward him. Oi! Axel snapped. She glanced back. Stealth! Right. She drew it up without another word and headed for Silas. He didn't see her until she was almost next to him, where she lowered the stealth just a little. He jumped. Shit! But then he went a little fuzzy as he drew up his own stealth. She was close enough to him that he came back into focus, but it took a few seconds. They were off the path, but it was best if no one saw this next part. You all right? Silas asked. No. Her voice was tight. You need a tighter leash. She glanced back at Axel as he wandered down the path. I tried. He's bloody possessed. Silas shrugged. I can't do fuck all when he gets like this. What a comfort. Well, shall we get this over with? Silas was drawing his dagger out. Yeah, she grimaced. The idea of drinking his blood was grueling. He was about to draw the dagger across his arm when she held her hand out to stop him. Hold up. There was humor in her voice. What if I said I wanted it from your neck? Seems only fair, right? Well, then I'd say you should have brought a stool. She bit back a grin, but waved him on. He drew the knife across his skin and held his arm out to her. The tang of iron and blood in her stomach was enough to make her want to throw up. 
but she drank until her magic pool stopped filling. Well, she wiped the smear of blood from her lips as she stepped away from him. That is a lot of magic. She didn't think she'd ever had all of it before. Still gotta go easy on it for the Signy to work. He sounded anxious. I know. Except the first few minutes. Deepest stealth you can until the fighting's over. The first few minutes were for the Luperots. I know. She raised an eyebrow at him. We've gone over this a thousand times. All right, then. He clasped his hands. Guess I'll see you when it's over, then, she asked. That's the plan. He was pale, though. His eyes narrowed as he stared at something past her. What? She turned. I thought I saw... His eyes were scanning the surrounding trees. Briar saw nothing as she followed his gaze. You're paranoid. It's your fault, he grumbled. On the bright side, if I die, next term will be much quieter for you. He snorted, but he was still stiff. Kind of you. What? To pretend, he said. Her brows furrowed, but he gave her a look. Briar, if you die here and take that magic, I die too. She felt something tighten in her chest, but she forced herself to roll her eyes. You'll find a way. Axel will if you don't. She smiled, for some odd reason feeling the urge to comfort him. Anyway, think of it this way. If I don't die, I'll never be a threat to you again. That, to be honest, was going to be a relief for her. So you're saying if you get a vamp form, you aren't going to be coming for my blood in revenge? Briar grinned. You know, I might at that. Once more, the conversation did that thing where it went dead when they got a little too amiable. Ah, uh, okay. Good luck, then, he said. Yeah. She took a step away with a nod. Remember the marked trees, and don't help anyone unless you want an aladron. Briar rolled her eyes. Actually, he added, on second thought that would be great. Help everyone. She grinned and lifted her hand to him as she walked away, waving. The warden's voice echoed into the surrounding trees. The arena is marked by a silver barrier. No demons will enter or leave. The midsummer sun filtered through the canopy above as the magical silver barrier descended behind Briar. Other students stood spaced out around her. Two down was Oakley, one of the Voira, but that was it. Neither Grayson nor Axel were nearby. Once a student destroys a demon, they will be ejected from the arena. Students may only enter the arena with an academy-provided knife. Violation of this rule will lead to execution. Briar glanced behind her. The barrier shimmered, her reflection staring back at her. Her tangled blonde hair was tied in a tight bun, her cloak looped around her waist in the heat, and the short cropped sleeves showed off the tone of her arms. Her amber eyes were tired and hard. One year ago, they'd been green, and her father had been alive. She had transformed into something new. To her name, she had a knife and her magic, and today she'd kill a demon and walk away with its transformation, or she'd die trying. The moment the arena closed, the air crackled with magic. Briar reached out and pulled stealth over herself instantly before crouching. She remained perfectly still. If no one had watched it happen, she'd be invisible. Her stealth was something she could rely on and it should get her safely through the first few minutes. A few other students broke into a run, stealth blurring them if not obscuring them completely. To her left, Oakley flung a knife toward Kylo Tyne, who'd almost vanished into the trees. In a flash of gold, the knife struck his glint, bouncing off. Oakley made chase, grabbing her knife from the ground as she did. Kylo, clearly in a panic, stumbled on a root, only just able to keep his footing. Oakley closed the gap and Kylo gave up all notion of running, 
tugging his own knife from his belt, stealth gone. The two fell into a vicious fight. Wait it out. Silas's instructions rang in Briar's head. A scream sounded in the distance, and then the air beside her opened up like a fissure, the black void forming in the shape of something giant. It was one thing, seeing a Luperod in her textbook. It was another, watching the beast manifest before her. It was ten feet tall on its hind legs, wolf-like claws and teeth glinting in the daylight. It's drawn to violence, not fear. Briar had to remind herself of that. The Luperot was so close she could feel the heat of it, the air shifting as it prowled by, ears pressed back as it let out a low growl. Its claws hovered in the air right before her. They glinted, and brown gunk crusted the bases, as if someone had jammed them into the creature's flesh. Briar had never imagined that the demons would smell, but the air reeked of old marshes and rotting meat. Briar, slowly, so as not to disturb her stealth, pressed a hand over her mouth, trying to keep her breathing as quiet as possible. Kylo and Oakley were both now half-focused on their fight and half-focused on the creature that had its beady crimson eyes upon them. Then the Luperot pounced for them in a blur of silver fur and frightening muscle. Briar heard Kylo's scream, even if she couldn't make out what happened. Blood spattered a nearby tree. There was a flash of golden glint, a scuffle, a deep, pained howl, and then the Luperot turned to black dust. To Briar's surprise, it was Kylo who'd vanished with it. Oakley swore loudly, rubbing the skin around a nasty gash on her arm as she healed it. She was already glancing around, trying to spot out another of the creatures. By the sounds of the snarling, screams, and howling around them, many more had been summoned. As Oakley charged into the trees, Briar felt safe enough to take a few careful steps. She could see no one else, which meant either everyone had left or others were hiding in stealth just like her. Her movements were slow enough that her stealth should remain intact. But she drew her glint up. Even if it was the weakest magic she had access to, she'd feel safer with it on until she was far from the starting zone. As Briar passed Kylo's blood spatter on the tree, she couldn't help wondering if he'd survive. She'd also felt a pang of envy. They'd been terrified of this goddamn trial for five months. For Kylo, it was over in minutes. Briar's path ahead was far longer. Chapter 25 Tixen Magic, Instinct Demon Type, Rogue Symbiote Calling, Extreme Cold or Heat Appearance Eight-Foot Biped Corporeal Tixen are tall, slender, humanoid demons with retractable claws and sharp, uneven teeth. They have four wings on their back, comparable to dragonflies. Color denotes type. Water Tixen are blue and white. Forest Tixen are brown and green. Biomage form. Fey. Different types include water, forest, mountain, desert. Other. Tixen are drawn to humans suffering extreme temperatures. They live in many different areas of nature, and their form varies by location. Briar left her atmospheric magic on a low burn as the sun sunk in the sky, warming her skin against the chill breeze. If she got too cold, she risked drawing a Tixen. She had to be careful to look out for other students as well. She was sure most of the Luperots were claimed by now, but it would be foolish not to stay on alert for the first few hours. Her job now was to find symmetry in the forest, and then camp out and wait for the Valmore. Briar was very careful about her magic. She had to preserve as much as possible for her signy. As time crawled by, she felt dizzy from the focus she was giving to the trees. They had all begun to look the same, but she was desperate to find the place where the Valmore would manifest before the sun set. It would get infinitely more difficult in the dark. Briar had to measure where she'd been. She reached the wall of the arena, 
a transparent shimmer of swirling silver, hung in the air, easy to see. She was marking her first tree with her dagger when she heard something. It was a sound like footsteps in mud. She circled back toward it, drawing up her stealth fully. Janine Perrin was kneeling on the forest floor before a dip between the trees. The soil there was a little wetter and boggier than most in the forest. Janine was using her hands and knife to dig up the mud from the bog, rubbing the mud up along her arms. Briar could see the chattering of her teeth as she did it, the wet clearly doing nothing for the cold. But Briar knew what demon she wanted, and if she was using mud, she was looking for a specific type of tixen. The arena would naturally manifest forest tixen, but Briar knew there were water, fire, and air fay too. Janine looked to have been sitting there for a long time. Midday was long gone, and there were many layers of mud caked on Janine's skin. From here, Briar could see she was shivering violently. She was about to leave when something flickered into life beside Janine. Briar took a quick step back. They'd all been told that the Tixin were the cheat way out of the arena, that a fey transformation was the easiest to come by and the weakest, but all of them were going to the Duskwall Breach, and that meant no demon here was weak. Sure enough, the water Tixin was terrifying. It was a humanoid creature, willowy and just as tall as the Luperot, with skin that was smooth and silver blue. It shimmered faintly in the moonlight, and the edges of its bones could be seen pressing against its skin. Four tattered wings rose from its back like a dragonfly, and its piercing round white eyes were ringed with black. It opened its mouth as it looked down at Janine, pearly jagged teeth bared. Janine threw herself back, her face a mask of terror. To her credit, though, she had her dagger clutched in her fist. She composed herself quickly as white claws slid from the Tixen's fingertips longer and longer. Janine dived at it, blade glinting in the setting sun. The Tixen vanished, then reappeared behind Janine with a flicker. Fuck. Briar had never seen anything flit before, and it threw her off. Janine, who was still trembling with the cold, turned, but was too slow to duck out of the way. The Tixen's claws sliced open her cheek. Janine screamed, clutching her face and staggering back. Don't help anyone. Silas's words rang in Briar's ears. She knew they were right, but it was still a war not to do something. Janine threw herself out of the way, as the Tixin leaped at her, claws slashing again. She seemed to be finding her composure after the initial shock of facing the terrifying creature, months of training kicking in. And then it was a whirl of a spar, the Tixin flitting here and there, Janine smart enough to draw up her glint the moment the Tixin vanished, predicting a blow. Her glint wasn't enough that blood didn't bloom from her wound on her side. Janine was quick, though, a good fighter, and finally... She managed to duck her way past Claws and sink her blade into the center of the Tixen's chest, a death blow. Both turned to black dust and swirling smoke and vanished. Briar let go of her stealth, her heart racing like a hummingbird's wings. She tried to stifle the horror and doubt rising in her chest. That had been the weakest creature, and she, fool that she was, was trying to find the Valmor? You can do this, she told herself. You've trained relentlessly, and you know its weaknesses. Still, she had to hold herself against the closest tree as she warred with the urge to throw up. Would she have won against the Tixin? She'd entered the academy a worse fighter than Janine, but now? Now, well, she wasn't sure. Briar forced herself onward, steeling herself against the terror. She had come to peace a thousand times with the idea that she'd die in this academy. Yet seeing the horrifying claws and teeth of that death over and over wasn't making her conviction stronger. Briar kept on marking more trees with her knife, dread settling in as the sunlight faded around her. What if someone else had found the symmetry before her? 
Silas wasn't the only one who ordered books from Carinford. Briar was picking her way through endless trees as dusk began to fall, and still no luck. That was when she heard a sharp laugh ahead. Briar narrowed her eyes, drawing stealth over herself again. She crept through the trees to investigate, seeing the flickering light of a fire up ahead. As the voices came closer, she recognized some of them. Ace and Locke, the Voira. Briar knew Locke was going after the Valmore. That meant if they were there, she forced herself to get closer, slinking in the shadows of the trees, even with full stealth, as she tried to examine the clearing. Briar looked up, and her breath caught. In the very last light of the setting sun, she could see the foliage above. Four symmetrical oval shapes among tangled branches met right above where the Voira had set their camp. This was the symmetry that the Valmore would be drawn to. Briar had no doubt in her mind. If she'd arrived even ten minutes later, she wouldn't have been able to see it in the darkness. Her eyes found the thickest tree near the clearing. She picked her way toward it carefully and crouched down, sinking into its roots. She could feel the warmth of their fire from here, which would be useful as it meant she wouldn't have to use her atmospheric magic. Briar settled in, releasing her stealth, knowing it would be a long night. She wouldn't dare sleep. When the Valmore appeared, she'd be fighting the Voira for it, but she'd known this would be hard. So she sat and waited tensely as the Voira chatted. Right in the fucking eye, Ace laughed. Delilah killed her so fast, it didn't even summon the damn Luperat. Saw her steal one off someone else, though. You okay with that, Ryder? He asked. I wouldn't want a wolf for a partner. I don't care, Ryder shrugged. That's what she wanted. Ace snorted. Ryder, who was the only one Briar could see from her hiding spot, rested his head against the tree and closed his eyes. Briar tried to tune out their voices and distasteful conversation. She felt a strange peace descending on her now. This was it. Everything she'd worked for. What she and Silas hadn't anticipated, though, was an entire group of Voira to fight through. So Briar began to plan. Best would be to wait until Locke was properly in a fight with it. Wait until he'd been wounded. Contesting someone else for the Valmore was something she and Silas had discussed. They'd concluded that allowing another student to fight it, then slipping in for the kill at the very last minute, was her best bet. The Valmore fed on betrayal. It was not a demon of honor or integrity, like the Eladrin or Drockert. Stealing the kill from another student was unlikely to affect her bond with it. It was a dangerous game, though, because the longer Briar let the fight go on, the more chance Locke would have to kill it. That sort of thing won't be acceptable next term. Briar was pulled from her thoughts as she heard Locke's snide voice from the fire pit. Are you talking about me? That was Ryder, and he sounded surprised. Briar saw him straighten. Yes, Locke replied. Squad picks next term. Appearance is everything. What about Delilah and me are not meeting appearances? Ryder asked. She's second only to Medora and I'm second only to you. His voice was cold. Briar craned her neck to catch his expression. Ryder wasn't a Voira she'd paid much mind to. He had short, dark curls, mid-brown skin, and his angled jaw was tightly clenched as he looked toward Locke. It's about discipline. Locke's words were very deliberate. Ryder looked tense and Briar saw his eyes shift around, as if gauging the rest of the group. You bring this up now, when she's not here? That is exactly what I mean. There was a sneer in Locke's voice. It seems to me that she makes the decisions. Do you have her signy, or does she have yours? Briar heard Ace's barked laugh at that comment. Ryder was absolutely still. I will follow your commands for glory at the breach, Locke, as will she. 
but you will not tell me how to command my vidra. A vidra, Briar knew, was the bond between a Voira man and his signy bearer. There was a long pause. Well, Locke's voice was cruel. I think we should all think about that for next term. We will have to be split among two squads, after all. Attachments could prove just as much a help as a hindrance. Some of us, he lingered on those words, will have to be split up. Briar was so caught up in the conversation that she almost missed the rustle of leaves above her. She peered around just in time to see a figure hanging from a branch above the clearing and dropping to the foliage below. Had someone been up there the whole time? Briar's mind raced for a moment, trying to figure out how far away she'd been when she'd started using her stealth. Lock, baby. It was Willow Finch's snide voice. I have a gift for you. Briar froze as Willow's footsteps approached the tree behind which she stood. Briar reignited stealth, her hand on her dagger, as Willow stepped around the trunk of the tree. She steadied her breathing, but Willow walked right by, a little skip in her step as her boots crunched twigs. Briar held her breath, her heart settling. Then in a flash, Willow spun, her knife flying right toward Briar. Briar grabbed her glint just in time, but it shattered instantly as the knife sliced across her shoulder. Not a deep cut, but enough to get a hiss from her. Briar staggered to her feet, knife out now, and made a run for it. There were too many of them to fight. But Willow must have signaled to Ryder what she was doing, because Briar hadn't made it a few steps when a weight slammed into her, and then Ryder had her arms tight behind her back as he hauled her into the firelight. Briar's dagger slipped from her grip, falling useless onto the leaves. What have we got here? Locke asked. Briar threw all her weight against Ryder's grip, panic and adrenaline lighting her veins. Ryder used a flash of amplification magic to secure her arms properly in place, and Briar grunted in pain. Saw her creeping up. She's been listening in for a little while now. Willow sounded delighted. Briar's eyes were stuck on that malicious gaze. I'll tell... Briar began, desperate for a way out of this situation. Shut up. Willow stepped toward her. You and your weak little threats. What does that mean? Locke asked. Willow grinned, eyes bright as she turned. I caught this little whore and the vamp getting all cozy in a potions room the other week, she said. Told me if I said anything, she'd tell you all that Ace was bolstering. Ace's face went white as a sheet. Fuck. Briar's throat was dry as Willow laughed. Problem is, I don't give a shit. You didn't feel like mentioning that before now? Locke was sitting on a stump, Medora at his side, and Briar hadn't realized she was there. Well, Willow mused, stepping behind Locke and placing her hands on each of his shoulders. I was keeping it for when it was important. Bolstering? Locke turned to Ace. Briar, whose arms were aching in Ryder's firm grip, was happy for the attention to be elsewhere. She eyed her dagger, which was a few feet away on the ground, but Ryder was stronger than her, even without amplification magic. She managed to glance at him, but his eyes were on Ace, like the rest of the Voira. Ace was bitter. What is wrong with you, Willow? You think I want to be tied to a guy who has to drug himself up to perform? She asked. Willow offered me her signy last night, Locke murmured. He watched Ace, but Briar noticed his eyes flicker to Medora, who was still staring at the flames. Haven't we got better things to deal with? Ace waved a hand toward Briar. What is she doing here? Ryder asked. Saw her looking at the trees, Willow said pointing at the foliage above. She's after the Valmore. A few of them laughed at that, and Locke's cruel eyes found Briar again. Tell me she's wrong, he asked. Briar didn't answer. Come on, Ryder shook her, 
twisting her arms further back. Briar gritted her teeth. You don't think you have a chance? You're about to have your own territory to carve out, Locke, baby. He's not going to be the only vamp. One of Willow's hands still rested on Locke's shoulders. Locke stood, shrugging off Willow's touch. Truth be told, Briar had secretly paid a lot of attention to Locke this term. Her takeaway was that he was cold, cruel, and vulgar. More than anything, though, his pride was the centerpiece of his existence. To say he hated Silas and Axel for taking top spot, which should, by all accounts, be the Voiras to take, would be an understatement. He walked up to Briar, an excited glint in his dark eyes, and all of a sudden, the threats of the trial, even of the Valmore, melted away. Here, she knew, was a monster, and it was made of flutters of black curls against snow-white skin and pointed canines in a cruel smile. His gaze was fixed on her. I would think, be prudent to start the next term off with a message to the mainlander prince. His voice was a low, arrogant drawl. When he reached her, he took her chin in a painful grip, forcing her to look right up at him. She tried to pull away, but Ryder's grip behind her was absolute. What do you think, little mainlander whore? He asked. I could leave your body for him to find, but then... How boring. There was a glint of silver as he flicked his knife into her vision. Her breathing hitched, her chest suddenly very tight. I'm not with him. Her voice was weak. He hates me. His smile widened as he watched her terror, his eyes tracing down to her rapidly heaving chest with a decidedly vile gaze. She's lying. Willow's fingers traced Locke's arm. You were all curled up in his arms when I saw you. Is that so? Locke asked. Briar tried to shake her head, but flinched as he tapped the blade on her cheek. How do you think he'd feel if we carved up that sweet little face of yours? Would he want you then? Something between a sob and a laugh escaped her lips. It's not, not like that, she stammered. We don't... I hate him. We mean nothing to each other. This couldn't be happening. She was not going to get carved up by Voira for a fucking noble. For a fucking noble! If only Locke had any idea of the insanity of the accusation he'd just leveled at her. We don't know all the loop rots are gone. Medora spoke for the first time, her low, smoky voice carrying across the clearing. And right now, contrasted with this terror, the sound of it was enough to calm Briar's heart. You want to risk drawing one? Ryder scoffed. Of course they're all gone. I called it, Willow hissed, nudging Locke. Didn't I say? Her eyes were on Medora. She's always angling to defend the vamp whore. Briar froze. And I saw you coming from his dorm, Willow went on. I told you. Medora's voice was cool, her words directed to Locke. I was getting information on him for you. So where is the information? Locke asked, stepping away from Briar as he turned to Medora. Briar watched a flare of excitement in Willow's eyes. He's a closed book, Medora said. I didn't get any. Briar's mind was racing, and her eyes darted to her dagger on the ground. None of the Voira were paying attention to her anymore. You haven't given me your signet, Locke was saying. But I should trust you? Briar narrowed her eyes. This, this could go south really fast. I haven't given you any reason to doubt me, Medora said. Willow's being a bitch, as usual. Locke's gaze was fixed on Medora. But she's right. Ryder's grip on Briar was going slacker as he watched. She didn't move a muscle, needing to wait for the exact right moment to break away from him. 
She's going to jump ship to the vamp as soon as she gets the chance. That was Willow again. Briar's eyes darted between them. Of course, that's the conclusion Willow would have come to. Give me your signy. Locke's quiet voice drew Briar's attention. He moved to stand right in front of Medora. As she stood to match his movement, her eyes flickered to Briar for the briefest moment. I told you right from the start. Medora's low voice was dangerous now. Her height matched Locke's, and she held his eyes. No. A long silence filled the clearing. Briar could hear her own heart thundering in her ears. Ryder's grip slackened further. Briar jumped as Locke tried to backhand Medora across the face. She moved like lightning, catching Locke's wrist as she stepped away, but Willow had moved the moment Locke had, her fingers finding the knife from Medora's belt, tearing it free. Medora released Locke and backed up from both of them. Ace, you want to make up for bolstering? Locke asked, his eyes not leaving Medora's. You're going to find Medora's signy. It was like there was a rock in Briar's throat, right here, in the middle of the trial. This was sick. I have a keeper, Medora spat. You won't find it. Medora was stepping away, but Willow was circling behind her, closing off the easy escape. Liar. The contract you signed when you got here says it has to be another student, Willow taunted. And you haven't given any of the girls your signy to keep. Shit, shit, shit. Ace was rounding on her, the seeker's signy glowing across his knuckles the magic all Voira men on the mainland were given to track down runaways. Touch me, Ace, Medora spat, and I'll kill you. Briar's eyes darted between them all, desperate. This couldn't be happening. Not here, not now. That was the thing about Signy Keepers. If a Voira man was to try and reveal a Signy on the body of Medora when she had a Keeper, it would never show up on her body. Instead, the signy would light up on the body of her chosen keeper. Ace was on her in a second. His dagger caught Medora in the arm a moment before her glint came up. All those tats to hide it, too. Willow was delighted. We'll have to get a real good look. All thoughts of escape had vanished from Briar's head as she watched the fight. Don't help anyone. One goddamned rule. But the universe had a way of playing nasty games. Because if Ace used those seeker signies on his knuckles, Medora's signy would light up like a beacon. Only, it wouldn't light up on Medora's body. It would light up on Briar's. Chapter 26 Eladrin. Magic. Instinct. Demon type. Rogue. Symbiote calling, defense, and protection. Appearance. Ten-foot quadruped. Corporeal. A stocky beast made of vines and bark. They have two curling horns similar to a bull. Multicolored crystals grow from their back and hang from the vines around their horns. Biomage form. Earth golem. Other. Eladrin reside in mountainous forests and are drawn to those who defend the vulnerable. They forge crystals from their victims and give them to those they deem worthy. Eladrin are extremely protective of their crystals, which have the ability to reveal one truth and seal one truth. It had taken Axel a good while before he'd found some of Briar's marked trees. In consideration of saving magic, her stealth hadn't been very strong and he'd been able to tail her to the Voira fire pit. Of course, she'd managed to get caught. Stifling his exasperation for later, he crept up close enough that he was positioned right behind Ryder. The man was holding Briar by her arms, but his attention was on the fight before him. Typical, this fight was, and sickening. Axel really hated Voira fuckers, but their fight was working in his favor he crept forward another pace. He'd be able to get Briar out of the chaos 
and keep the others off her long enough that she could get away. He crouched, knife in his fist, deep in stealth, as he readied to pounce. If there was one thing he appreciated about Briar, it was that she could manage her nerves. Even if she was frightened, she'd hold her play until the very last second. Axel knew he had time to get her out without using her signy. While the Voira fought one another, she wasn't in immediate danger, so she'd not burn through it until... Axel's thought cut off abruptly as Briar's back flared with an orange glow. Her signy... What the fuck? Briar ripped her arms free with a burst of strength, then elbowed Ryder in the face so hard he crashed into the tree next to Axel. There it went. Her signy. All that work, and the worst experience giving a signy he'd ever had. Damn it. If she'd waited one more second, just... Damn it! Well, new plan. Wait for her to run, then stop her pursuers. Briar scrambled for her dagger, but she didn't run. Blurring in a flurry of stealth, she ran forward, her knife coming up just as Ace Luke leaped for Medora Rose. With a sickening crunch, Briar's dagger went right into Ace's eye. Briar stood stock still, her eyes wide in horror as his body folded, peeling from the blade and crumpling to the ground. For one long second, no one moved. Medora stared up at Briar like she was seeing a ghost. The Voira stared in shock as Medora staggered to her feet, shifting toward Briar until they were back to back. What's going on? Ryder asked. Ignored me all year? And then this? Medora seemed to be talking to Briar. Briar's eyes were on Ryder, while Medora was watching Willow and Locke. You were being a bitch, Briar snapped back. Her hand shook a little as she held her blood-smeared dagger toward Ryder. Despite what she was saying, her expression was fearful. Axel had no idea what was going on, but now seemed like a good time. He burned through magic for speed and strength as he launched himself into the clearing. Willow and Locke had no choice but to engage him as he lunged for them. Axel got to Willow first, and she caught his dagger with her glint just in time. The golden glimmer along her skin exploded with the force. He tried to keep tabs on the rest of the fight as Locke made for him. Well, I'm sorry, Medora snapped. From Axel's periphery, he could see she was going for Ryder. But you're a bit of a liability. Axel's fist caught Willow in the cheek, sending her sprawling across the ground as he ducked out of the way of Locke's blade. The fight was not as much of a challenge as it should be. He'd been trained to match Voira, been trained to combat their fighting styles and patterns. This lot all fought just as predictably as any he'd come across. Liability? Briar was demanding. Axel spared another glance. Ryder looked unsure as Medora rounded on him. Briar jabbed her dagger toward Ace's dead body for a moment. Is that a fucking liability? For fuck's sake. She had a clear path out but it was like she hadn't even noticed him. Run! Axel roared as he caught Locke's forearm. But in that glance, he'd seen Briar's wrists. There were glowing golden glyphs encircling both. Locke twisted out of his grip by forcing Axel to dodge out of the way of his blade. What was going on? Those were keeper markings on her arms. She was Medora Rose's signy keeper? Why was she always so full of... Axel blocked Locke's blade with his glint. Irritating fucking surprises. Locke sent his fist into Axel's side just as there was a deep, rumbling sound across the forest. Axel grunted, turning and grabbing the man by his shirt. He slammed him into a close tree trunk with a reckless amount of strength amplification. Axel managed another glance. Ryder had backed up further, which, by the vicious look on Medora's face, Axel didn't blame him for. Willow was still on the ground. Maddie! Briar's voice was high-pitched, barely audible above the sudden sound of screeching, cracking wood. She'd retreated to Medora and was tugging on her arm, eyes fixed beyond the clearing. One of the trunks of the nearby trees was warping and twisting. Shit. The Eladrin had come, 
no doubt for Briar's defense of Medora, or now the other way around. Axel knew how good Locke was, and he didn't have time to deal with an extended duel. He had to get back to Briar. Locke engaged his strength amplification, trying to throw Axel off. Axel, however, hadn't released his either, and the wide-eyed shock on Locke's face meant they both knew Axel was burning through too much magic. From the twisting tree emerged a hulking beast made of wood and vines. Ten foot tall on all fours, with curling horns like in the pictures, the Eladrin roared into the clearing. It glowed in the shadows beyond the fire. The crystals that were growing from its bark-like skin and hanging from vines across its body shone with different purples. Axel turned back to Locke, who had been distracted by the manifestation of the Eladrin. Axel slammed his head forward, his forehead catching the ridge of the Voira's nose with one more flare of amplification. Locke went limp in his grip. He could feel the ground shaking with thundering footsteps as the Eladrin charged them. Fuck. When he looked back, Ryder had made a dive for Briar just as Medora had gone for the Eladrin. He supposed someone had to take on the beast, but Briar wasn't good enough to fight Ryder, not even close. Briar backed from Ryder, but he was quick. Axel began toward the two of them when Agony split his calf. He looked down with a growl of pain. Willow Finch had a snarl on her face as she dug her dagger into his leg. Axel gritted his teeth, crashing to his knees as the woman tore the dagger away and staggered to her feet. He didn't have time for this. His healing was already making slow work of the wound, but it was his weakest point. He managed to catch Willow's dagger on his glint, but it threw him off balance. He didn't get to look back at Briar as he caught Willow's attack, her wrist in his grip as he twisted it hard enough that she dropped the dagger with a yelp. He needed to end this quickly. But Willow grabbed at his face with her free hand, her nails dangerously close to his eyes. It caught him off guard, the attack much more feral than Voira. Axel caught Willow's elbow, and with a tremendous effort, his calf, still screaming in pain, slammed her to the ground beside him and hauled himself over her, not letting go. He adjusted, then shoved her wrists into the dirt. Her pale face was twisted into a vicious snarl. Axel was about to look back up at Briar's fight when, with a burst of her own strength, Willow lodged her knee into his abdomen. She jammed it in, and he grunted in pain. Theos, he really didn't. Axel threw his weight down on top of her, ignoring her scream at the way his grip twisted her arm. His forearm came down on her windpipe. Have fucking time for this. One more burst of amplification left his pool dangerously low, but his forearm crushed her neck almost. Axel paused, an alarming sound heading right their way. He looked up in time to see the Eladrin charging toward them. Medora was on its back, tearing into its wooden and crystal armor, and the thing was rampaging mindlessly, rearing its head and screaming. Axel was forced to dive out of the way, and Willow screamed in pain as one of the beast's massive claws crushed her arm. Its flank caught Axel, the rough texture of its shoulder level with his face. He was tossed back, his vision a blur of sharp purple crystals and twisting bark. Pain exploded across his arm, which had been sliced open by stray crystals that stuck from it like thorns. He made to turn on his back. Briar was Theos above. Axel's heart skipped a beat. A vine brushed his face as he turned. He was met with a snarling beast as the Eladrin's two front claws slammed down on either side of him, shaking the earth. It opened its mouth and roared. Its teeth were made of jagged crystals and its mouth of the same wood that formed its body, which warped and stretched as its jaw widened. Bark and tree knots coiled tight along the inside of its jaws, and somewhere from deep within pulsed the faint lilac glow, just like the light from its crystals. Its bellow was an earthy wind, smelling of moss and grass, with the undercurrent of damp rot, reminding of where the creature came from. The dusk sun, the void. Axel reached for his blade, knowing it would be useless. He'd just have to pray his glint was enough. 
The creature lunged forward, massive jaws closing, and Axel tried to scramble away. He knew it was too late, though. He closed his eyes, not ready for the pain that was about to meet him. Nothing came. He blinked, opening them to see the creature disintegrating before him, turning to black dust. He caught a faint glimpse of Medora Rose on its back, her body also fading to black dust and smoke, and then both were gone. One beat passed, and then Axel turned in panic. His eyes raked the forest, but to his shock, Ryder was lying on the ground, blood pooling from a wound in his stomach as he clutched it weakly. Where was... Wild blonde curls disappeared into the darkness. Someone was with her, their hand clutching hers. No! Axel's voice was a shout as he tried to make chase, but he needed more time to heal his calf. Grayson looked behind them, bloody knife still in the hand that wasn't clutching briars. His hateful eyes found Axel for the briefest second, and then they were both gone in a flurry of stealth. Chapter 27 Valmor Magic, Instinct Demon Type, Rogue Symbiote Calling, Betrayal Appearance Ten-foot biped, corporeal, humanoid, with six red eyes circling their head. Though blind in the traditional sense, they seek deception and betrayal. Valmor have two long fangs, large claws, and a tough black exoskeleton. Biomage form, crimson vampire. Other, Valmor exist only during the night and like to linger in forests. It is theorized that Valmor seeks symmetry and mist. Grayson felt like there was a knife lodged in his throat as they finally slowed to a walk among the trees. He knew now that he wasn't on two separate paths. It was not a choice between the half of his heart that belonged to Kira and the half that belonged to Briar. He'd overheard what she'd said to Silas before the trial. He'd followed her into the trees where she drank his blood. Briar. Briar had drunk his blood like she was... was the same as him. And then he'd overheard the words that chilled him to the bone. Briar, if you die here and take that magic, I die too. It had taken Grayson the last few hours to accept this truth, but it was indisputable. And if that conversation was to be believed, he would lose his chance once the trial was over. Kill Briar and avenge Kira. But let Briar live? Grayson might never see another chance at killing a mage as powerful as Silas. Briar was still clutching his hand. She turned to him, a grin on her face. You took out a Voira! She was almost jumping up and down. Fuck! Her smile dropped all of a sudden. So did I. She looked unnerved. Grayson just stared at her. She was his answer. It felt wrong because somehow she was still beautiful. A bundle of anxiousness, bouncing on the balls of her feet. Her hair was loose. Her blonde curls tangled about her flushed cheeks. Her petite, round lips were fixed in a frown as her amber eyes bored into his. Grayson? she asked. Are you? She trailed off, upset. Last night. Don't. He couldn't hear her apology. Not now. Not when it didn't matter anymore. He should have known it when he befriended a woman to get to Axel. He'd heard her with Silas, and after so long claiming she hated him. That wasn't hate between them. Her beauty that innocent look of concern on her face, it was all part of the veil. It had been all along. Her loyalty was with Silas. Axel, even. Axel. Grayson's jaw clenched at the thought of the man, who Kira had doted over, who'd tried to kill him, who'd crept into every corner of his life and shattered it into a million pieces. It had been like reliving the night of Kira's death again, 
when her door had opened and Axel had been there. But Kira's death had broken him. It had been a knife in his chest. He would not be victim to that again. He would not feel that again. Briar had chosen. That was clear. Even if she hadn't invited Axel in, Grayson had offered her the world. He had offered to give up Kira for her. Yet Kira had been right all along. Briar would take and take and give him nothing back. Grayson had been a fool. Now he just had to play it carefully. He closed his eyes, terrified, but Kira was pushing him on. Get close enough to take her dagger and it will all be over. Briar could see the pain on Grayson's face. His eyes were closed, his jaw clenched. Grayson, please hear me out. Adrenaline was still rushing through her veins, but she had to slow down. She knew now this was worth fixing. She took his hand in hers again, pulling him closer. I was wrong last night. She drew her arms around him, and he didn't fight her. I was stupid. She'd blamed him before, but she shouldn't have. Briar had seen firsthand how seductive the Dawn children were, how they looked like angels to the world before the doors closed and no one else was watching. Briar shoved that thought away violently. Grayson hadn't opened his eyes, but his hands came to her arms. She felt a flutter of relief. After everything, Axel, the Voira, Maddie, the world had shifted. I'm sorry. She nudged his chin with her forehead, then drew away. His hands adjusted at her waist, but he didn't open his eyes. I just want to get out of here with you. Forget the Valmore. His eyes opened wide as she said that, gauging her, his eyebrows drawn. A smile tugged on her lips. I only needed it for my... She trailed off. I don't need it if I have you. She shrugged. I just want to be with you, Grayson. Screw everything else. He took a step back. He looked... He looked angry. Now you offer me that? He asked. After... After last night? After everything I... He winced. Briar swallowed, afraid of what was trying to slip from her lips. But, well, he deserved it. I love you. Fuck. Grayson's palm came up to his forehead, one still gripping a dagger. She took a slight step toward him, reaching out, wanting to calm him. But he backed away from her. I need... Just wait, all right? He cursed again. Not exactly the response she'd expected, but okay. Was he losing it? Grayson, help me understand what's going on. She tried again to reach out to him. This time he didn't move. She ran her fingers up his arms and tugged them down gently. Hey, look at me. At last, his eyes found hers. He looked so unsure. I love you. She said it again. I just want to live, so I get to do that some more. She laced her arms around his neck, burying her face in his shoulder for a second. Please, let's just make a plan. He nodded, and his voice was quiet, unsteady. Okay. She drew back, not wanting to let go of it. A Tixin, then? She asked. What do you think? She swallowed. For me, I mean. I know you could go for something. No, I'm with you. He drew her against him, tighter at last. Arms wrapping around her desperately, he was shaking. I just want to get out of here with you. Okay, well, I guess we have to be cold, right? She asked. Find some water or something. I saw Janine do that earlier. Worked like a charm but she shuddered at the memory of the water fay. She'd had enough of demons for a lifetime. That had been an Eladrin back with the Voira. Shit. What? 
Grayson loosened his embrace, leaning back. I didn't even check if he was okay. Willow got him in the leg right before we left, and last I saw, the Eladrin was... Who? Axel. Grayson froze. Why do you care? Well, he did kind of save my ass. Briar gave him a strange look. I don't like him, but I don't want him to die. He'd have killed me. I know, but... but what? Briar searched his eyes. I just... he didn't mean to kill you. He came back. Why are you defending him? Grayson demanded. His arms had left her waist, instead gripping her shoulders. How do you know he didn't mean to kill me? His expression was twisted up. There were tears in his eyes. It didn't feel like mercy, what he did. His voice broke. Briar felt her stomach bottom out, her heart breaking at the pain in his voice. I know. She pressed her palm into his face, stroking his cheek with her thumb. Her lip trembled seeing him like this. I know. But you want to go and see if he's okay. The pain on Grayson's face vanished, replaced with something blank. His eyes were cold. It's never going to change, is it? He'll always be there between us, just like Silas will. Alarm bells were going off in her head. But because Briar loved him, because she was an absolute fool, she ignored them. Instead, she drew him closer, trying to make him understand. Pain shot into her back. Colossal, world-ending agony that made the world careen out of control. She gasped, gripping Grayson, panic scattering her thoughts. A demon. It was the only solid thing she could hold on to. Somehow, a demon had found them. She was sinking down, Grayson gripping her lowering her to the ground. She sobbed at the pain of it and tried to find him in her spinning vision. You have to... She couldn't get the words out. He had to fight it. It would kill him otherwise. He was still holding her. She was sitting now, her back pressed against something hard. Was it a tree? It hurt. Everything hurt so much. Tears were rolling down her face as she tried to focus on Grayson. Wet blood seeped across the shirt and cloak at her back. Her... her healing. That was what she needed. She drew on it, trying to close up her wounds. Her world steadied, and finally she could hold Grayson in her vision. The demon, she managed. Her voice cracked. But she was trying to look past him and into the dark forest beyond. She couldn't find it. I'm sorry, Briar. Grayson's voice trembled. But it can't be quick. You have to understand. For it to come. She was just shaking her head. The wound half closed now, but her magic. And there wasn't much left. The demon. Sensation of her body rushed back, and she was clutching Grayson desperately. Why hadn't it attacked again? Why couldn't she see it? How much time had passed? The d demon, Grayson. Her voice was a sob. He had to understand. If he didn't, it would kill him. She couldn't watch him die. Fuck, the pain was so bad. Grayson was looking around, though. Where is it? He sounded odd. Good, good. She let out another sob of relief. He finally, he understood. If he fought it, she might be okay. She might have enough healing left to... Her thoughts cut off as she saw the glint of the dagger in Grayson's hand. No. He shook her slightly. Pain shot through her back, and she whimpered, her blood-slicked finger trying to reach his face to tell him he couldn't do that. It hurt. Fuck, it hurt. There is no demon. I have to kill you. His words halted her sluggish thoughts, and she stopped, searching the dark for the monster. Her eyes found his at last. What? She didn't understand. The healing. It wasn't fast enough. Her mind was too slow. He was still looking around. 
It should have come already. He turned back to her. You are his weakness. Grayson's face was twisted in anguish. He killed her. Silas did. There were tears in his eyes. Silas killed Kira. He's a monster. Nothing made sense. Her eyes were drawn to the knife in his fist. Understand what I'm doing, Briar. But she just didn't. She didn't understand at all. There was still a demon, wasn't there? But he was just talking to her like he had all the time in the world. If killing you isn't enough to end his life, he was saying, I need the Valmore. Killing her? She shook her head. You're not getting it. He was trembling and his face was white as a sheet. It won't come until you understand. Finally, as she looked down at the knife in his grip, a part of her brain realized what was about to happen. Her weak fingers grappled with his fist as Grayson drove the knife forward. His horrified blue eyes, ones she'd once lost herself in, ones that had drowned the howls of her past, held hers as he plunged the knife into her stomach. Pain exploded again, just as the world began to blacken, and she knew if she closed her eyes, she'd never wake up. Right before the world was gone, she heard the rustle of wind whipping leaves and twigs into a frenzy. A tall, gray shape formed in the billowing twister beyond where Grayson crouched. A guttural growl rose in the air, and red eyes glowed in the night behind him. The Valmore had come for its most powerful calling, betrayal. I hope it kills him, was the last thing she thought, and then the world went black. Chapter 28 Drockard, Magic, Instinct, Demon Type, Rogue, Symbiote Calling, Sacrifice, Appearance, Ten-Foot Quadruped, Corporeal, A Wingless, Black-Scaled Drake with a Red Underbelly. They have the extended neck typical of drakes, large black fangs and claws, and a long, spiked tail. Biomage Form, Onyx Drake. Other. Drakkards are bond breakers and bond forgers. They live in deep caves and come out only to manifest for their calling or to collect misplaced gold. Tearing through the dark trees, Axel heard the guttural snarling of the Valmor before he saw the dark figure. No. She better not be. Shit. There was Grayson in the trees ahead stumbling out of the way as the Valmore flitted behind him. It was frighteningly fast, and Grayson had a number of nasty gashes already. He was panting. Axel scoured the forest floor until his gaze snagged on a bundle of shadows against a tree. He didn't hesitate. He didn't care if Grayson saw him. It was Briar he was focused on. He pressed a hand against her cheek, assessing the damage. Fuck. How long until she was dead? Minutes, maybe? Even if he thought he could heal her, he didn't have enough magic left, but she couldn't die. Alex hauled her up, holding her against his chest, trying not to focus on how cold her skin was. He had to get his bearings. He'd been keeping track of the trees, and now he spotted a familiar gnarled trunks in the moonlight. Axel didn't hesitate, trying to clear his mind as he gripped her, staggering through the forest. He was doing this for Silas, not for any other reason. If he considered for just one moment that he wanted to save her simply because it would cut him up to see her die, well, he'd bring an Eladrin down on their heads. No. He was saving her for Silas's sake only, not hers. An Eladrin wouldn't manifest for that. Hot blood leaked over his fingers as he clutched her. Axel focused on the trees and on the roots at his feet as he ran. Twice. That foul, cowardly prat had stabbed her twice? Theos. 
Last night she'd said if something happened it would be his fault. Was it? But what a useless line of thought, for fuck's sake. Axel couldn't hear her breathing over the sound of his footsteps thundering through the foliage and twigs, and it set his nerves on edge. He saw another distinctive shape of branches in the moonlight. They were almost there. It was her only chance, Silas's only chance. He dared touch her with his healing again, and wished he hadn't. She was too close to death. Don't you fucking dare, he muttered. This irritating goddamned woman was the first person with the guts to make him face his own actions. Axel was, to his core, a twisted wreck of hateful corruption. He knew that. He'd become what he had been taught to be, and he didn't know how to stop. Couldn't even shield Silas from the collateral. Then she had just slammed down like a stone wall right in his way and made him feel like absolute shit. So she better fucking live. Oh, shit. He didn't catch the thought fast enough. Screeching bark destroyed the quiet of the night. Oh, fuck. The Eladrin. And Axel had been the one to call it. He pushed himself faster, almost losing his footing once or twice. The low roar bellowed behind him, but the silver light marking the edge of the arena was visible up ahead. Would he make it in time? All he had to do was get her across the barrier. Axel! That was Silas's shout from ahead. He'd been waiting where they'd planned. Pounding footsteps thundered behind him, accompanied by enormous crashes, as if the Eladrin was smashing into trees in its desperation to reach him. He was so close, the silver swirling barrier looming. His foot caught and he stumbled, shoulder crashing into a tree. Briar almost slipped from his arms. Axel steadied himself, fixed on the silver wall he staggered toward. Once she was past the barrier, she could... she could claim it. The thing he wanted more than anything else. The thing he didn't deserve. It was the only real solution, and it had chosen her, not Axel. Silas might think him mad, but Axel had known the truth since the day he'd found her holding Grayson alive by the slightest thread. A bellowing roar blasted through the trees. It was wrong, much lower than the Eladrin, but he didn't have time to turn. The world still shuddered, with crashing footsteps too close. He had to... Something hard caught him in the back. Axel was thrown forward. Briar tumbled from his arms as they crashed into the ground. He blinked. She was laying ahead of him, and he could see that a few of her curled fingers had landed past the silver barrier. It'll have to be enough for you, Si. Axel spun, expecting to see the Eladrin looming over him, but it wasn't the Eladrin. Black and red scales glinted in the moonlight, and the huge creature's claws were digging into the bark of a tree as it loomed above. Long neck, sharp fangs. Axel threw himself in the opposite direction of Briar just in time. Heat scorched his skin, his world turning orange, Flames burst from the drunkard's jaws, tearing apart the forest, chasing him. He broke into a sprint, now needing to lead both demons away. What was that stupid thing Silas said? Double fuck. Silas waited in perfect stillness as the night crept on. He sat in the forest, the shimmering silver barrier swirling before him as he waited at the tree Axel had marked just past the barrier. The plan had changed too many times since they'd arrived at the academy. It became riskier and riskier with each change. Months of planning out of the window because of Briar, and it set Silas on edge. So many things could go wrong, and Eladrin being the first, since Axel hadn't sworn not to help Briar, no matter how many times Silas had demanded it of him. Stubborn git but an Eladrin was far from the worst possibility of the night. So far, his drained magic pool felt intact. He wondered for the thousandth time tonight whether he'd know the moment she died. If, if she died. But he was preparing for the worst. There was only one damn thing Silas had managed to swear Axel off of. So if the man bonded with an Eladrin tonight, they would make it work. There were worse things that could happen. He wasn't a part of the trial, but they'd agreed on him waiting as a backup, because screw the faculty and its rules if the alternative was death. 
Minutes ticked on as Silas waited, cold creeping into his bones. He had barely any magic left. He hated that feeling. Silas cocked his head. Was that the faint sound of hurried footsteps? He got to his feet and seized his transformation so he could see better in the dark, even if the silver barrier blurred everything. The footsteps grew louder. Something much larger was crashing through the trees, a screech in the air. Someone was fighting a demon. A few students had passed in his line of sight here and there, but he hadn't spotted a demon yet. Silas was squinting when he finally caught movement. Axel careened through the trees as fast as he could, a large shape clutched in his arms. It only took a heartbeat for Silas to recognize the pale blonde curls. His attention shifted to the huge creature of twisted wood bounding through the trees behind them both. Shit. Axel was barely keeping ahead of the thing, and it was closing the gap. What was wrong with Briar? What had happened? Axel hadn't spotted Silas yet, his focus on not tripping on the roots of the forest around him as he clutched Briar against his chest. He was almost there. The Eladrin leaped onto a nearby tree with a loud crack of splintering wood and then pounced. Axel launched himself to the side, staggering a few paces before diving forward. Axel just had to get them out and they'd be safe. The Eladrin wouldn't cross the barrier. The school might have a fit, but if it meant they lived... Axel! Silas pressed against the edge of the barrier. There was twenty feet between them, if that. The Eladrin had been slow to pivot. It was falling behind. Briar was too limp in his grip. Ten feet. He was going to... A deafening roar sounded across the forest above them. Silas looked up instinctively to see a huge, black-scaled creature with its claws sunk deep into the wood of a trunk above their heads. A drockard. Its tail swept down, smashing into Axel, sending him and Briar tumbling to the ground. The Eladrin was looming behind. Axel stood, turning to the two beasts before he leaped away from Briar. A huge plume of flames shot from the drocker's mouth, landing where Axel had just been. No! Silas's panicked yell did nothing. Alex was charging further from the barrier as the drockard pounced for him. The Eladrin's claw scraped against the forest floor as it tried to turn in the direction Axel was now running. Silas threw himself against the barrier, but it was like hitting a solid wall. The drockard was big enough to obscure Silas's vision of what was happening. He saw a glow of gold, like a flash of glint, and heard pounding footsteps amplified, too quick, heading away. Axel! The Eladrin pounced after Axel, but then the drockard's huge black frame threw the Eladrin out of the way as a flare of fire lit the trees once more. It was a burst of heat. Even from this distance, footsteps still pounded, fainter and fainter, until Silas couldn't see anything. It only took a few seconds for him to register that Briar was still here. He scrambled down to his knees beside her. She was lying face down, completely still. She was beyond the barrier, all but a few fingers. He reached for them, unsure. Would he be able to touch her if she was mostly in the arena? His grip closed around hers, and relief thundered through his veins as he tugged first her hand, then the rest of her body over the barrier. He tried not to think about how cold her skin was, or about Axel fighting two demons alone. He laid Briar down, pressing fingers into her neck. The faintest thrum, too weak, pulsed against his touch. She was alive. His dagger trembled as he cut her shirt away, blood glistening on his fingers, soaking her undershirt with red. He searched her skin until he found the wound in her abdomen, then froze. It was a stab wound not the claws of a monster. Someone had done this to her. He knew why. He knew this was because of him. Bile rose in his throat. He pressed his hands against the wound, his panic almost paralyzing him as he dared to look at her face. Briar? His voice caught as he caressed her cold cheek. Her eyes were closed, her skin was pale, and his fingers left a smear of blood. With thundering clarity, the terrible irony of the situation came crashing down on his shoulders. Black crept across his arms, his fear demanding he shift, demanding 
he act. He was the most powerful vampire the Academy had ever seen. He was the only one who wouldn't be able to save her. Wake up. His voice trembled. You can fix this. Axel would die too. He was probably already dead. And he was only here at this damned academy because of Silas. Wake up! He choked as he shook her shoulder. His body bowed over her. What was it his mother had told him? What you have, my boy, is real power. Power others will envy. He brushed his fingers against the healing signy on his chest. It was barren, dull, broken. Just like him. The boy bound to the god of death. I never wanted it, he whispered to her, tears leaking down his cheeks. He was going to lose them both. His Theos Vic waited, lurking. He was desperate to consume him, knowing it was about to win this battle he'd been on the brink of losing for so long. Briar's breaths became shallower. She was close to death now, and it was so wrong. She'd been right to hate him. She'd been right about his selfishness and contempt and pride. She'd been right about him being a monster. He bowed his head, his forehead touching hers. I just wanted to see what it felt like, his voice cracked, to save someone. This was what had come of it. Everything he touched withered and died, as poisoned and black as the shadows that crawled up his arms. Yet in that moment, light bloomed in the surrounding forest, white and green and blinding. Silas felt the Theos Vic within him change, its shadows somehow no longer poison. There was only one light on the dusk sun that could do that. He looked up, his heart in his throat. A fox made of light stared down at him. Its eyes were only inches from his, as if waiting for one more plea. Save her, his voice cracked, flooded with hope and guilt. It was the one thing he'd made Axel swear against, and now it would be him that shattered that promise. But she would die otherwise, and he couldn't, he wasn't strong enough to lose her too. Forgive me, Briar. The Theos Atlan dipped its head, great antlers passing through him, sending swirling warmth through his body. When its nose touched Briar's forehead, it vanished. Chapter 29 Atlan Magic Universe Type Symbiote Symbiote Calling Sacrifice and Resurrection Appearance Six-Foot Quadruped Green and White Aura Non-Corporeal Presents as a Fox with Antlers Plant life blooms along the Atlan's antlers and back. The type of plant life varies depending on the location of manifestation. Other information. Theos Demon. High Demon. Known inverse, Theos Vic. You chose life that day, Briar, and I became yours. The voice was the lightest whisper in her silent mind. Briar opened bleary eyes in the dark forest. Leaves rustled above. Something was wrong. Something had happened. She'd seen Maddie and fought the Voira. Then she'd run away with... Grayson. His name was like poison on her tongue. A sob caught in her throat as her hands wound around her stomach. Warm tears began tracking down her cheeks. Grayson, as if saying his name might change something. Why didn't she hurt? She should be hurting. She should be dead. Was she dead? There was no pain. Of course it was that bastard. Silas's voice was a low growl. She moved, sitting up, her eyes adjusting to the darkness. 
Silas was leaning against one of the trees. He was tense as he watched her, and she just stared at him for a long moment, her tears still flooding her cheeks. She wanted to curl up and weep. She hugged herself, feeling nothing but her open cloak and cropped undershirt. Her fingers ran along the skin on her stomach. Nothing. No stab wound. But there was cold, congealing blood. How? How am I here? Axel. Right, of course. Where is he? She didn't know why she cared. Silas shrugged. But it didn't look quite right. He... He was caught up with an Eladrin and a Drockert last I saw him. His voice was hoarse when he said that. Briar's eyes fell on the swirling silver barrier. A thousand worries crowded her head for the briefest of seconds, and then the cold silence was back. How long ago? she asked. Axel had been fighting two demons? And honestly, why was that all she could conjure the energy to care about right now? The only one who tried to warn you, and then he dragged your dumbass all the way here. Half an hour, maybe? Even from here, Briar could see the rigid worry in Silas's frame. If Axel was dead, it was her fault. The darkness in Silas's eyes said maybe he was thinking the same thing. It was hard to bite back more tears this time. He'll be back at the start then, won't he? She forced herself to her feet. Silas shrugged. Guess so. But he gave her a lingering, calculating look. They waited along the silver of the arena barrier for a long time, in silence. She realized the cloak she wore was much too big for her, and it kept getting caught under her boots. Briar shrugged it off and tossed it back to Silas, who was the obvious owner. The dark undershirt she was left with was damp against her skin, soaked with drying blood. Briar was starting to realize that she was totally screwed. She'd come out of the arena without a transformation. That was enough to get her expelled. Could she slip back in before anyone noticed? Finally, they saw the open field through the trees. At her side, Silas picked up the pace. He was paler than she'd ever seen. The start of the trial now had a few tall bonfires lit. Students sprawled around them, some in groups, some alone. All of them looked exhausted. Briar's eyes scanned them until she found a hulking figure sitting alone near one fire, the lit coil between his teeth, visible even from this distance. Some of her panic loosened. Axel had fucking lived, the bastard. She hated him still, would be happy never to have to speak to him again. But his blood wasn't on her hands. She saw Silas relax at her side. He stepped from between the trees, his expression relieved before he realized she hadn't joined him. He turned back to her, but her eyes were still searching. Then she saw the figure that made her heart trip. He lay on the grass alone, further away than most students around the bonfires, but his sandy hair and lean form wasn't something she'd ever miss again. Hey. Silas was stepping toward her. She realized she'd retreated a few steps into the trees. I have to go back in. She was turning, starting toward the barrier. Briar had no idea if she'd be able to get through, but she had to try. She'd face a thousand demons tonight, if it meant not having to face Grayson without a form. Briar! Silas caught her, tugging her to a stop. She turned, unable to control the panic on her expression. He has the Valmore! She ripped her hand from his grip. His brows drew together. Grayson? He asked, his eyes suddenly wide. There's no way. I need to go back in! Her voice was cracked with panic as she stepped away from him. Briar, you but he cut off as she threw herself against the swirling silver barrier. It was like running into a wall. Fuck, I have to! She turned to him. If I explained to the warden, you can't go in. He looked pained, 
I have to. Her voice was too high-pitched, but he cut her off again. You already have a form. Briar just stared at him. I didn't kill a demon. I know. His voice was quiet, and she was trying to read his expression. He clasped his hands together, uncharacteristically sheepish. She narrowed her eyes. What? What did you do? I couldn't heal you. His voice was barely audible. What did you do? She stepped toward him, something twisted up in her own voice. Now she focused on her magic. It felt different, more formed and powerful than before. The Atlan. If she hadn't been within a foot of Silas, she'd have missed his words. She wished she had missed them. She blinked, staring for a long, long moment. And then all the pain and rage that was coiled up inside of her came loose. You bound me to a healing demon? Not just a healing demon, the god of healing demons. She felt a surge of power inside her chest, and a blaze of light exploded outward, illuminating Silas and the surrounding trees with a bright green white. She looked down to find sharp white claws cascading from her knuckles and past her fingers. They were made of light and were almost translucent. She looked up to find Silas staring at her, his mouth hanging open. He tried to compose himself, but there was an odd grin tugging on the corner of his lips. Her world went crimson. She dived for him, driving her fist into his chest. The claws sunk right in, not even making him flinch. He barely moved. She let out a scream of rage, going for him again, trying to use the glyph Axel had given her. But she didn't have enough magic. Anyway, something about it felt wrong, hollow. He caught her wrists easily, his eyes roaming over her. Theos above. His voice was a breath. She tugged free of him, spinning to the swirling silver barrier, trying to glimpse her shifting reflection in it. For a moment, she saw herself. Her hands clamped over her mouth. Her eyes were glowing amber, just like Silas's did when he shifted. But on her head were two pointed fox ears, made of the same light as her claws. She turned to see a long tail from her lower back, also made of tendrils of the same white light. It was almost feathered in appearance as it hung to the floor. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this? Panic drowned her as she spun to Silas. He was staring at her, his mouth still slightly open. You have ears. Stop fucking looking. She tried to dispel the transformation, but she couldn't. How do I get rid of it? Please don't. There was a laugh in his voice. She fumbled for her belt, but found her dagger missing. Why? Oh, Grayson, he must have taken it. And then her world completely collapsed. The forest wasn't steady around her. He's going to kill me. Her fingers were clutching at her head, panic driving spears right into her chest. The world dimmed as, thank Theos, the transformation vanished. Silas's firm grip held her steady. There's no way he's touching you, Briya. She glanced up at him, her eyes meeting his. But the way he looked at her, she didn't like it one bit. There was something feral and possessive in the way he held her. A flare of rage ripped through her panic. This is your fault, she spat. His eyes narrowed. That you're alive? he asked. Again? Grayson, this stupid transformation, all of it! For a moment, he looked incensed. Black shadows clawed across his face for the briefest of seconds. Then they were gone, and he was working to measure his expression. I'm not responsible for your shitty choice in boyfriends. He tried to kill me because of you! She could see the rage rising in him. But he caught himself once more his fingers digging into her arms. 
he shut his eyes, gritting his teeth. Can we just... He took a deep breath, letting go of her. Grayson might be out for you, same with Locke and the rest of the Voira. Can we bench this for one night? Walk out to the goddamn fires with me, and pretend that you don't want to claw my face off for five minutes. I thought the point was that you weren't seen with me. Before, when killing you was enough to do me in, now it's not. There's more than one vamp in this school, so territory's an issue. And for you, that means me? Unfortunately. Silas said the word through gritted teeth. Unless you have managed to magically get rid of our bond. She glared at him. He rubbed his forehead, closing his eyes again. You're the one who will actually benefit. Why would you do it then? She asked. Because I'm stuck, he snarled, with these stupid vamp instincts. When she didn't reply straight away, he scowled and said words that sent a chill down her spine. We leave an opening for Grayson to claim you, if we don't. She didn't even really know what that meant. He'll be the strongest except me now. I, I don't think he wants anything to do with me. Her voice was weak. He didn't manage to kill you, Briar. You think it's over? Whatever happened this term, it'll be worse. You're caught in the middle whether you want it or not, and given your form has the offensive capabilities of a fucking pixie, it's open season on you. Briar reacted before she could catch herself, drawing her fist back and punching him straight in the face. His head snapped back, blood springing from between his nostrils instantly. He clamped his nose with his fingers, shadows crawling in his eyes as he glared down at her, looking like he wanted to pounce. Instead, he drew a long breath. I deserved that. The words sounded like they physically hurt him to say. Feel better? Not remotely. He wiped his nose with his sleeve, testing to see if it was still bleeding. It was. Can you heal it, or will we have to wait? Not a good look for you, huh? She asked. A big entrance with your claimed whore and a bloody nose? Screw yourself, Briya. He sounded exhausted. His nose was still dripping. She grimaced, but reached out and healed it with ease. Her healing was different now. She felt a flood of endorphins as she burned the magic. She wrinkled her nose, any reminder of today enough to sour her mood. Let's go then. If she had to face Grayson tonight, she'd prefer to get it over with. Silas could feel how unhinged the Vic was within him. She'd reached over and healed his bloody nose, and he'd never admit it to her, but it was a stroke of luck. Even that small amount of her power had balanced out the viciousness of his demon tonight. Which was good, because if he'd been one hair more on edge, as he walked out with Briar to the bonfires, he'd have ripped Grayson's throat out then and there. Expulsion be damned. Grayson sat up and stared at the two of them as they passed. His eyes turned deep red as his new crimson vamp transformation crept in. There was absolute contempt on his face as he caught sight of Briar. Silas couldn't fail to notice how Briar shifted closer, and the Vic within slammed into the walls of its cage, howling to get out. How that weasel had killed the Valmore was beyond Silas. The fucker always had an uncanny knack of landing on his feet. There was at least, Silas noticed, wide bloody gashes across his garb, which was dark with blood. He didn't stand, and his body was tense. Axel got up when they approached. Silas hadn't comprehended the weight that was lifted from his chest as he saw him alive. The possible outcomes of this day had been haunting them for months. Axel clapped Silas on the shoulder. Silas didn't miss the stiff way in which he held himself, or the singed edges of his sleeve and blistered skin beneath. Before Silas could say anything, though, Axel had turned to Briar. He ruffled a hand through her hair in a way that might have been affectionate or threatening. It was hard to tell with Axel. Sorry, kitten. For what? 
Briar's eyes narrowed. Cold, that was, Axel replied, even by my standards. Silence fell between them. Silas eyed Axel closer, noting the strain with each breath, the slight trickle of blood at the corner of his mouth. You all right? Silas asked. Nothing I can't fix when my magic's back, Axel replied. Ran out halfway through the fight. He snorted, as if there was anything funny about that. There was a beat. Then Briar held out her hand toward him, palm up. She didn't meet either of their gazes. For a long moment, both Silas and Axel stared, as if it might produce teeth and bite them. Then Axel nudged it with his hand, and Briar laced her pale, delicate fingers around his huge palm. Both of them were pointedly staring in different directions for a long, awkward stretch. And then Axel took a deep, clear breath and withdrew his hand. He did grunt, though, which was the closest he ever got to the words, thank you. Wait, what did you get? Briar asked, as if she couldn't help herself. Silas eyed Axel curiously. Axel dug in his pocket and produced a hefty golden coin. He turned it, and Silas saw it showed heads on both sides. Dark black and red scales crept along the skin of Axel's arm, and the tips of his fingers fleetingly sharpened to black clawed points. Silas blew out an impressed breath. That's what Axel had sworn he'd get, but shit, if it wasn't almost damn impossible to plan for a drawcard. Silas grinned. Relief flooding his system. Footsteps crunched against dry leaves as someone approached behind them. Silas glanced over, tense for a moment, but it wasn't Locke or Grayson. It was the tall, slender figure of Medora Rose, her dark skin covered in tattoos all the way to her jaw. Her eyes were fixed on Briar. Silas narrowed his eyes. It had been a long day and he didn't have patience for the Voira and their fuckery. You crazy? That was all Medora got out, because Briar had darted to the woman, throwing her arms around her shoulders and pulling her into a hug. I wanted to... wanted to talk to you all term. Briar sounded like she was sobbing, but... you were kind of a bitch. Medora's arms came around Briar as she rested her chin on her shoulder, her eyes closed. Her eyebrows knotted. That was the point, though, Medora murmured. What would have happened if they'd known what you were? Silas glanced at Axel, but all he got was a don't-ask-me look as he moved in closer while Briar was distracted. What happened then? Axel's voice was a murmur. Right, her form. But Axel must have known, though, since Briar was alive. Exactly what I was hoping wouldn't happen, Silas muttered. He'd admit, seeing the Atlan form was goddamned mesmerizing, but he'd not wish a living symbiote on anyone. He knew Axel disagreed with him firmly on this point. But she's delighted. Axel's voice dripped with sarcasm. Called it a stupid fucking form, then punched me in the face. That still grated. She literally had everything he'd ever wanted. And it was her, so of course, she thought it was a curse. Has a ring to it, though, yeah? Axel nudged him. Briar, world ender. She has no idea what it is. Really, though, Axel snorted. Neither do we, mate. Chapter 30 Silas pressed his forehead against Briar's dorm door. The sleet coin hummed in his palm, its energy buzzing from the blood he'd given it. Just do it. Give her your memories. It can't hurt. She hates you already. He ran his thumbs along his nail beds. She is literally bonded to your salvation. You have to give her something. He raised his fist and knocked pulling his forehead from the door in time for Briar to open it. Oh. She looked disappointed when she saw him. Charming. Nice of you to knock, she muttered, turning away from the door. Was that an invitation? 
he stepped into the room behind her, peering around at the messy piles of clothing and old trays of food. It was just like the start of the year, but it had cleared up a bit when she'd been with Grayson. He tried not to stare. Her eyes were raw and red-rimmed. He sat on the empty bed, thumbs rubbing his nail beds again, still clutching the sleet coin. This sense of discomfort, of not knowing how to respond to the way someone was feeling, it wasn't something he was used to. Well, he just wasn't that used to people at all. It was also sort of odd seeing her like this. The students in this academy treated him like he was some sort of deity, fumbling around him, fleeing, or trying to impress him. He ignored them. But this woman had stolen half his magic, stabbed him in the chest, and most recently punched him square in the nose. He really wasn't sure how to respond to the idea of her crying. Yeah? That was all she said. I promised you this. He produced the sleet coin. Oh, right. She reached out and took it. She narrowed her eyes as she felt its magic. It wasn't fair, to be honest. Not only was he cursed with her haunting his dreams in the most intrusive way possible, but when she looked all confused like that, her light eyebrows nodded together. It was just so cute. Shit. He scowled. That wasn't helpful. Not even a little. And anyway, if she was cute, it was because she wasn't screaming at him or pushing buttons he hadn't even known existed, like the idea that she might be crying over getting the Atlan form. Now she's probably crying because her boyfriend literally stabbed her in the back. Because of you. Find some fucking empathy. Briar turned to the coin again, and then her eyes went white, a vision seizing her. Hey, Silas, the girl trying to tug the flask from his grip was, to Briar's best guess, twelve or thirteen. Let me have some. Briar was in a large tent, with a few chairs draped with embroidery, and wooden prop-up tables topped with cups and plates of food. I told you. The words came from the mouth of the boy whose vision this was. Briar could see him only as a blur, the one experiencing the memory. A young Silas and Briar was about to witness the worst day of his life. You aren't having any. I'll tell mother. The girl with straight black hair and dark, curious eyes was crossing her arms. You weren't even supposed to come. But I want to know what it tastes like. Look, okay, smell it. See what you think. He held the flask up to the girl. She wrinkled her nose in disgust. Ew, told you. Silas who Briar guessed from his height and gangling build, was maybe fourteen, took a swig from the flask. He'll be so pissed if he finds out you took his stuff. You wouldn't tell, Silas sounded horrified. Not if you promise I get to be mother's first guest for the next three plays. The girl had a mischievous grin. Oh, easy, I fucking hate those things. Language, Si, the girl's voice was mocking. Mother'll get you if she hears you speak like that. The scene faded, movements happening in a blur. The girl was gone and Silas was alone. Next thing, he'd collapsed to the floor, shaking. He looked panicked as voices sounded outside. He picked himself up with difficulty and crawled beneath the grand chair in the center of the room, its draping covering him. Briar could make out enough of him to see his frame shivering as he sat there. She couldn't see the room beyond the hole he was crammed into, but she could hear voices. The scene shifted again, catching in the middle of a conversation. Next week. Why do you think I let Kira come on this trip? I'm not a complete monster. That voice was familiar. Frighteningly familiar. The Lady Dawn sat on a chair above where Silas hid. Briar's world shook. It was hard for her to focus when she was listening to that voice again. Silas was cowering beneath the chair of the woman who'd killed Briar's father, the same woman who'd appear in the sleet coin vision should she give it to Silas. Let me do it instead of Silas. The other voice was low and strained with desperation, but Briar thought it sounded male. 
He cannot keep hiding behind you. Besides, you have proven yourself already. Silas and Kira are close enough in age. I consider it fair. What? Briar couldn't keep up. There was silence. I do not make allowances for my people, the Lady Dawn went on. Why should I for my children? Briar could barely breathe all of a sudden. Silas was still curled up under the chair, hugging himself. His skin was clammy and pale, and he looked sick. But Briar wasn't focused on that. It will destroy him. Briar almost didn't hear the words from the second speaker. Their voice was a low whisper. Her own mind was scattering with panicked thoughts. Did it destroy you? The Lady Dawn asked. Come now. You know better than to get attached, don't you? She asked. And Briar thought she heard a taunt in those words. But I am tired of this argument. I won't hear it again. In a week, Kira will be dead, unless Silas gets very unlucky. She chuckled. You will move on, as you did Ronan, Lydia, Rickard. Oh, she paused. Rickard? He was before your time, wasn't he? Anyway, let's focus on today. I have much bigger plans for you. The scene shifted again as Silas departed the tent. They stepped out into a forest. Briar was trying to think back, though. The conversation had happened so quickly, but she thought the Lady Dawn had implied. But she couldn't think straight. Silas's emotions were smothering Briar as she existed within his vision. He was desperate, panicked. The strange, desaturated, ashen trees around them snagged Briar's attention. They were close to the dusk wall. Had to be. Even if Briar had never seen the telltale ash effect it had on the surrounding landscape in real life before. Silas slipped by a few guards and hurried through the trees. He was tired as he walked. He stumbled a few times, but even Briar couldn't miss the moment he reached the dusk wall. Briar had heard a million stories about the way it looked. She was told that it was a towering wall of onyx, that it reflected the faces of those it swallowed or the demons it spat out. But somehow it felt right that it was a shimmering swirl of rippling colors which reflected the rest of the world it was beside. Even through a memory, it was chilling to see the source of all demons in their land. Young Silas stepped up to it, his hand outstretched. Briar, who had been, until this moment, trying to think back to the Lady Dawn, finally became present. What on Vostra was he doing? The dusk wall swallowed people into fates unknown, sucked into a world of demons never seen again. No! Briar tried to call out, but her voice in the vision was mute. And then Silas stepped through. Briar backed up instinctively, not wanting to be dragged in, as if the dusk sun might have power even through the vision. The world around her changed, swallowing her anyway. She shut her eyes for a moment, terrified of what she'd see. But when she opened them, their world was white. Silas stood in a dome of swirling bright light. The way it shifted was familiar to Briar. It was the same texture and pattern of her tail and ears when she shifted into the Atlan form. You should not be here, little one. A voice spoke from the light. It was gentle and feminine. I can only shroud you for so long. I don't want to be saved, Silas whispered. I want you to take me. Don't let me go back. The light stuttered, and Briar watched as blackness crept around the base of the dome. Flickers of shadows like flames pressed against the light. She's going to make me kill her, just like Gabe killed Ronan, Silas said. I would rather die than kill her. The darkness rose like a claw, tangling with the light in spirals, weaving above their heads, until it was half dark and half light above. The voice that spoke this time was a deep, rough whisper. You do not need to die, Silas, it said. There's no other way. 
What if there were? It asked. Briar watched as the shadows took shape before Silas. It was the wisp of a human standing above him, holding out a hand. I could join you. Together we will be enough. Kira will be safe. How do you know that? Silas asked. It is all that I know. It is all that I am, to see the path that continues on. There was a long silence. The light danced with darkness, and the line separating them became chaotic. Then shapes formed. A hand reached toward Silas from the light, mirroring the shadow. It manifested, then flickered out. What? What is that? Silas asked. It is the other offer, the shadow said. But it is not as strong as mine. It is my power that you called. You? Silas was desperate. You can promise Kira lives? The truth? On your path right now, you challenge Kira next week and let her win. You die, but Kira soon follows. She will never earn a place as the Lady Dawn requires. Return with me, and you will not challenge her next week. Return with me and ask for Kira's acceptance in exchange for this power. Your mother will give it. That is my promise. I'll do it. And with that, the darkness flooded into Silas, consuming him. The light behind shattered. For the briefest of seconds before the vision was over, Briar caught a glimpse of what was beyond the dome of light, of what lurked within the dusk sun. For a moment, her mind began to fray. But as the sleet coin vision ended and Briar's mind returned to her body, that memory didn't travel with her. Briar returned to her room. Silas was still on her desk chair, slouched over it. He was speaking, but she could barely comprehend the words. After that, my mother kept me secret from the world. She didn't want anyone knowing I'd bonded with a living demon. I lived up in a tower, alone, except my siblings and Axel, though he wasn't supposed to come. But sometimes, the Vic would get too much. It's not balanced. They'd said the palace was haunted. Called me. You, Briar cut him off. You lied. He stared at her, frowning. He looked so human, so uncertain and innocent in that moment. But now Briar knew the truth. Her heart pounded in her ears. Were men like him trod, blood spilled, and he, he was one of them, seductive and beautiful until no one watched, and she should have known from the first time they'd met, should never overlooked what he'd done that day. A behemoth above morality and consequence, pulling strings she'd never known existed. Yet his was an entirely different poison than she'd seen before, because she'd, she'd begun to trust him. But she couldn't, not ever. Get out. Her voice was cold, the slightest breath. Silas hadn't just known her monsters, or even fallen in love with them. Silas was a dawn. To be continued. This has been Amber and Shadow, The Duskwall Academy, Book One, written by Marie McKay. Narrated by B.J. Harrison. Copyright 2022 by Marie McKay. Production copyright 2023 by Marie McKay. Hi, everyone. This is Marie McKay. I want to thank you for listening to this production. I'm an indie author, not backed by a larger company, so everything you're hearing, book and narration, is organized direct between the artists. So I also want to thank everyone working on this project for bringing it to life so beautifully. If you want to support me further, go to my website at mariemackay.com. There, you'll find more books, audio, freebies, and discounts on my audiobooks. 
If you buy straight from me, I get more of the pie and you pay less for it. And if you want to know more about me, my Facebook group or newsletter list is the place to be. Both can be found on my website. In there, I share my works in progress, the art I'm doing of my covers or characters, and even poll you for opinions on things I belatedly realise I'm emotionally attached to and don't want to change. It's a lot of fun, and the community I'm building is amazing, so please come and be a part of it.